The Piazza by Herman Melville. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. With fairest flowers, whilst summer lasts, and I live here. Fidel. When I removed into the country, it was to occupy an old-fashioned farmhouse, which had no piazza, a deficiency the more regretted, because not only did I like piazzas, as somehow combining the coziness of indoors with the freedom of outdoors, and it is so pleasant to inspect your thermometer there, but the country round about was such a picture that in Berry time no boy climbs hill or crosses vale without coming upon easels planted in every nook and sunburnt painters painting there, a very paradise of painters, the circle of the stars cut by the circle of the mountains. At least so looks it from the house, though once upon the mountains no circle of them can you see. Had the site been chosen five rods off, this charmed ring would not have been. The house is old. Seventy years since, from the heart of the hearthstone hills, they quarried the Kaaba, or Holy Stone, to which, each Thanksgiving, the social pilgrims used to come. So long ago that in digging for the foundation the workmen used both spade and axe, fighting the troglodytes of those subterranean parts, sturdy roots of a sturdy wood, encamped upon what is now a long landslide of sleeping meadow, sloping away off from my poppy-bed. Of that knit wood, but one survivor stands, an elm, lonely through steadfastness. Whoever built the house, he builded better than he knew, or else Orion in the zenith flashed down his Damocles' sword to him some starry night and said, Build there. For how otherwise could it have entered the builder's mind that, upon the clearing being made, such a purple prospect would be his? nothing less than Greylock, with all his hills about him, like Charlemagne among his peers. Now, for a house, so situated in such a country, to have no piazza for the convenience of those who might desire to feast upon the view, and take their time and ease about it, seemed as much of an omission as if a picture-gallery should have no bench. For what but picture-galleries are the marble halls of these same limestone hills? Galleries hung month after month anew with pictures ever fading into pictures ever fresh. And beauty is like piety. You cannot run and read it. Tranquility and constancy, with nowadays an easy chair, are needed. For though of old, when reverence was in vogue and indolence was not, the devotees of nature doubtless used to stand and adore just as in the cathedrals of those ages the worshippers of a higher power did. Yet, in these times of failing faith and feeble knees, we have the piazza and the pew. During the first year of my residence, the more leisurely to witness the coronation of Charlemagne, weather permitting they crown him every sunrise and sunset, I chose me, on the hillside bank nearby, a royal lounge of turf, a green velvet lounge with long moss-padded back, while at the head, strangely enough, there grew, but I suppose for heraldry, three tufts of blue violets in a field argent of wild strawberries, and a trellis with honeysuckle I set for canopy. Very majestical lounge indeed, so much so that here, as with the reclining majesty of Denmark in his orchard, a sly earache invaded me. But if damps abound at times in Westminster Abbey, because it is so old, why not within this monastery of mountains, which is older? A piazza must be had. The house was wide, my fortune narrow, so that to build a panoramic piazza, one round and round, it could not be, although, indeed, considering the matter by rule and square, the carpenters, in the kindest way, were anxious to gratify my furthest wishes, at I've forgotten how much a foot. 
upon but one of the four sides would prudence grant me what i wanted now which side to the east that long camp of the hearthstone hills fading far away towards quito and every fall a small white flake of something peering suddenly of a coolish morning from the topmost cliff the season's new dropped lamb its earliest fleece and then the christmas dawn draping those dim highlands with red barred plaids and tartans goodly sight from your piazza that goodly sight but to the north is charlemagne can't have the hearthstone hills with charlemagne well the south side apple trees are there pleasant of a balmy morning in the month of may to sit and see that orchard white budded as for a bridal and in october one green arsenal yard such piles of ruddy shot very fine i grant but to the north is charlemagne the west side look an upland pasture alleying away into a maple wood at top sweet in opening spring to trace upon the hillside otherwise gray and bare to trace i say the oldest paths by their streaks of earliest green sweet indeed i can't deny but to the north is charlemagne so charlemagne he carried it it was not long after eighteen forty eight and somehow about that time all round the world these kings they had the casting vote and voted for themselves no sooner was ground broken than all the neighborhood neighbor divies in particular broke too into a laugh piazza to the north winter piazza once of winter midnights to watch the aurora borealis i suppose hope he's laid in good store of polar muffs and mittens that was in the lion month of march not forgotten are the blue noses of the carpenters and how they scouted at the greenness of the chit who would build his sole piazza to the north but march don't last forever patience and august comes and then in the cool elysium of my northern bower i lazarus in abraham's bosom cast down the hill a pitying glance on poor old dives tormented in the purgatory of his piazza to the south but even in december this northern piazza does not repel nipping cold and gusty though it be and the north wind like any miller bolting by the snow in finest flower for then once more with frosted beard i pace the sleety deck weathering cape horn in summer too canute like sitting here one is often reminded of the sea for not only do long ground swells roll the slanting grain and little wavelets of the grass ripple over upon the low piazza as their beach and the blown down of dandelions is wafted like the spray and the purple of the mountains is just the purple of the billows and a still august noon broods upon the deep meadows as a calm upon the line but the vastness and the lonesomeness are so oceanic and the silence and the sameness too that the first peep of a strange house rising beyond the trees is for all the world like spying on the barbary coast an unknown sail and this recalls my inland voyage to fairyland a true voyage but take it all in all interesting as if invented from the piazza some uncertain object i had caught mysteriously snugged away to all appearance in a sort of purpled breast pocket high up in a hopper-like hollow or sunken angle among the northwestern mountains yet whether really it was on a mountainside or a mountain top could not be determined because though viewed from favorable points a blue summit peering up away behind the rest will as it were talk to you over their heads and plainly tell you that though he the blue summit seems among them 
he is not of them, God forbid, and indeed would have you know that he considers himself, as to say truth he has good right, by several cubits their superior, nevertheless certain ranges here and there double-filed as in platoons, so shoulder and follow up upon one another, with their irregular shapes and heights, that from the piazza, a nigher and lower mountain will in most states of the atmosphere effacingly shade itself away into a higher and further one. That an object bleak on the former's crest will, for all that, appear nested in the latter's flank. These mountains, somehow, they play at hide-and-seek, and all before one's eyes. But be that as it may, the spot in question was, at all events, so situated as to be only visible, and then but vaguely, under certain witching conditions of light and shadow. Indeed, for a year or more I knew not there was such a spot, and might perhaps have never known, had it not been for a wizard afternoon in autumn, late in autumn, a mad poet's afternoon, when the turned maple woods in the broad basin below me, having lost their first vermilion tint, dully smoked like smouldering towns, when flames expire upon their prey, and rumor had it that this smokiness in the general air was not all Indian summer, which was not used to be so sick a thing, however mild, but in great part was blown from far-off forests for weeks on fire in Vermont, so that no wonder the sky was ominous as Hecate's cauldron, and two sportsmen crossing a red stubble buckwheat field seemed guilty Macbeth and foreboding Banquo, and the hermit's son hutted in an adullam cave well towards the south, according to his season, did little else but by indirect reflection of narrow rays shot down a simplon pass among the clouds, just steadily paint one small round strawberry mole upon the wan cheek of northwestern hills signal as a candle one spot of radiance where all else was shade fairies there thought i some haunted ring where fairies dance time passed and the following may after a gentle shower upon the mountains a little shower, islanded in misty seas of sunshine, such a distant shower, and sometimes two and three and four of them, all visible together in different parts. As I loved to watch from the piazza, instead of thunderstorms, as I used to, which wrap old Greylock like a Sinai, till one thinks Swart Moses must be climbing among scathed hemlocks there. After, I say, that gentle shower, I saw a rainbow, resting its further end just where, in autumn, I had marked the mole. Fairies there, thought I, remembering that rainbows bring out the blooms, and that if one can but get to the rainbow's end, his fortune is made in a bag of gold. Yon rainbow's end. Would I were there, thought I, and none the less I wished it for now first noticing what seemed some sort of glen or grotto in the mountain-side. At least, whatever it was, viewed through the rainbow's medium, it glowed like the Potosi mine. But a workaday neighbor said no doubt it was but some old barn, an abandoned one, its broadside beaten in, the acclivity its background. But I, though I had never been there, I knew better. A few days after, a cheery sunrise kindled a golden sparkle in the same spot as before. The sparkle was of that vividness it seemed as if it could only come from glass. The building, then, if building after all it was, could at least not be a barn, much less an abandoned one. Stale hay, ten years musting in it. No, if aught built by mortal, it must be a cottage, perhaps long vacant and dismantled, but this very spring magically fitted up and glazed. Again, one noon, in the same direction, I marked, over dimmed tops of terraced foliage, a broader gleam, as of a silver buckler held sunwards over some croucher's head, which gleam, experience in like cases taught, must come from a roof newly shingled. 
this to me made pretty sure the recent occupancy of that far cot in fairyland day after day now full of interest in my discovery what time i could spare from reading the midsummer's night dream and all about titania wishfully i gazed off towards the hills but in vain either troops of shadows an imperial guard with slow pace and solemn defiled along the steeps or routed by pursuing light fled broadcast from east to west old wars of lucifer and michael or the mountains though unvexed by these mirrored sham fights in the sky had an atmosphere otherwise unfavorable for fairy views i was sorry the more so because i had to keep my chamber for some time after which chamber did not face those hills at length when pretty well again and sitting out in the september morning upon the piazza and thinking to myself when just after a little flock of sheep the farmer's banded children passed and nutting and said how sweet a day it was after all but what their fathers call a weather breeder and indeed was become go sensitive through my illness as that i could not bear to look upon a chinese creeper of my adoption and which to my delight climbing a post of the piazza had burst out in starry bloom but now if you remove the leaves a little showed millions of strange cankerous worms which feeding upon those blossoms so shared their blessed hue as to make it unblessed evermore worms whose germs had doubtless lurked in the very bulb which so hopefully i had planted in this ingrate peevishness of my weary convalescence was i sitting there when suddenly looking off i saw the golden mountain window dazzling like a deep-sea dolphin fairies there thought i once more the queen of fairies at her fairy window at any rate some glad mountain girl it will do me good it will cure this weariness to look on her no more i'll launch my yawl ho cheerly heart and push away for fairyland for rainbow's end in fairyland how to get to fairyland by what road i did not know nor could any one inform me not even one edmund spencer who had been there so he wrote me further than that to reach fairyland it must be voyaged to and with faith i took the fairy mountain's bearings and the first fine day, when strength permitted, got into my yawl, high-pommeled leather one, cast off the fast, and away I sailed, free voyager as an autumn leaf. Early dawn, and sailing westward, I sowed the morning before me. Some miles brought me nigh the hills, but out of present sight of them. I was not lost for roadside golden-rods as guide-posts pointed i doubted not the way to the golden window following them i came to a lone and languid region where the grass-grown ways were travelled but by drowsy cattle that less waked than stirred by day seemed to walk in sleep browse they did not the enchanted never eat at least so says don quixote that sagest sage that ever lived on i went and gained at last the fairy mountain's base but saw yet no fairy ring a pasture rose before me letting down five mouldering bars so moistly green they seemed fished up from some sunken wreck a wigged old aries long visaged and with crumpled horn came snuffing up and then, retreating decorously, led on along a milky way of white weed, past dim clustering Pleiades and Hyades, of small forget-me-nots, and would have led me further still his astral path, but for golden flights of yellow birds, pilots surely, to the golden window, to one side flying before me from bush to bush, towards deep woods, which woods themselves were luring, and somehow lured too by their fence banning a dark road which however dark led up i pushed through when ares renouncing me now for some lost soul 
wheeled and went his wiser way forbidding and forbidden ground to him a winter wood road matted all along with winter green by the side of pebbly waters waters the cheerier for their solitude beneath swaying fir boughs petted by no season but still green and all on i journeyed my horse and i on by an old sawmill bound down and hushed with vines that his grating voice no more was heard on by a deep flume clothed through snowy marble vernal tinted where freshet eddies had on each side spun out empty chapels in the living rock on where jacks in the pulpit like their baptist namesake preached but to the wilderness on where a huge cross-grained block fern-bedded showed where in forgotten times man after man had tried to split it but lost his wedges for his pains which wedges yet rusted in their holes on where ages passed in step-like ledges of a cascade skull hollow pots had been churned out by ceaseless whirling of a flintstone ever wearing but itself unworn on by wild rapids pouring into a secret pool but soothed by circling there a while issued forth serenely on to less broken ground and by a little ring where truly fairies must have danced or else some wheel tire been heated for all was bare still on and up and out into a hanging orchard where maidenly looked down upon me a crescent moon from morning my horse hitched low his head red apples rolled before him eve's apples seek no furthers he tasted one i another it tasted of the ground fairyland not yet thought i flinging my bridle to a humped old tree that crooked out an arm to catch it for the way now lay where path was none and none might go but by himself and only go by daring through blackberry brakes that tried to pluck me back though i but strained towards fruitless growths of mountain laurel up slippery steeps to barren heights where stood none to welcome fairyland not yet thought i though the morning is here before me footsore enough and weary i gained not then my journey's end but came ere long to a craggy pass dipping towards growing regions still beyond a zigzag road half overgrown with blueberry bushes here turned among the cliffs a rent was in their ragged sides through it a little track branched off which upwards threading that short defile came breezily out above to where the mountain top part sheltered northward by a taller brother sloped gently off a space ere darkly plunging and here among fantastic rocks reposing in a herd the foot-track wound, half-beaten, up to a little low-storied grayish cottage, capped, nun-like, with a peaked roof. On one slope the roof was deeply weather-stained, and nigh the turfy eaves-trough, all velvet-napped. No doubt the snail-monks founded mossy priories there. The other slope was newly shingled. On the north side, doorless and windowless, the clapboards innocent of paint were yet green as the north side of lichened pines or copperless hulls of japanese junks becalmed the whole base like those of the neighboring rocks was rimmed about with shaded streaks of richest sod for with hearthstones in fairyland the natural rock though housed preserves to the last just as in open fields its fertilizing charm only by necessity working now at a remove to the sward without so at least says oberon grave authority in fairy lore though setting oberon aside certain it is that even in the common world the soil close up to farmhouses as close up to pasture rocks is even though untended ever richer than it is a few rods off such gentle nurturing heat is radiated there but with this cottage the shaded streaks were richest in its front and about its entrance where the ground sill and especially the door sill had 
through long eld quietly settled down no fence was seen no enclosure nearby ferns 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 further woods 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 beyond mountains 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 then sky 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 turned out in aerial commons pasture for the mountain moon nature and but nature house and all even a low cross pile of silver birch piled openly to season up among whose silvery sticks as through the fencing of some sequestered grave sprang vagrant raspberry bushes willful asserters of their right of way the foot track so dainty narrow just like a sheep track led through long ferns that lodged fairyland at last thought i una and her lamb dwell here truly a small abode mere palanquin set down on the summit in a pass between two worlds participant of neither a sultry hour and i wore a light hat of yellow sennet with white duck trousers both relics of my tropic sea-going clogged in the muffling ferns i softly stumbled staining the knees a sea-green pausing at the threshold or rather where threshold once had been i saw through the open doorway a lonely girl sewing at a lonely window a pale-cheeked girl and fly-specked window with wasps about the mended upper panes i spoke she shyly started like some tahiti girl secreted for a sacrifice first catching sight through palms of captain cook recovering she bade me enter with her apron brushed off a stool then silently resumed her own with thanks i took the stool but now for a space i too was mute this then is the fairy mountain house and here the fairy queen sitting at her fairy window i went up to it downwards directed by the tunneled pass as through a leveled telescope i caught sight of a far-off soft azure world i hardly knew it though i came from it you must find this view very pleasant said i at last oh sir tears starting in her eyes the first time i looked out of this window i said never never shall i weary of this and what wearies you of it now i don't know while a tear fell but it is not the view it is mariana some months back her brother only seventeen had come hither a long way from the other side to cut wood and burn coal and she elder sister had accompanied him long had they been orphans and now sole inhabitants of the sole house upon the mountain no guest came no traveller passed the zigzag perilous road was only used at seasons by the coal wagons the brother was absent the entire day sometimes the entire night when at evening fagged out he did come home he soon left his bench poor fellow for his bed just as one at last wearily quits that too for still deeper rest the bench the bed the grave silent i stood by the fairy window while these things were being told do you know said she at last as stealing from her story do you know who lives yonder i have never been down into that country away off there i mean that house that marble one pointing far across the lower landscape have you not caught it there on the long hillside the field before the woods behind the white shines out against their blue don't you mark it the only house in sight i looked and after a time to my surprise recognized more by its position than its aspect or mariana's description my own abode glimmering much like this mountain one from the piazza the mirage haze made it appear less a farmhouse than king charming's palace 
I have often wondered who lives there, but it must be some happy one. Again this morning I was thinking so. Some happy one? I returned, starting. And why do you think that? You judge some rich one lives there? Rich or not, I never thought. But it looks so happy I can't tell how, and it is so far away. Sometimes I think I do but dream it is there. You should see it in a sunset. No doubt the sunset gilds it finely, but not more than the sunrise does this house, perhaps. This house? The sun is a good sun, but it never gilds this house. Why should it? This old house is rotting. That makes it so mossy. In the morning the sun comes in at this old window, to be sure, boarded up when first we came. A window I can't keep clean, do what I may, and half burns and nearly blinds me at my sewing, besides setting the flies and wasps astir, such flies and wasps as only lone mountain houses know. See, here is the curtain, this apron. I try to shut it out with, then. It fades it, you see. Sun gild this house? Not that ever Mariana saw. Because when this roof is gilded most, then you stay here within. The hottest, weariest hour of day, you mean? Sir, the sun gilds not this roof. It leaked so, brother newly shingled all one side. Did you not see it? The north side, where the sun strikes most on what the rain has wetted. The sun is a good sun, but this roof in first scorches and then rots. An old house. They went west and are long dead, they say, who built it. A mountain house. In winter no fox could den in it. That chimney place has been blocked up with snow, just like a hollow stump. Yours are strange fancies, Mariana. They but reflect the things. Then I should have said, these are strange things, rather than yours are strange fancies. As you will. And took up her sewing. Something in those quiet words, or in that quiet act, it made me mute again, while noting, through the fairy window, a broad shadow stealing on, as cast by some gigantic condor floating at brooding poise on outstretched wings. I marked how, by its deeper and inclusive dusk, it wiped away into itself all lesser shades of rock or fern. "'You watch the cloud,' said Mariana. "'No, a shadow. A cloud's, no doubt, though that I cannot see. How did you know it? Your eyes are on your work.' "'It dust my work. There, now the cloud is gone. Trey comes back. How? The dog, the shaggy dog. At noon he steals off of himself to change his shape, returns and lies down a while nigh the door. Don't you see him? His head is turned round at you, though when you came he looked before him. Your eyes rest but on your work. What do you speak of? By the window, crossing. You mean this shaggy shadow? The nigh one? And yes, now that I mark it, it is not unlike a large black Newfoundland dog. The invading shadow gone, the invaded one returns. But I do not see what casts it. For that you must go without. One of those grassy rocks, no doubt. You see his head? His face? The shadows? You speak as if you saw it and all the time your eyes are on your work. Trey looks at you, still without glancing up. This is his hour. I see him. Have you then so long sat at this mountain window, where but clouds and vapors pass, that to you shadows are as things, though you speak of them as of phantoms, that by familiar knowledge, working like a second sight, you can, without looking for them, tell just where they are? though as having mice-like feet they creep about and come and go, 
that to you these lifeless shadows are as living friends who though out of sight are not out of mind even in their faces is it so that way i never thought of it but the friendliest one that used to soothe my weariness so much coolly quivering on the ferns it was taken from me never to return as trey did just now the shadow of a birch the tree was struck by lightning and brother cut it up you saw the cross pile outdoors the buried root lies under it but not the shadow that is flown and never will come back nor ever anywhere stir again another cloud here stole along once more blotting out the dog and blackening all the mountain while the stillness was so still deafness might have forgot itself or else believed that noiseless shadow spoke birds mariana singing birds i hear none i hear nothing boys and bobolinks do they never come a burying up here birds i seldom hear boys never the berries mostly ripe and fall few but me the wiser but yellow birds showed me the way part way at least and then flew back i guess they play about the mountainside but don't make the top their home and no doubt you think that living so lonesome here knowing nothing hearing nothing little at least but sound of thunder and the fall of trees never reading seldom speaking yet ever wakeful this is what gives me my strange thoughts for so you call them this weariness and wakefulness together brother who stands and works in open air would i could rest like him but mine is mostly but dull woman's work sitting sitting restless sitting but do you not go walk at times these woods are wide and lonesome lonesome because so wide sometimes tis true of afternoons i go a little way but soon come back again better feel lone by hearth than rock the shadows hereabouts i know those in the woods are strangers but the night just like the day thinking thinking a wheel i cannot stop pure want of sleep it is that turns it i have heard that for this wakeful weariness to say one's prayers and then lay one's head upon a fresh hop pillow look through the fairy window she pointed down the steep to a small garden patch nearby mere pot of rifled loam half rounded in by sheltering rocks where side by side some feet apart nipped and puny two hop vines climbed two poles and gaining their tip ends would have then joined over in an upward clasp but the baffled shoots groping awhile in empty air trailed back whence they sprung you have tried the pillow then yes and prayer prayer and pillow is there no other cure or charm oh if i could but once get to yonder house and but look upon whoever the happy being is that lives there a foolish thought why do i think it is it that i live so lonesome and know nothing i too know nothing and therefore cannot answer but for your sake mariana well could wish that i were that happy one of the happy house you dream to see for then you would behold him now and as you say this weariness might leave you enough launching my yawl no more for fairyland i stick to the piazza it is my box royal and this amphitheatre my theatre of san carlo yes the scenery is magical the illusion so complete and madame meadowlark my prima donna plays her grand engagement here and drinking in her sunrise note which memnon like seems struck from the golden window how far from me the weary face behind it but every night when the curtain falls truth comes in with darkness no light shows from the mountain to and fro i walk the piazza deck haunted by mariana's face and many as real a story 
End of the Piazza by Herman Melville Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Lightning Rod Man by Herman Melville This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What grand irregular thunder, thought I, standing on my hearthstone among the Acroceranian hills, as the scattered bolts boomed overhead, and crashed down among the valleys, every bolt followed by zigzag irradiations, and swift slants of sharp rain, which audibly rang, like a charge of spear-points, on my low shingled roof. I suppose, though, that the mountains hereabouts break and churn up the thunder, so that it is far more glorious here than on the plain. Hark! Someone at the door. Who is this that chooses a time of thunder for making calls? And why don't he, man-fashion, use the knocker, instead of making that doleful undertaker's clatter with his fist against the hollow panel? But let him in. Ah, here he comes. Good day, sir. An entire stranger. Pray be seated. What is that strange-looking walking-stick he carries? A fine thunderstorm, sir. Fine? Awful. You are wet. Stand here on the hearth before the fire. Not for worlds. The stranger still stood in the exact middle of the cottage, where he had first planted himself. His singularity impelled a closer scrutiny. A lean, gloomy figure, hair dark and lank, mattedly streaked over his brow. His sunken pitfalls of eyes were ringed by indigo halos, and played with an innocuous sort of lightning, the gleam without the bolt. The whole man was dripping. He stood in a puddle on the bare oak floor, his strange walking-stick vertically resting at his side. It was a polished copper rod, four feet long, lengthwise attached to a neat wooden staff, by insertion into two balls of greenish glass ringed with copper bands. The metal rod terminated at the top, tripod-wise, in three keen tines, brightly gilt. He held the thing by the wooden part alone. Sir, said I, bowing politely, have I the honor of a visit from that illustrious god Jupiter Tonans? So stood he in the Greek statue of old, grasping the lightning bolt. If you be he, or his viceroy, I have to thank you for this noble storm you have brewed among our mountains. Listen. That was a glorious peal. Ah, to a lover of the majestic, it is a good thing to have the thunderer himself in one's cottage. The thunder grows finer for that. But pray be seated. This old rush-bottomed armchair, I grant, is a poor substitute for your evergreen throne on Olympus, but condescend to be seated. While I thus pleasantly spoke, the stranger eyed me, half in wonder, and half in a strange sort of horror, but did not move a foot. Do, sir, be seated. You need to be dried ere going forth again. I planted the chair invitingly on the broad hearth, where a little fire had been kindled that afternoon, to dissipate the dampness, not the cold, for it was early in the month of September. But without heeding my solicitation, and still standing in the middle of the floor, the stranger gazed at me portentously, and spoke. Sir, said he, excuse me, but instead of my accepting your invitation to be seated on the hearth there, I solemnly warn you that you had best accept mine, and stand with me in the middle of the room. Good heavens, he cried, starting. There is another of those awful crashes. I warn you, sir, quit the hearth. Mr. Jupiter Tonans, said I, quietly rolling my body on the stone, I stand very well here. Are you so horridly ignorant, then, he cried, 
as not to know that by far the most dangerous part of a house during such a terrific tempest as this is the fireplace nay i did not know that involuntarily stepping upon the first board next to the stone the stranger now assumed such an unpleasant air of successful admonition that quite involuntarily again i stepped back upon the hearth and threw myself into the erectest proudest posture i could command but i said nothing for heaven's sake he cried with a strange mixture of alarm and intimidation for heaven's sake get off the hearth know you not that the heated air and soot are conductors to say nothing of those immense iron fire dogs quit the spot i conjure i command you mr jupiter tonans i am not accustomed to be commanded in my own house call me not by that pagan name you are profane in this time of terror sir will you be so good as to tell me your business if you seek shelter from the storm you are welcome so long as you be civil but if you come on business open it forthwith who are you i am a dealer in lightning rods said the stranger softening his tone my special business is merciful heaven what a crash have you ever been struck your premises i mean no it's best to be provided significantly rattling his metallic staff on the floor by nature there are no castles in thunderstorms yet say but the word and of this cottage i can make a gibraltar by a few waves of this wand hark what himalayas of concussions you interrupted yourself your special business you were about to speak of my special business is to travel the country for orders for lightning rods this is my specimen rod tapping his staff i have the best of references fumbling in his pockets in Criggan last month i put up three and twenty rods on only five buildings let me see was it not at Criggan last week about midnight on saturday that the steeple the big elm and the assembly room coppola were struck any of your rods there not on the tree in coppola but the steeple of what use is your rod then of life and death use but my workman was heedless in fitting the rod at the top of the steeple he allowed a part of the metal to graze the tin sheeting hence the accident not my fault but his hark never mind that clap burst quite loud enough to be heard without finger pointing did you hear of the event at montreal last year a servant girl struck at her bedside with a rosary in her hand the beads being metal does your bead extend into the canadas no and i hear that there iron rods only are in use they should have mine which are copper iron is easily fused then they draw out the rod so slender that it is not body enough to conduct the full electric current the metal melts the building is destroyed my copper rods never act so those canadians are fools some of them knob the rod at the top which risks a deadly explosion instead of imperceptibly carrying down the current into the earth as this sort of rod does mine is the only true rod look at it only one dollar a foot this abuse of your own calling in another might make one distrustful with respect to yourself hark the thunder becomes less muttering it is nearing us and nearing the earth too hark one crammed crash all the vibrations made one by nearness another flash hold what do you i said seeing him now instantaneously relinquishing his staff lean intently forward towards the window with his right fore and middle fingers on his left wrist but ere the words had well escaped me another exclamation escaped him crash only three pulses less than a third of a mile off yonder somewhere in that wood i passed three stricken oaks there ripped out new and glittering the oak draws lightning more than other timber having iron in solution in its sap 
Your floor here seems oak. Heart of oak. From the peculiar time of your call upon me, I suppose you purposely select stormy weather for your journeys. When the thunder is roaring, you deem it an hour peculiarly favorable for producing impressions favorable to your trade. Hark! Awful! For one who would arm others with fear, you seem unbeseemingly timorous yourself. Common men choose fair weather for their travels. You choose thunderstorms. And yet, that I travel in thunderstorms, I grant, but not without particular precautions, such as only a lightning-rod man may know. Hark! Quick, look at my specimen rod. Only one dollar a foot. A very fine rod, I dare say. But what are these particular precautions of yours? Yet first let me close yonder shutters. The slanting rain is beating through the sash. I will bar up. Are you mad? Know you not that yon iron bar is a swift conductor? Desist. I will simply close the shutters, then, and call my boy to bring me a wooden bar. Pray, touch the bell-pull there. Are you frantic? That bell-wire might blast you. Never touch bell-wire in a thunderstorm, nor ring a bell of any sort. Nor those in belfries? Pray, will you tell me where and how one may be safe in a time like this? Is there any part of my house I may touch with hopes of my life? There is, but not where you now stand. Come away from the wall. The current will sometimes run down a wall, and, a man being a better conductor than a wall, it would leave the wall and run into him. Swoop! That must have fallen very nigh. That must have been globular lightning. Very probably. Tell me at once, which is, in your opinion, the safest part of this house? This room and this one spot in it where I stand. Come hither. The reasons first. Hark! After the flash, the gust, the sashes shiver, the house, the house. Come hither to me. The reasons, if you please. Come hither to me. Thank you again. I think I will try my old stand, the hearth. And now, Mr. Lightning Rod Man, in the pauses of the thunder, be so good as to tell me your reasons for esteeming this one room of the house the safest, and your own one standpoint there the safest spot in it. There was now a little cessation of the storm for a while. The lightning-rod man seemed relieved, and replied, Your house is a one-storied house, with an attic and a cellar. This room is between. Hence its comparative safety because lightning sometimes passes from the clouds to the earth, and sometimes from the earth to the clouds. Do you comprehend? And I chose the middle of the room, because if the lightning should strike the house at all, it would come down the chimney or walls. So, obviously, the further you are from them, the better. Come hither to me now. Presently. Something you just said, instead of alarming me, has strangely inspired confidence. What have I said? You said that sometimes lightning flashes from the earth to the clouds. I, the returning stroke, as it is called, when the earth, being overcharged with the fluid, flashes its surplus upward. The returning stroke, that is, from earth to sky. Better and better. But come here on the hearth and dry yourself. I am better here, and better wet. How? It is the safest thing you can do, hark, again, to get yourself thoroughly drenched in a thunderstorm. Wet clothes are better conductors than the body, and so, if the lightning strike, it might pass down the wet clothes without touching the body. The storm deepens again. Have you a rug in the house? Rugs are non-conductors. Get one, that I may stand on it here, and you too. The skies blacken. It is dusk at noon. Hark! The rug, the rug! I gave him one, while the hooded mountains seemed closing and tumbling into the cottage. And now, since our being dumb will not help us, said I, resuming my place, 
let me hear your precautions in travelling during thunderstorms wait till this one is past nay proceed with the precautions you stand in the safest possible place according to your own account go on briefly then i avoid pine trees high houses lonely barns upland pastures running water flocks of cattle and sheep a crowd of men if i travel on foot as today i do not walk fast if in my buggy i touch not its back or sides if on horseback i dismount and lead the horse but of all things i avoid tall men do i dream man avoid man and in danger time too tall men in a thunderstorm i avoid are you so grossly ignorant as to not know that the height of a six-footer is sufficient to discharge an electric cloud upon him are not lonely kentuckians ploughing smit in the unfinished furrow nay if the six-footer stand by running water the cloud will sometimes select him as its conductor to that running water hark sure yon black pinnacle is split yes a man is a good conductor the lightning goes through and through a man but only peels a tree but sir you have kept me so long answering your questions that i have not yet come to business will you order one of my rods look at this specimen one see it is of the best copper copper's the best conductor your house is low but being upon the mountains that lowness does not one whit depress it you mountaineers are most exposed in mountainous countries the lightning rod man should have most business look at the specimen sir one rod will answer for a house so small as this look over these recommendations only one rod sir cost only twenty dollars hark there go all the granite taconics and hoosics dash together like pebbles by the sound that must have struck something an elevation of five feet above the house will protect twenty feet radius all about the rod only twenty dollars sir a dollar a foot hark dreadful will you order will you buy shall i put down your name think of being a heap of charred offal like a haltered horse burnt in his stall and all in one flash you pretended envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to and from jupiter tonans laughed i you mere man who come here to put you and your pipe stem between clay and sky do you think that because you can strike a bit of green light from the leyden jar that you can thoroughly avert the supernal bolt your rod rusts or breaks and where are you who has empowered you you tetzel to peddle round your indulgences from divine ordinations the hairs of our heads are numbered and the days of our lives in thunder as in sunshine i stand at ease in the hands of my god false negotiator away see the scroll of the storm is rolled back the house is unharmed and in the blue heavens i read in the rainbow that the deity will not of purpose make war on man's earth impious wretch foamed the stranger blackening in the face as the rainbow beamed i will publish your infidel notions the scowl grew blacker on his face the indigo circles enlarged round his eyes as the storm rings round the midnight moon he sprang upon me his triforked thing at my heart i seized it i snapped it i dashed it i trod it and dragging the dark lightning king out of my door flung his elbowed copper sceptre after him but spite of my treatment and spite of my dissuasive talk of him to my neighbors the lightning rod man still dwells in the land still travels in storm time and drives a brave trade with the fears of man end of the lightning rod man recording by james k white chula vista Bell Tower by Herman Melville. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the south of Europe, nigh a once frescoed capital, now with dank mould cankering its bloom, central in a plain, stands what at distance seems the black mossed stump of some immeasurable pine, fallen, in forgotten days, with a knock and the titan. As all along where the pine tree falls, its dissolution leaves a mossy mound, last flung shadow of the perished trunk, never lengthening, never lessening, unsubject to the fleet falsities of the sun, shade immutable, and true gauge which cometh by prostration. So westward from what seems the stump, one steadfast spear of lichened ruin veins the plain. From that tree-top, what birded chimes of silver throats had rung? A stone pine, a metallic aviary in its crown. The bell-tower, built by the great mechanician, the unblessed foundling Banadona. Like Babel's, its base was laid in a high hour of renovated earth, following the second deluge, when the waters of the Dark Ages had dried up, and once more the green appeared. No wonder that, after so long and deep submersion, the jubilant expectation of the race should, as with Noah's sons, soar into Shinar aspiration. In firm resolve, no man in Europe at that period went beyond Banadona. Enriched through commerce with the Levant, the state in which he lived, voted to have the noblest bell-tower in Italy. His repute assigned him to be architect. Stone by stone, month by month, the tower rose, higher, higher, snail-like in pace, but torch or rocket in its pride. After the masons would depart, the builder, standing alone upon its ever-ascending summit, at close of every day, saw that he overstopped still higher walls and trees. He would tarry till a late hour there, wrapped in schemes of other and still loftier piles. Those who of saints' days thronged the spot, hanging to the rude poles of scaffolding like sailors on yards, or bees on boughs, unmindful of lime and dust and falling chips of stone, their homage not the less inspirited him to self-esteem. At length, the holiday of the tower came. To the sound of viols, the climax stone slowly rose in air, and, amid the firing of ordnance, was laid by Banadona's hands upon the final course. Then mounting it, he stood erect, alone, with folded arms, gazing upon the white summits of blue inland Alps, and whiter crests of bluer Alps offshore sights invisible from the plain. Invisible, too, from thence, was that eye he turned below, when, like the cannon-booms, came up to him the people's combustions of applause. That which stirred them so was seeing with what serenity the builder stood three hundred feet in air, upon an unrailed perch. This none but he durst do, but his periodic standing upon the pile, in each stage of its growth, such discipline had its last result. Little remained now but the bells. These, in all respects, must correspond with their receptacle. The minor ones were prosperously cast. A highly enriched one followed, of a singular make, intended for suspension in a manner before unknown. The purpose of this bell, its rotary motion and connection with the clockwork, also executed at the time, will, in the sequel, receive mention. In the one erection, bell-tower and clock-tower were united, though before that period such structures had commonly been built distinct, as the Campanile and Torre del Orologio of St. Mark to this day attest. But it was upon the great state bell that the founder lavished his more daring skill. In vain did some of the less elated magistrates here caution him saying that though truly the tower was titanic, yet limit should be set to the dependent weight of its swaying masses. But undeterred, 
he prepared his mammoth mould dented with mythological devices kindled his fires of balsamic firs melted his tin and copper and throwing in much plate contributed by the public spirit of the nobles let loose the tide the unleashed metals bayed like hounds the workmen shrunk through their fright fatal harm to the bell was dreaded fearless as shadrach banadona rushed through the glow smote the chief culprit with his ponderous ladle from the smitten part a splinter was dashed into the seething mass and at once was melted in next day a portion of the work was heedfully uncovered all seemed right upon the third morning with equal satisfaction it was bared still lower at length like some old tibetan king the whole cool casting was disinterred all was fair except one strange spot but as he suffered no one to attend him in these inspections he concealed the blemish by some preparation which none knew better to devise the casting of such a mass was deemed no small triumph for the caster one too in which the state might not scorn to share the homicide was overlooked by the charitable that deed was but imputed to sudden transports of aesthetic passion not to any flagitious quality a kick from an arabian charger not sign of vice but blood his felony remitted by the judge absolution given him by the priest what more could even a sickly conscience have desired honoring the tower and its builder with another holiday the republic witnessed the hoisting of the bells and clockwork amid shows and pomps superior to the former some months of more than usual solitude on banadona's part ensued it was not unknown that he was engaged upon something for the belfry intended to complete it and surpass all that had gone before most people imagined that the design would involve a casting like the bells but those who thought they had some further insight would shake their heads with hints that not for nothing did the mechanician keep so secret meantime his seclusion failed not to invest his work with more or less of that sort of mystery pertaining to the forbidden ere long he had a heavy object hoisted to the belfry wrapped in a dark sack or cloak a procedure sometimes had in the case of an elaborate piece of sculpture or statue which being intended to grace the front of a new edifice the architect does not desire exposed to critical eyes till set up finished in its appointed place such was the impression now but as the object rose a statuary present observed or thought he did that it was not entirely rigid but was in a manner pliant at last when the hidden thing had attained its final height and obscurely seen from below seemed almost of itself to step into the belfry as if with little assistance from the crane a shrewd old blacksmith present ventured the suspicion that it was but a living man this surmise was thought a foolish one while the general interest failed not to augment not without demure from banadona the chief magistrate of the town with an associate both elderly men followed what seemed the image up the tower but arrived at the belfry they had little recompense plausibly entrenching himself behind the conceited mysteries of his art the mechanician withheld present explanation the magistrates glanced toward the cloaked object which to their surprise seemed now to have changed its attitude or else had before been more perplexingly concealed by the violent muffling action of the wind without it seemed now seated upon some sort of frame or chair contained within the domino they observed that nigh the top in a sort of square the web of the cloth either from accident or design had its warp partly withdrawn and the cross threads plucked out here and there so as to form a sort of woven grating whether it were the low wind or no stealing through the stone lattice work or only their own perturbed imaginations is uncertain but they thought they discerned a slight sort of fitful spring-like motion in the domino nothing however incidental or insignificant escaped their uneasy eyes among other things they pried out in a corner an earthen cup 
partly corroded and partly encrusted, and one whispered to the other that this cup was just such a one as might, in mockery, be offered to the lips of some brazen statue, or perhaps still worse. But being questioned, the mechanician said that the cup was simply used in his founder's business, and described the purpose. In short, a cup to test the condition of metals and fusion. He added that it had got into the belfry by the merest chance. Again and again they gazed at the domino, as at some suspicious incognito at a Venetian mask. All sorts of vague apprehensions stirred them. They even dreaded lest, when they should descend, the mechanician, though without a flesh-and-blood companion, for all that, would not be left alone. Affecting some merriment at their disquietude, he begged to relieve them, by extending a coarse sheet of workman's canvas between them and the object. Meantime he sought to interest them in his other work, nor, now that the domino was out of sight, did they long remain insensible to the artistic wonders lying round them, wonders hitherto beheld but in their unfinished state, because, since hoisting the bells, none but the caster had entered within the belfry. It was one trait of his that, even in details, he would not let another do what he could, without too great loss of time, accomplish for himself. So, for several preceding weeks, whatever hours were unemployed in his secret design had been devoted to elaborating the figures on the bells. The clock-bell, in particular, now drew attention. Under a patient chisel, the latent beauty of its enrichments, before obscured by the clouding's incident to casting, that beauty in its shyest grace was now revealed. Round and round the bell, twelve figures of gay girls, garlanded, hand in hand, danced in a choral ring, the embodied hours. Banadona, said the chief, this bell excels all else. No added touch could here improve. Hark! hearing a sound. Was that the wind? The wind, Excellenza, was the light response. But the figures, they are not yet without their faults. They need some touches yet. When those are given, and the block yonder, pointing towards the canvas screen, when Haman there, as I merrily call him, him? It. I mean, when Haman is fixed on this, his lofty tree, then, gentlemen, will I be most happy to receive you here again. The equivocal reference to the object caused some return of restlessness. However, on their part, the visitors forbore further allusion to it, unwilling, perhaps, to let the foundling see how easily it lay within his plebeian art to stir the placid dignity of nobles. "'Well, Banadona,' said the chief, "'how long ere you are ready to set the clock going, so that the hour shall be sounded? Our interest in you, not less than in the work itself, makes us anxious to be assured of your success. The people, too. Why, they are shouting now. Say the exact hour when you will be ready. "'Tomorrow, Excellenza, if you listen for it, or should you not, all the same, strange music will be heard. The stroke of one shall be the first from yonder bell, pointing to the bell adorned with girls and garlands. That stroke shall fall there, where the hand of Una clasps Dua's. The stroke of one shall sever that loved clasp. Tomorrow, then, at one o'clock, as struck here, precisely here, advancing and placing his finger upon the clasp, the poor mechanic will be most happy once more to give you liege audience in this his littered shop. Farewell till then, illustrious magnificos, and hark ye for your vassal's stroke. His still volcanic face hiding its burning brightness like a forge, he moved with ostentatious deference towards the scuttle, as if so far to escort their exit. But the junior magistrate, a kind-hearted man, troubled at what seemed to him a certain sardonical disdain lurking beneath the foundling's humble mane, and in Christian sympathy more distressed at it on his account than on his own, dimly surmising what might be the final fate of such a cynic solitaire, nor perhaps uninfluenced by the general strangeness of surrounding things, this good magistrate had glanced sadly 
sideways from the speaker, and thereupon his foreboding eye had started at the expression of the unchanging face of the hour Una. How is this, Bonadonna? he lowly asked. Una looks unlike her sisters. In Christ's name, Bonadonna, impulsively broke in the chief, his attention for the first attracted to the figure by his associate's remark. Una's face looks just like that of Deborah, the prophetess, as painted by the Florentine del Fonca. Surely, Bonadonna, lowly resumed the milder magistrate, you meant the twelve should wear the same jocundly abandoned air. But see, the smile of Una seems but a fatal one. Tis different. While his mild associate was speaking, the chief glanced, inquiringly, from him to the caster, as if anxious to mark how the discrepancy would be accounted for. As the chief stood, his advanced foot was on the scuttle's curb. Bonadonna spoke. Excellenza, now that, following your keener eye, I glance upon the face of Una, I do indeed perceive some little variance. But look all round the bell, and you will find no two faces entirely correspond. Because there is a law in art. But the cold wind is rising more. These lattices are but a poor defense. Suffer me, magnificos, to conduct you at least partly on your way. Those in whose well-being there is a public stake should be heedfully attended. Touching the look of Una, you were saying, Bonadonna, that there was a certain law in art, observed the chief, as the three now descended the stone shaft. Pray, tell me then. Pardon, another time, Excellenza. The tower is damp. Nay, I must rest and hear it now. Here, here is a wide landing, and through this leeward slit no wind but ample light. Tell us of your law, and at large. Since, Excellenza, you insist, know that there is a law in art which bars the possibility of duplicates. Some years ago, you may remember, I graved a small seal for your republic, bearing for its chief device the head of your own ancestor, its illustrious founder. It becoming necessary for the customs used to have innumerable impressions for bales and boxes, I graved an entire plate containing one hundred of the seals. Now, though, indeed, my object was to have those hundred heads identical, and though, I dare say, people think them, so, yet upon closely scanning an uncut impression from the plate, no two of those five score faces, side by side, will be found alike. Gravity is the heir of all, but diversified in all. In some, benevolent. In some, ambiguous. In two or three, to a close scrutiny, all but incipiently malign, the variation of less than a hair's breadth in the linear shadings round the mouth sufficing to all this. Now, Excellenza, transmute that general gravity into joyousness, and subject it to twelve of those variations I have described, and tell me, will you not have my hours here, and Una one of them? But I like... Hark! Is that... A footfall above? Mortar, Excellenza. Sometimes it drops to the belfry floor from the arch where the stonework was left undressed. I must have it seen to. As I was about to say, for one, I like this law forbidding duplicates. It evokes fine personalities. Yes, Excellenza, that strange and to you uncertain smile and those four-looking eyes of Una suit Banadona very well. Hark! Sure we left no soul above. No soul, Excellenza. Rest assured, no soul. Again the mortar. It fell not while we were there. Ah, in your presence it better knew its place, Excellenza, blandly bowed Bonadonna. But Una, said the milder magistrate, she seemed intently gazing on you. One would have almost sworn that she picked you out from among us three. If she did, possibly it might have been her finer apprehension, Excellenza. How, Bonadonna? I do not understand you. No consequence, no consequence, Excellenza. But the shifted wind is blowing through the slit. Suffer me to escort you on, and then, pardon, but the toiler must to his tools. 
"'It may be foolish, senor,' said the milder magistrate, as from the third landing the two now went down unescorted. "'But somehow our great mechanician moves me strangely. Why, just now, when he so superciliously replied, his walk seemed Cicera's, God's vain foe in Del Fonca's painting. And that young sculptor Deborah, too. Ay, and that—' "'Tush, tush, senor,' returned the chief. A passing whim. Deborah? Where's jail, pray? Ah, said the other, as they now stepped upon the sod. Ah, senor, I see you leave your fears behind you with the chill and gloom. But mine, even in this sunny air, remain. Hark! It was a sound from just within the tower door whence they had emerged. Turning, they saw it closed. He has slipped down and barred us out, smiled the chief. But it is his custom. Proclamation was now made that the next day, at one hour after meridian, the clock would strike, and, thanks to the mechanician's powerful art, with unusual accompaniments. But what those should be, none as yet could say. The announcement was received with cheers. By the looser sort, who encamped about the tower all night, Lights were seen gleaming through the topmost blind work, only disappearing with the morning sun. Strange sounds, too, were heard, or were thought to be, by those whom anxious watching might not have left mentally undisturbed, sounds not only of some ringing implement, but also, so they said, half-suppressed screams and plainings, such as might have issued from some ghostly engine overplied. Slowly the day drew on part of the concourse chasing the weary time with songs and games, till, at last, the great blurred sun rolled, like a football, against the plain. At noon, the nobility and principal citizens came from the town in cavalcade, a guard of soldiers also with music, the more to honor the occasion. Only one hour more. Impatience grew. Watches were held in hands of feverish men, who stood now scrutinizing their small dial-plates, and then, with neck thrown back, gazing toward the belfry, as if the eye might foretell that which could only be made sensible to the ear, for, as yet, there was no dial to the tower clock. The hour hands of a thousand watches now verged within a hair's breadth of the figure one. A silence, as of the expectation of some Shiloh, pervaded the swarming plain. Suddenly a dull, mangled sound, not ringing in it, scarcely audible, indeed, to the outer circles of the people, that dull sound dropped heavily from the belfry. At the same moment each man stared at his neighbor blankly. All watches were upheld. All our hands were at, had passed, the figure one. No bell stroke from the tower. The multitude became tumultuous. Waiting a few moments, the chief magistrate, commanding silence, hailed the belfry to know what thing unforeseen had happened there. No response. He hailed again and yet again. All continued hushed. By his order, the soldiers burst in the tower door, when, stationing guards to defend it from the now surging mob, the chief, accompanied by his former associate, climbed the winding stairs. Halfway up, they stopped to listen. No sound. Mounting faster, they reached the belfry, but, at the threshold, started at the spectacle disclosed. A spaniel, which, unbeknown to them, had followed them thus far, stood shivering as before some unknown monster in a break, or rather, as if it snuffed footsteps leading to some other world. Banadona lay prostrate and bleeding at the base of the bell which was adorned with girls and garlands. He lay at the feet of the hour Una, his head coinciding in a vertical line with her left hand, clasped by the hour Dua. With downcast face impending over him, like jail over nailed Cicetta in the tent, was the domino, now no more becloaked. It had limbs and seemed clad in a scaly mail, lustrous as a dragon beetle's. It was manacled, and its clubbed arms were uplifted, as if with its manacles once more to smite its already smitten victim. 
one advanced foot of it was inserted beneath the dead body as if in the act of spurning it uncertainty falls on what now followed it were but natural to suppose that the magistrates would at first shrink from immediate personal contact with what they saw at the least for a time they would stand in involuntary doubt it may be in more or less of horrified alarm certain it is that an arquebus was called for from below and some add that its report followed by a fierce whiz as of the sudden snapping of a mainspring with a steely din as if a stack of sword blades should be dashed upon a pavement these blended sounds came ringing to the plain attracting every eye far upward to the belfry whence through the lattice work thin wreaths of smoke were curling some averred that it was the spaniel gone mad by fear which was shot this others denied true it was the spaniel never more was seen and probably for some unknown reason it shared the burial now to be related of the domino for whatever the preceding circumstances may have been the first instinctive panic over or else all ground of reasonable fear removed the two magistrates by themselves quickly rehooded the figure in the dropped cloak wherein it had been hoisted the same night it was secretly lowered to the ground smuggled to the beach pulled far out to sea and sunk nor to any after urgency even in free convivial hours would the twain ever disclose the full secrets of the belfry from the mystery unavoidably investing it the popular solution of the foundling's fate involved more or less of supernatural agency but some few less unscientific minds pretended to find little difficulty in otherwise accounting for it in the chain of circumstantial inferences drawn there may or may not have been some absent or defective links but as the explanation in question is the only one which tradition has explicitly preserved in dearth of better it will here be given but in the first place it is requisite to present the supposition entertained as to the entire motive and mode with their origin of the secret design of banadona the minds above mentioned assuming to penetrate as well into his soul as into the event the disclosure will indirectly involve reference to peculiar matters none of the clearest beyond the immediate subject at that period no large bell was made to sound otherwise than as at present by agitation of a tongue within by means of ropes or persuasion from without either from cumbrous machinery or stalwart watchmen armed with heavy hammers stationed in the belfry or in sentry boxes on the open roof according as the bell was sheltered or exposed it was from observing these exposed bells with their watchmen that the foundling as was opined derived the first suggestion of his scheme perched on a great mast or spire the human figure viewed from below undergoes such a reduction in its apparent size as to obliterate its intelligent features it evinces no personality instead of bespeaking volition its gestures rather resemble the automatic ones of the arms of a telegraph Musing, therefore, upon the purely Punchinello aspect of the human figure thus beheld, it had indirectly occurred to Bonadonna to devise some metallic agent which should strike the hour with its mechanic hand with even greater precision than the vital one. And, moreover, as the vital watchman on the roof, sallying from his retreat at the given periods, walked to the bell with uplifted mace to smite it, Bonadonna had resolved that his invention should likewise possess the power of locomotion, and, along with that, the appearance, at least, of intelligence and will. If the conjectures of those who claimed acquaintance with the intent of Banadona be thus far correct, no unenterprising spirit could have been his. But they stopped not here, intimating that, though indeed his design had in the first place been prompted by the sight of the watchman, and confined to the devising of a subtle substitute for him yet as is not seldom the case with projectors by insensible gradations proceeding from comparatively pygmy aims to titanic ones 
the original scheme had, in its anticipated eventualities, at last attained to an unheard-of degree of daring. He still bent his efforts upon the locomotive figure for the belfry, but only as a partial type of an ulterior creature, a sort of elephantine helot, adapted to further, in a degree scarcely to be imagined, the universal conveniences and glories of humanity, supplying nothing less than a supplement to the six days' work, stocking the earth with a new surf more useful than the ox, swifter than the dolphin, stronger than the lion, more cunning than the ape, for industry an ant, more fiery than serpents, and yet, in patience, another ass. All excellences of all God-made creatures which served man were here to receive advancement, and then to be combined in one. Talus was to have been the all-accomplished helot's name. Talus, iron slave to Bonadonna, and, through him, to man. Here it might well be thought that, were these last conjectures as to the foundling secrets not erroneous, then must he have been hopelessly infected with the craziest chimeras of his age. Far outgoing Albert Magus and Cornelius Agrippa. But the contrary was averred. However marvellous his design, however apparently transcending not alone the bounds of human invention, but those of divine creation, yet the proposed means to be employed were alleged to have been confined within the sober forms of sober reason. It was affirmed that, to a degree of more than sceptic scorn, Bonadonna had been without sympathy for any of the vainglorious irrationalities of his time. For example, he had not concluded with the visionaries among the metaphysicians that between the finer mechanic forces and the ruder animal vitality some germ of correspondence might prove discoverable. As little did his scheme partake of the enthusiasm of some natural philosophers who hoped, by physiological and chemical inductions, to arrive at a knowledge of the source of life, and so qualify themselves to manufacture and improve upon it. Much less had he aught in common with the tribe of alchemists, who sought, by a species of incantations, to evoke some surprising vitality from the laboratory. Neither had he imagined, with certain sanguine theosophists, that, by faithful adoration of the highest unheard-of powers, would be vouchsafed to man. A practical materialist, what Bonadonna had aimed at was to have been reached not by logic, not by crucible, not by conjuration, not by altars, but by plain vice-bench and hammer. In short, to solve nature, to steal into her, to intrigue beyond her, to procure someone else to bind her to his hand, these, one and all, had not been his objects, but, asking no favors from any element or any being of himself to rival her, outstrip her and rule her. He stooped to conquer. With him, common sense was theurgy, machinery, miracle. Prometheus, the heroic name for machinist, man, the true God. Nevertheless, in his initial step, so far as the experimental automation for the belfry was concerned, he allowed fancy some little play, or perhaps what seemed his fancifulness was but his utilitarian ambition collaterally extended. In figure, the creature for the belfry should not be likened after the human pattern, nor any animal one, nor after the ideals, however wild, of ancient fable, but equally, in aspect, as in organism, be an original production. The more terrible to behold, the better. Such, then, were the suppositions as to the present scheme, and the reserved intent. How, at the very threshold, so unlooked for a catastrophe overturned all, or rather, what was the conjecture here, is now to be set forth. It was thought that, on the day preceding the fatality, his visitors having left him, Bonadonna had unpacked the belfry image, adjusted it, and placed it in the retreat provided, a sort of sentry-box in one corner of the belfry. In short, throughout the night, and for some part of the ensuing morning, he had been engaged in arranging everything connected with the domino, the issuing from the sentry-box each sixty minutes, 
sliding along a grooved way like a railway, advancing to the clock-bell with uplifted manacles, striking it at one of the twelve junctions of the four-and-twenty hands, then wheeling, circling the bell, and retiring to its post, there to bide for another sixty minutes, when the same process was to be repeated. The bell, by a cunning mechanism, meantime turning on its vertical axis, so as to present to the descending mace the clasped hands of the next two figures, when it would strike two, three, and so on to the end. The musical metal in this time-bell, being so managed in the fusion by some art, perishing with its originator, that each of the clasps of the four-and-twenty hands should give forth its own peculiar resonance when parted. But on the magic metal, the magic and metallic stranger never struck but that one stroke, drove but that one nail, served but that one clasp, by which Banadona clung to his ambitious life. For, after winding up the creature in the sentry-box, so that, for the present, skipping the intervening hours, it should not emerge till the hour of one, but should then infallibly emerge, and, after deftly oiling the grooves whereon it was to slide, it was surmised that the mechanism must then have hurried to the bell to give his final touches to its sculpture. True artist, he here became absorbed, and absorption still further intensified it may be by his striving to abate that strange look of Una, which, though before others, he had treated with such unconcern, might not in secret have been without its thorn. And so, for the interval, he was oblivious of his creature which, not oblivious of him, and true to its creation, and true to its heedful winding up, left its post precisely at the given moment, along its well-oiled route, slid noiselessly towards its mark, and, aiming at the hand of Una, to ring one clangorous note, dully smote the intervening brain of Banadona, turned backwards to it. The manacled arms then instantly upspringing to their hovering poise. The falling body clogged the thing's return, so there it stood, still impending over Bonadonna, as if whispering some post-mortem terror. The chisel lay dropped from the hand, but beside the hand. The oil-flask spilled across the iron track. In his unhappy end, not unmindful of the rare genius of the mechanician, the Republic decreed him a stately funeral. It was resolved that the great bell— the one whose casting had been jeopardized through the timidity of the ill-starred workmen, should be rung upon the entrance of the buyer into the cathedral. The most robust man of the country round was assigned the office of bell-ringer. But as the pall-bearers entered the cathedral porch, naught but a broken and disastrous sound, like that of some lone alpine landslide, fell from the tower upon their ears, and then all was hushed. Glancing backwards, they saw the groin belfry crashed sideways in. It afterwards appeared that the powerful peasant, who had the bell-rope in charge, wishing to test at once the full glory of the bell, had swayed down upon the rope with one concentrate jerk. The mass of quaking metal, too ponderous for its frame and strangely feeble somewhere at its top, loosed from its fastening, tore sideways down, and, tumbling in one sheer fall three hundred feet to the soft sward below, buried itself inverted and half out of sight. Upon its disinterment, the main fracture was found to have started from a small spot in the ear, which, being scraped, revealed a defect, deceptively minute in the casting, which defect must subsequently have been pasted over with some unknown compound. The remolten metal soon reassumed its place in the tower's repaired superstructure. For one year, the metallic choir of birds sang musically in its belfry bow work of sculptured blinds and traceries. But on the first anniversary of the tower's completion, at early dawn, before the concourse had surrounded it, an earthquake came. One loud crash was heard. The stone pine, with all its bower of songsters, lay overthrown upon the plain. So the blind slave obeyed its blinder lord, but, in obedience, slew him. So the creator was killed by the creature. So the bell was too heavy for the tower. 
so the bell's main weakness was where man's blood had flawed it and so pride went before the fall end of the bell tower recording by james k white chula vista by george william curtis this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In my mind's eye, Horatio. Hamlet. Prue and I do not entertain much. Our means forbid it. In truth, other people entertain for us. We enjoy that hospitality of which no account is made. We see the show, and hear the music, and smell the flowers of great festivities, tasting, as it were, the drippings from rich dishes. Our own dinner service is remarkably plain. Our dinners, even on state occasions, are strictly in keeping, and almost our only guest is Titbottom. I buy a handful of roses, as I come up from the office perhaps, and Prue arranges them so prettily in a glass dish for the center of the table that even when I have hurried out to see Aurelia step into her carriage to go out to dine, I have thought that the bouquet she carried was not more beautiful because it was more costly. I grant that it was more harmonious with her superb beauty and her rich attire, and I have no doubt that if Aurelia knew the old man whom she must have seen so often watching her, and his wife, who ornaments her sex with as much sweetness, although with less splendor, than Aurelia herself, she would also acknowledge that the nosegay of roses was as fine and fit upon their table as her own sumptuous bouquet is for herself. I have so much faith in the perception of that lovely lady. It is my habit, I hope I may say my nature, to believe the best of people rather than the worst. If I thought that all this sparkling setting of beauty, this fine fashion, these blazing jewels, and lustrous silks and airy gauzes, embellished with gold-threaded embroidery and wrought in a thousand exquisite elaborations, so that I cannot see one of those lovely girls pass me by without thanking God for the vision. If I thought that this was all, and that underneath her lace flounces and diamond bracelets Aurelia was a sullen, selfish woman, then I should turn sadly homeward, for I should see that her jewels were flashing scorn upon the object they adorned, that her laces were of a more exquisite loveliness than the woman whom they merely touched with a superficial grace. It would be like a gaily decorated mausoleum, bright to see, but silent and dark within. Great excellences, my dear Prue, I sometimes allow myself to say, lie concealed in the depths of character, like pearls at the bottom of the sea. Under the laughing, glancing surface, how little they are suspected. Perhaps love is nothing else than the sight of them by one person. Hence, every man's mistress is apt to be an enigma to everybody else. I have no doubt that when Aurelia is engaged, people will say she is a most admirable girl, certainly, but they cannot understand why any man should be in love with her, as if it were at all necessary that they should. And her lover, like a boy who finds a pearl in the public street, and wonders as much that others did not see it as that he did, will tremble until he knows his passion is returned, feeling, of course, that the whole world must be in love with this paragon, who cannot possibly smile upon anything so unworthy as he." I hope, therefore, my dear Mrs. Prue, I continue, and my wife looks up with pleased pride from her work, as if I were such an irresistible humorist, you will allow me to believe that the depth may be calm, although the surface is dancing. If you tell me that Aurelia is but a giddy girl, I shall believe that you think so. But I shall know all the while what profound dignity and sweetness and peace lie at the foundation of her character. I say such things to Titbottom during the dull season at the office and I have known him sometimes to reply, with a kind of dry, sad humor, not as if he enjoyed the joke, but as if the joke must be made, that he saw no reason why I should be dull because the season was so. "'And what do I know of Aurelia, or any other girl?' he says to me, with that abstracted air. "'I, whose Aurelias were of another century, and another zone.' Then he falls into a silence which it seems quite profane to interrupt." But as we sit upon our high stools at the desk opposite each other, I leaning upon my elbows and looking at him, he with sidelong face glancing out of the window, as if it commanded a boundless landscape instead of a dim, dingy office court, I cannot refrain from saying, Well! He turns slowly, and I go chatting on, 
a little too loquacious, perhaps, about those young girls. But I know that Titbottom regards such an excess as venial, for his sadness is so sweet that you could believe it the reflection of a smile from long, long years ago. One day, after I had been talking for a long time, and we had put up our books and were preparing to leave, he stood for some time by the window, gazing with a drooping intentness, as if he really saw something more than the dark court, and said slowly, "'Perhaps you would have different impressions of things if you saw them through my spectacles.' There was no change in his expression. He still looked from the window, and I said, "'Titbottom, I did not know that you used glasses. I have never seen you wearing spectacles.' "'No, I don't often wear them. I'm not very fond of looking through them. But sometimes an irresistible necessity compels me to put them on, and I cannot help seeing.' Titbottom sighed. "'Is it so grievous a fate to see?' inquired I. "'Yes, through my spectacles,' he said, turning slowly, and looking at me with wan solemnity. It grew dark as we stood in the office talking, and taking our hats we went out together. The narrow street of business was deserted. The heavy iron shutters were gloomily closed over the windows. From one or two offices struggled the dim gleam of an early candle, by whose light some perplexed accountant sat belated and hunting for his error. A careless clerk passed, whistling. But the great tide of life had ebbed. We heard its roar far away, and the sound stole into that silent street like the murmur of the ocean into an inland dell. "'You will come and dine with us, Titbottom?' He assented by continuing to walk with me, and I think we were both glad when we reached the house and Prue came to meet us, saying, "'Do you know I hoped you would bring Mr. Titbottom to dine?' Titbottom smiled gently and answered, he might have brought his spectacles with him, and have been a happier man for it. Prue looked a little puzzled. My dear, I said, you must know that our friend Mr. Titbottom is the happy possessor of a pair of wonderful spectacles. I have never seen them, indeed, and from what he says, I should be rather afraid of being seen by them. Most short-sighted persons are very glad to have the help of glasses, but Mr. Titbottom seems to find very little pleasure in his." It is because they make him too far-sighted, perhaps, interrupted Prue quietly, as she took the silver soup ladle from the sideboard. We sipped our wine after dinner, and Prue took her work. Can a man be too far-sighted? I did not ask the question aloud. The very tone in which Prue had spoken convinced me that he might. At least, I said, Mr. Titbottom will not refuse to tell us the history of his mysterious spectacles. I have known plenty of magic in eyes— and I glanced at the tender blue eyes of Prue, but I have not heard of any enchanted glasses. Yet you must have seen the glass in which your wife looks every morning, and, I take it, that glass must be daily enchanted, said Titbottom, with a bow of quaint respect to my wife. I do not think I have seen such a blush upon Prue's cheeks since, well, since a great many years ago. I will gladly tell you the history of my spectacles, began Titbottom. It is very simple, and I am not at all sure that a great many other people have not a pair of the same kind. I have never indeed heard of them by the gross, like those of our young friend Moses, the ewe of the vicar of Wakefield. In fact, I think a gross would be quite enough to supply the world. It is a kind of article for which the demand does not increase with use. If we should all wear spectacles like mine, we should never smile any more. Or, I am not quite sure, we should all be very happy. A very important difference, said Prue counting her stitches. You know my grandfather Titbottom was a West Indian. A large proprietor and an easy man, he basked in the tropical sun, leading his quiet, luxurious life. He lived much alone and was what people call eccentric, by which I understand that he was very much himself, and, refusing the influence of other people, they had their revenges and called him names. It is a habit not exclusively tropical. I think I have seen the same thing even in this city." But he was greatly beloved, my bland and bountiful grandfather. He was so large-hearted and open-handed. He was so friendly and thoughtful and genial that even his jokes had the air of graceful benedictions. He did not seem to grow old, and he was one of those who never appeared to have been very young. He flourished in a perennial maturity, an immortal middle age. My grandfather lived upon one of the small islands, St. Kitts, perhaps, and his domain extended to the sea. His house, a rambling West Indian mansion, was surrounded with deep, spacious piazzas, covered with luxurious lounges, among which one capacious chair was his peculiar seat. 
They tell me he used sometimes to sit there for the whole day, his great soft brown eyes fastened upon the sea, watching the specks of sails that flashed upon the horizon, while the evanescent expressions chased each other over his placid face, as if it reflected the calm and changing sea before him. His morning costume was an ample dressing gown of gorgeously flowered silk, and his morning was very apt to last all day. He rarely read, but he would pace the great piazza for hours, with his hands buried in the pockets of his dressing gown, and an air of sweet reverie which any book must be a very entertaining one to produce. Society, of course, he saw little. There was some slight apprehension that if he were bidden to social entertainments, he might forget his coat, or arrive without some other essential part of his dress, and there is a sly tradition in the Titbottom family that once, having been invited to a ball in honor of a new governor of the island, my grandfather Titbottom sauntered into the hall towards midnight, wrapped in the gorgeous flowers of his dressing gown, and with his hands buried in the pockets as usual. There was great excitement among the guests, and immense deprecation of gubernatorial ire. Fortunately it happened that the governor and my grandfather were old friends, and there was no offense. But, as they were conversing together, one of the distressed managers cast indignant glances at the brilliant costume of my grandfather, who summoned him and asked courteously, "'Did you invite me or my coat?' "'You in a proper coat,' replied the manager. The governor smiled approvingly and looked at my grandfather. "'My friend,' said he to the manager, "'I beg your pardon. I forgot.' The next day my grandfather was seen promenading in full ball dress along the streets of the little town. "'They ought to know,' said he, "'that I have a proper coat, and that not contempt nor poverty, but forgetfulness sent me to a ball in my dressing-gown. He did not much frequent social festivals after this failure, but he always told the story with satisfaction and a quiet smile. To a stranger, life upon those little islands is uniform even to weariness, but the old native dons, like my grandfather, ripen in the prolonged sunshine, like the turtle upon the Bahama banks, nor know of existence more desirable. Life in the tropics I take to be a placid torpidity. During the long, warm mornings of nearly half a century, my grandfather Titbottom had sat in his dressing gown and gazed at the sea. But one calm June day, as he slowly paced the piazza after breakfast, his dreamy glance was arrested by a little vessel, evidently nearing the shore. He called for his spyglass and, surveying the craft, saw that she came from the neighboring island. She glided smoothly, slowly, over the summer sea. The warm morning air was sweet with perfumes and silent with heat. The sea sparkled languidly, and the brilliant blue sky hung cloudlessly over. Scores of little island vessels had my grandfather seen coming over the horizon and cast anchor in the port. Hundreds of summer mornings had the white sails flashed and faded, like vague faces through forgotten dreams. But this time he laid down the spyglass and leaned against a column of the piazza and watched the vessel with an intentness that he could not explain. She came nearer and nearer, a graceful specter in the dazzling morning. "'Decidedly, I must step down and see about that vessel,' said my grandfather Titbottom. He gathered his ample dressing gown about him and stepped from the piazza with no other protection from the sun than the little smoking cap upon his head. His face wore a calm, beaming smile, as if he loved the whole world. He was not an old man, but there was almost a patriarchal pathos in his expression as he sauntered along in the sunshine towards the shore. A group of idle gazers was collected to watch the arrival. The little vessel furled her sails and drifted slowly landward, and, as she was of very light draught, she came close to the shelving shore. A long plank was put out from her side, and the debarkation commenced. My grandfather Titbottom stood looking on to see the passengers as they passed. There were but a few of them, and mostly traders from the neighboring island, but suddenly the face of a young girl appeared over the side of the vessel, and she stepped upon the plank to descend. My grandfather Titbottom instantly advanced, and moving briskly, reached the top of the plank at the same moment, and with the old tassel of his cap flashing in the sun, and one hand in the pocket of his dressing gown, with the other he handed the young lady carefully down the plank. That young lady was afterwards my grandmother Titbottom. For, over the gleaming sea which he had watched so long, and which seemed thus to reward his patient gaze, came his bride that sunny morning. "'Of course we are happy,' he used to say to her, after they were married. "'For you are the gift of the sun I have loved so long and so well.' 
and my grandfather Titbottom would lay his hand so tenderly upon the golden hair of his young bride that you could fancy him a devout Parsi caressing sunbeams. There were endless festivities upon occasion of the marriage, and my grandfather did not go to one of them in his dressing gown. The gentle sweetness of his wife melted every heart into love and sympathy. He was much older than she, without doubt, but age, as he used to say with a smile of immortal youth, is a matter of feeling, not of years. And if sometimes, as she sat by his side on the piazza, her fancy looked through her eyes upon that summer sea, and saw a younger lover, perhaps some one of those graceful and glowing heroes who occupy the foreground of all young maidens' visions by the sea, yet she could not find one more generous and gracious, nor fancy one more worthy and loving than my grandfather Titbottom. And if, in the moonlit midnight, while he lay calmly sleeping, she leaned out of the window and sank into vague reveries of sweet possibility, and watched the gleaming path of the moonlight upon the water until the dawn glided over it, it was only that mood of nameless regret and longing which underlies all human happiness, or it was the vision of that life of cities and the world, which she had never seen but of which she had often read, and which looked very fair and alluring across the sea to a girlish imagination, which knew that it should never see that reality. "'These West Indian years were the great days of the family,' said Titbottom, with an air of majestic and regal regret, pausing and musing in our little parlour, like a late steward in exile remembering England. Prue raised her eyes from her work and looked at him with subdued admiration, for I have observed that, like the rest of her sex, she has a singular sympathy with the representative of a reduced family. Perhaps it is their finer perception which leads these tender-hearted women to recognize the divine right of social superiority so much more readily than we, and yet, much as Titbottom was enhanced in my wife's admiration by the discovery that his dusky sadness of nature and expression was, as it were, the expiring gleam and late twilight of ancestral splendors, I doubt if Mr. Bourne would have preferred him for a bookkeeper a moment sooner upon that account. In truth, I have observed, downtown, that the fact of your ancestors doing nothing is not considered good proof that you can do anything. But Prue and her sex regard sentiment more than action, and I understand easily enough why she is never tired of hearing me read of Prince Charlie. If Titbottom had been only a little younger, a little handsomer, a little more gallantly dressed, in fact, a little more of a Prince Charlie, I am sure her eyes would not have fallen again upon her work so tranquilly as he resumed his story. I can remember my grandfather Titbottom, although I was a very young child, and he was a very old man. My young mother and my young grandmother are very distinct figures in my memory, ministering to the old gentleman, wrapped in his dressing-gown and seated upon the piazza. I remember his white hair and his calm smile, and how, not long before he died, he called me to him, and laying his hand upon my head, said to me, My child, the world is not this great sunny piazza, nor life the fairy stories which the women tell you here as you sit in their laps. I shall soon be gone, but I want to leave you with some memento of my love for you, and I know of nothing more valuable than these spectacles, which your grandmother brought from her native island, when she arrived here one fine summer morning long ago. I cannot tell whether, when you grow older, you will regard them as a gift of the greatest value, or as something that you had been happier never to have possessed. But, Grandpapa, I am not short-sighted. My son, are you not human? said the old gentleman. And how shall I ever forget the thoughtful sadness with which, at the same time, he handed me the spectacles? Instinctively I put them on, and looked at my grandfather. But I saw no grandfather, no piazza, no flowered dressing-gown. I saw only a luxuriant palm-tree waving broadly over a tranquil landscape, pleasant homes clustered around it, gardens teeming with fruit and flowers, flocks quietly feeding, birds wheeling and chirping. I heard children's voices and the low lullaby of happy mothers. The sound of cheerful singing came wafted from distant fields upon the light breeze. Golden harvests glisten out of sight, and I caught their rustling whispers of prosperity. A warm, mellow atmosphere bathed the whole. I have seen copies of the landscapes of the Italian, painter Claude, which seemed to me faint reminiscences of that calm and happy vision. But all this peace and prosperity seemed to flow from the spreading palm as from a fountain. I do not know how long I looked, but I had, apparently, no power, 
as I had no will, to remove the spectacles. What a wonderful island must Nevis be, thought I, if people carry such pictures in their pockets, only by buying a pair of spectacles. What wonder that my dear grandmother Titbottom has lived such a placid life, and has blessed us all with her sunny temper when she has lived surrounded by such images of peace. My grandfather died, but still, in the warm morning sunshine upon the piazza, I felt his placid presence, and as I crawled into his great chair and drifted on in reverie through the still tropical day, it was as if his soft dreamy eye had passed into my soul. My grandmother cherished his memory with tender regret. A violent passion of grief for his loss was no more possible than for the pensive decay of the year. We have no portrait of him, but I see always, when I remember him, that peaceful and luxuriant palm. And I think that to have known one good old man, one man who, through the chances and rubs of a long life, has carried his heart in his hand, like a palm branch, waving all discords into peace, helps our faith in God, in ourselves, and in each other, more than many sermons. I hardly know whether to be grateful to my grandfather for the spectacles, and yet when I remember that it is to them I owe the pleasant image of him which I cherish, I seem to myself sadly ungrateful. Madam, said Titbottom to Prue, solemnly, my memory is a long and gloomy gallery, and only remotely at its further end do I see the glimmer of soft sunshine, and only there are the pleasant pictures hung. They seem to me very happy along whose gallery the sunlight streams to their very feet, striking all the pictured walls into unfading splendor. Prue had laid her work in her lap, and as Titbottom paused a moment, and I turned towards her, I found her mild eyes fastened upon my face and glistening with many tears. I knew that the tears meant that she felt herself to be one of those who seemed to Titbottom very happy. Misfortunes of many kinds came heavily upon the family after the head was gone. The great house was relinquished. My parents were both dead, and my grandmother had entire charge of me. But from the moment that I received the gift of the spectacles, I could not resist their fascination, and I withdrew into myself and became a solitary boy. There were not many companions for me of my own age, and they gradually left me, or at least had not a hearty sympathy with me, for if they teased me I pulled out my spectacles and surveyed them so seriously that they acquired a kind of awe of me, and evidently regarded my grandfather's gift as a concealed magical weapon which might be dangerously drawn upon them at any moment. Whenever, in our games, there were quarrels and high words, and I began to feel about my dress and to wear a grave look, they all took the alarm and shouted, Look out for Titbottom's spectacles, and scattered like a flock of scared sheep. Nor could I wonder at it, for at first, before they took the alarm, I saw strange sights when I looked at them through the glasses. If two were quarreling about a marble or a ball, I had only to go behind a tree where I was concealed and look at them leisurely. Then the scene changed, and it was no longer a green meadow with boys playing, but a spot which I did not recognize, and forms that made me shudder or smile. It was not a big boy bullying a little one, but a young wolf with glistening teeth and a lamb cowering before him, or it was a dog faithful and famishing, or a star going slowly into eclipse, or a rainbow fading, or a flower blooming, or a sun rising, or a waning moon. The revelations of the spectacles determined my feeling for the boys and for all whom I saw through them. No shyness, nor awkwardness, nor silence could separate me from those who looked lovely as lilies to my illuminated eyes. But the vision made me afraid. If I felt myself warmly drawn to any one, I struggled with the fierce desire of seeing him through the spectacles, for I feared to find him something else than I fancied. I longed to enjoy the luxury of ignorant feeling, to love without knowing, to float like a leaf upon the eddies of life, drifted now to a sunny point, now to solemn shade, now over glittering ripples, now over gleaming calms, and not to determined ports, a trim vessel with an inexorable rudder. But sometimes, mastered after long struggles, as if the unavoidable condition of owning the spectacles were using them, I seized them and sauntered into the little town. Putting them to my eyes, I peered into the houses and at the people who passed me. Here sat a family at breakfast, and I stood at the window looking in. O oh, motley meal! Fantastic vision! The good mother saw her lord sitting opposite, a grave, respectable being, eating muffins. 
but I saw only a bank bill, more or less crumbled and tattered, marked with a larger or lesser figure. If a sharp wind blew suddenly, I saw it tremble and flutter. It was thin, flat, impalpable. I removed my glasses and looked with my eyes at the wife. I could have smiled to see the humid tenderness with which she regarded her strange vis-a-vis. -vis. Is life only a game of blind man's bluff, of droll cross-purposes? Or I put them on again and looked at the wives. How many stout trees I saw, how many tender flowers, how many placid pools. Yes, and how many little streams winding out of sight, shrinking before the large, hard, round eyes opposite and slipping off into solitude and shade, with a low inner song for their own solace. In many houses I thought to see angels, nymphs, or at least women, and could only find broomsticks, mops, or kettles, hurrying about, rattling and tinkling, in a state of shrill activity. I made calls upon elegant ladies, and after I had enjoyed the gloss of silk, and the delicacy of lace, and the glitter of jewels, I slipped on my spectacles and saw a peacock's feather flounced and forbellowed and fluttering, or an iron rod, thin, sharp, and hard. Nor could I possibly mistake the movement of the drapery for any flexibility of the thing draped. Or, mysteriously chilled, I saw a statue of perfect form or flowing movement. It might be alabaster or bronze or marble, but sadly often it was ice and I knew that after it had shone a little, and frozen a few eyes with its despairing perfection, it could not be put away in the niches of palaces for ornament and proud family tradition, like the alabaster or bronze or marble statues, but would melt and shrink and fall coldly away in colorless and useless water, be absorbed in the earth and utterly forgotten. But the true sadness was rather in seeing those who, not having the spectacles, thought that the iron rod was flexible and the ice statue warm. I saw many a gallant heart, which seemed to me brave and loyal as the crusaders, pursuing through days and nights and a long life of devotion the hope of lighting at least a smile in the cold eyes, if not a fire in the icy heart. I watched the earnest, enthusiastic sacrifice. I saw the pure resolve, the generous faith, the fine scorn of doubt, the impatience of suspicion. I watched the grace, the ardor, the glory of devotion. Through those strange spectacles, how often I saw the noblest heart renouncing all other hope, all other ambition, all other life, than the possible love of some one of those statues. Ah, me, it was terrible, but they had not the love to give. The face was so polished and smooth, because there was no sorrow in the heart, and drearily, often, no heart to be touched. I could not wonder that the noble heart of devotion was broken, for it had dashed itself against a stone. I wept until my spectacles were dimmed for those hopeless lovers, but there was a pang beyond tears for those icy statues. Still a boy, I was thus too much a man in knowledge. I did not comprehend the sights I was compelled to see. I used to tear my glasses away from my eyes, and, frightened at myself, run to escape my own consciousness. Reaching the small house where we then lived, I plunged into my grandmother's room, and throwing myself upon the floor, buried my face in her lap, and sobbed myself to sleep with premature grief. But when I awakened, and felt her cool hand upon my hot forehead, and heard the low sweet song, or the gentle story, or the tenderly told parable from the Bible with which she tried to soothe me, I could not resist the mystic fascination that lured me, as I lay in her lap, to steal a glance at her through the spectacles. Pictures of the Madonna have not her rare and pensive beauty. Upon the tranquil little islands her life had been eventless, and all the fine possibilities of her nature were like flowers that never bloomed. Placid were all her years, yet I have read of no heroine, of no woman great in sudden crises, that it did not seem to me she might have been. The wife and widow of a man who loved his home better than the homes of others, I have yet heard of no queen, no belle, no imperial beauty whom in grace and brilliancy and persuasive courtesy she might not have surpassed. Madam, said Titbottom to my wife, whose heart hung upon his story, your husband's young friend Aurelia wears sometimes a camellia in her hair, and no diamond in the ballroom seems so costly as that perfect flower, which women envy and for whose least and withered petal men sigh. Yet, in the tropical solitudes of Brazil, 
how many a camellia bud drops from the bush that no eye has ever seen, which, had it flowered and been noticed, would have gilded all hearts with its memory. When I stole these furtive glances at my grandmother, half fearing that they were wrong, I saw only a calm lake whose shores were low, and over which the sun hung unbroken, so that the least star was clearly reflected. It had an atmosphere of solemn twilight tranquillity, and so completely did its unruffled surface blend with the cloudless, star-studded sky, that when I looked through my spectacles at my grandmother, the vision seemed to me all heaven and stars. Yet, as I gazed and gazed, I felt what stately cities might well have been built upon those shores, and have flashed prosperity over the calm like coruscations of pearls. I dreamed of gorgeous fleets, silken-sailed, and blown by perfumed winds, drifting over those depthless waters and through those spacious skies. I gazed upon the twilight, the inscrutable silence, like a God-fearing discoverer upon a new and vast sea bursting upon him through forest glooms, and in the fervor of whose impassioned gaze a millennial and poetic world arises, and man need no longer die to be happy. My companions naturally deserted me, for I had grown wearily grave and abstracted, and unable to resist the allurements of my spectacles, I was constantly lost in the world, of which those companions were part, yet of which they knew nothing. I grew cold and hard, almost morose. People seemed to me so blind and unreasonable. They did the wrong thing. They called green yellow and black white. Young men said of a girl, What a lovely simple creature! I looked, and there was only a glistening wisp of straw, dry and hollow. Or they said, What a cold, proud beauty! I looked, and lo, a Madonna, whose heart held the world. Or they said, What a wild, giddy girl! And I saw a glancing, dancing mountain stream, pure as the virgin snows whence it flowed, singing through sun and shade, over pearls and gold dust, slipping along unstained by weed or rain, or heavy foot of cattle, touching the flowers with a dewy kiss, a beam of grace, a happy song, a line of light, in the dim and troubled landscape. My grandmother sent me to school, but I looked at the master and saw that he was a smooth, round ferule, or an improper noun, or a vulgar fraction, and refused to obey him. Or he was a piece of string, a rag, a willow wand, and I had a contemptuous pity. But one was a well of cool, deep water, and looking suddenly in one day, I saw the stars. That one gave me all my schooling. With him I used to walk by the sea, and as we strolled and the waves plunged in long legions before us, I looked at him through the spectacles, and as his eyes dilated with the boundless view, and his chest heaved with an impossible desire, I saw Xerxes and his army, tossed and glittering, rank upon rank, multitude upon multitude, out of sight but ever regularly advancing, and with confused roar of ceaseless music prostrating themselves in abject homage. Or, as with arms outstretched and hair streaming on the wind, he chanted full lines of the resounding Iliad, I saw Homer pacing the Aegean sands of the Greek sunsets of forgotten times. My grandmother died, and I was thrown into the world without resources, and with no capital but my spectacles. I tried to find employment, but everybody was shy of me. There was a vague suspicion that I was either a little crazed, or a good deal in league with the Prince of Darkness. My companions, who would persist in calling a piece of painted muslin a fair and fragrant flower, had no difficulty. Success waited for them around every corner and arrived in every ship. I tried to teach, for I loved children, but if anything excited a suspicion of my pupils, and, putting on my spectacles, I saw that I was fondling a snake or smelling at a bud with a worm in it, I sprang up in horror and ran away. Or, if it seemed to me through the glasses that a cherub smiled upon me, or a rose was blooming in my buttonhole, then I felt myself imperfect and impure, not fit to be leading and training what was so essentially superior to myself, and I kissed the children and left them weeping and wondering. In despair, I went to a great merchant on the island and asked him to employ me. My dear young friend, said he, I understand that you have some singular secret, some charm or spell or amulet or something, I don't know what, of which people are afraid. "'Now you know, my dear,' said the merchant, swelling up, and apparently prouder of his great stomach than of his large fortune, "'I am not of that kind. I am not easily frightened. You may spare yourself the pain of trying to impose upon me. People who propose to come to time before I arrive are accustomed to arise very early in the morning,' said he, 
thrusting his thumbs in the armholes of his waistcoat and spreading the fingers like two fans upon his bosom. "'I think I have heard something of your secret. You have a pair of spectacles, I believe, that you value very much because your grandmother brought them as a marriage portion to your grandfather. Now, if you think fit to sell me those spectacles, I will pay you the largest market price for them. What do you say?' I told him I had not the slightest idea of selling my spectacles. "'My young friend means to eat them, I suppose,' said he, with a contemptuous smile. I made no reply, but was turning to leave the office, when the merchant called after me. "'My young friend, poor people should never suffer themselves to get into pets. Anger is an expensive luxury in which only men of certain income can indulge. A pair of spectacles and a hot temper are not the most promising capital for success in life, Master Titbottom.' I said nothing, but put my hand upon the door to go out, when the merchant said, more respectfully, "'Well, you foolish boy, if you will not sell your spectacles, perhaps you will agree to sell the use of them to me. That is, you shall only put them on when I direct you, and for my purposes.' "'Hallo, you little fool!' cried he, impatiently, as he saw that I intended to make no reply. But I had pulled out my spectacles and put them on for my own purposes, and against his wish and desire. I looked at him and saw a huge, bald-headed wild boar, with gross chaps and a leering eye, only the more ridiculous for the high-arched gold-bowed spectacles that straddled his nose. One of his forehoofs was thrust into the safe, where his bills receivable were hived, and the others into his pocket among the loose change in bills there. His ears were pricked forward with a brisk, sensitive smartness. In a world where prize pork was the best excellence, he would have carried off all the premiums. I stepped into the next office in the street, and a mild-faced, genial man, also a large and opulent merchant, asked me my business in such a tone that I instantly looked through my spectacles and saw a land flowing with milk and honey. There I pitched my tent and stayed till the good man died, and his business was discontinued. But while there, said Titbottom, and his voice trembled away into a sigh, I first saw Preciosa. Despite the spectacles, I saw Preciosa. For days, for weeks, for months, I did not take my spectacles with me. I ran away from them. I threw them up on high shelves. I tried to make up my mind to throw them into the sea or down the well. I could not, I would not, I dared not look at Preciosa through the spectacles. It was not possible for me deliberately to destroy them, but I awoke in the night and could almost have cursed my dear old grandfather for his gift. I sometimes escaped from the office and sat for whole days with Preciosa. I told her the strange things I had seen with my mystic glasses. The hours were not enough for the wild romances which I raved in her ear. She listened, astonished and appalled. Her blue eyes turned upon me with sweet deprecation. She clung to me, and then withdrew, and fled fearfully from the room. But she could not stay away. She could not resist my voice, in whose tones burnt all the love that filled my heart and brain. The very effort to resist the desire of seeing her, as I saw everybody else, gave a frenzy and an unnatural tension to my feeling and manner. I sat by her side, looking into her eyes, smoothing her hair, folding her to my heart, which was sunken deep and deep, why not forever, in that dream of peace. I ran from her presence, and shouted, and leapt with joy, and sat the whole night through, thrilled into happiness by the thought of her love and loveliness, like a wind harp, tightly strung and answering the airiest sigh of the breeze with music. Then came calmer days, the conviction of deep love settled upon our lives, as after the hurrying, heaving days of spring comes the bland and benignant summer. "'It is no dream, then, after all, and we are happy,' I said to her one day, and there came no answer, for happiness is speechless. "'We are happy, then,' I said to myself. "'There is no excitement now.' How glad I am that I can now look at her through my spectacles. I feared lest some instinct should warn me to beware. I escaped from her arms and ran home and seized the glasses, and bounded back again to Preciosa. As I entered the room I was heated. My head was swimming with confused apprehensions. My eyes must have glared. Preciosa was frightened, and rising from her seat stood with an inquiring glance of surprise in her eyes. But I was bent with frenzy upon my purpose. I was merely aware that she was in the room. I saw nothing else. I heard nothing. I cared for nothing but to see her through that magic glass, and feel all at once the fullness of blissful perfection which that would reveal. 
Preciosa stood before the mirror, but alarmed at my wild and eager movements, unable to distinguish what I had in my hands, and seeing me raise them suddenly to my face, she shrieked with terror, and fell fainting upon the floor, at the very moment that I placed the glasses before my eyes, and beheld myself reflected in the mirror before which she had been standing. "'Dear madam,' cried Titbottom to my wife, springing up and falling back again in his chair, pale and trembling, while Prue ran to him and took his hand, and I poured out a glass of water. I saw myself. There was silence for many minutes. Prue laid her hand gently upon the head of our guest, whose eyes were closed, and who breathed softly like an infant in sleeping. Perhaps in all the long years of anguish since that hour, no tender hand had touched his brow, nor wiped away the damps of a bitter sorrow. Perhaps the tender maternal fingers of my wife soothed his weary head with the conviction that he felt the hand of his mother playing with the long hair of her boy in the soft West India morning. Perhaps it was only the natural relief of expressing a pent-up sorrow. When he spoke again, it was with the old subdued tone and the air of quaint solemnity. These things were matters of long, long ago, and I came to this country soon after. I brought with me premature age, a past of melancholy memories, and the magic spectacles. I had become their slave. I had nothing more to fear. Having seen myself, I was compelled to see others, properly to understand my relations to them. The lights that cheer the future of other men had gone out for me. My eyes were those of an exile turned backwards upon the receding shore, and not forwards with hope upon the ocean." I mingled with men, but with little pleasure. There are but many varieties of a few types. I did not find those I came to clearer sighted than those I had left behind. I heard men called shrewd and wise, and reports said that they were highly intelligent and successful. My finest sense detected no aroma of purity and principle, but I saw only a fungus that had fattened and spread in a night. They went to the theaters to see actors upon the stage. I went to see actors in the boxes, so consummately cunning, that others did not know they were acting, and they did not suspect it themselves. Perhaps you wonder it did not make me misanthropical. My dear friends, do not forget that I had seen myself. That made me compassionate, not cynical. Of course, I could not value highly the ordinary standards of success and excellence. When I went to church and saw a thin blue artificial flower, or a great sleepy cushion expounding the beauty of holiness to pews full of eagles, half-eagles, and threepences, however adroitly concealed they might be in broadcloth and boots, or saw an onion in an Easter bonnet weeping over the sins of Magdalene, I did not feel as they felt who saw in all this not only propriety but piety. Or when at public meetings an eel stood up on end and wriggled and squirmed lithely in every direction, and declared that for his part he went in for rainbows and hot water, how could I help seeing that he was still black and loved a slimy pool? I could not grow misanthropical when I saw in the eyes of so many who were called old the gushing fountains of eternal youth and the light of an immortal dawn, or when I saw those who were esteemed unsuccessful and aimless ruling a fair realm of peace and plenty, either in their own hearts or in another's, a realm and princely possession for which they had well renounced a hopeless search and a belated triumph. I knew one man who had been for years a byword for having sought the philosopher's stone, but I looked at him through the spectacles and saw a satisfaction in concentrated energies and a tenacity arising from devotion to a noble dream which was not apparent in the youths who pitied him in the aimless effeminacy of clubs, nor in the clever gentlemen who cracked their thin jokes upon him over a gossiping dinner. And there was your neighbor over the way, who passes for a woman who has failed in her career, because she is an old maid. People wag solemn heads of pity, and say that she made so great a mistake in not marrying the brilliant and famous man who was for long years her suitor. It is clear that no orange flower will ever bloom for her. The young people make their tender romances about her as they watch her, and think of her solitary hours of bitter regret and wasting longing, never to be satisfied. When I first came to town I shared this sympathy, and pleased my imagination with fancying her hard struggle with the conviction that she had lost all that made life beautiful. I supposed that if I had looked at her through my spectacles I should see that it was only her radiant temper which so illuminated her dress, 
that we did not see it to be heavy sables. But when one day I did raise my glasses and glanced at her, I did not see the old maid whom we all pitied for a secret sorrow, but a woman whose nature was a tropic, in which the sun shone, and birds sang, and flowers bloomed forever. There were no regrets, no doubts and half-wishes, but a calm sweetness, a transparent peace. I saw her blush when that old lover passed by, or paused to speak to her, but it was only the sign of delicate feminine consciousness. She knew his love, and honored it, although she could not understand it nor return it. I looked closely at her, and I saw that although all the world had exclaimed at her indifference to such homage, and had declared it was astonishing she should lose so fine a match, she would only say, simply and quietly, If Shakespeare loved me and I did not love him, how could I marry him? Could I be misanthropical when I saw such fidelity and dignity and simplicity? You may believe that I was especially curious to look at that old lover of hers through my glasses. He was no longer young, you know, when I came, and his fame and fortune were secure. Certainly I have heard of few men more beloved, and of none more worthy to be loved. He had the easy manner of a man of the world, the sensitive grace of a poet, and the charitable judgment of a wide traveller. He was accounted the most successful and most unspoiled of men, handsome, brilliant, wise, tender, graceful, accomplished, rich, and famous. I looked at him, without the spectacles, in surprise and admiration, and wondered how your neighbor over the way had been so entirely untouched by his homage. I watched their intercourse in society. I saw her gay smile, her cordial greeting. I marked his frank address, his lofty courtesy. Their manner told no tales. The eager world was balked, and I pulled out my spectacles. I had seen her already, and now I saw him. He lived only in memory, and his memory was a spacious and stately palace. But he did not oftenest frequent the banqueting hall, where were endless hospitality and feasting, nor did he loiter much in the reception rooms, where a throng of new visitors was forever swarming, nor did he feed his vanity by haunting the apartment in which were stored the trophies of his varied triumphs nor dream much in the great gallery hung with pictures of his travels. From all these lofty halls of memory he constantly escaped to a remote and solitary chamber into which no one had ever penetrated. But my fatal eyes behind the glasses followed and entered with him, and saw that the chamber was a chapel. It was dim and silent and sweet with perpetual incense that burned upon an altar before a picture forever veiled. There, whenever I chanced to look, I saw him kneel and pray, and there, by day and by night, a funeral hymn was chanted. I do not believe you will be surprised that I have been content to remain a deputy bookkeeper. My spectacles regulated my ambition, and I early learned that there were better gods than Plutus. The glasses have lost much of their fascination now, and I do not often use them. But sometimes the desire is irresistible. Whenever I am greatly interested, I am compelled to take them out and see what it is that I admire. And yet... And yet, said Titbottom, after a pause, I am not sure that I thank my grandfather. Prue had long since laid away her work, and had heard every word of the story. I saw that the dear woman had yet one question to ask, and had been earnestly hoping to hear something that would spare her the necessity of asking. But Titbottom had resumed his usual tone after the momentary excitement, and made no further allusion to himself. We all sat silently. Titbottom's eyes fastened musingly upon the carpet, Prue looking wistfully at him, and I regarding both. It was past midnight, and our guest arose to go. He shook hands quietly, made his grave Spanish bow to Prue, and, taking his hat, went towards the front door. Prue and I accompanied him. I saw in her eyes that she would ask her question, and as Titbottom opened the door, I heard the low words, "'And Preciosa?' Titbottom paused. He had just opened the door, and the moonlight streamed over him as he stood, turning back to us. I have seen her but once since. It was in church, and she was kneeling, with her eyes closed, so that she did not see me. But I rubbed the glasses well, and looked at her, and saw a white lily, whose stem was broken, but which was fresh and luminous, and fragrant still. That was a miracle, interrupted Prue. Madam, it was a miracle, replied Titbottom and for that one sight I am devoutly grateful for my grandfather's gift. I saw that although a flower may have lost its hold upon earthly moisture, 
it may still bloom as sweetly, fed by the dews of heaven. The door closed, and he was gone. But as Prue put her arm in mine, and we went up the stairs together, she whispered in my ear, How glad I am that you don't wear spectacles. End of Titbottom's Spectacles by George William Curtis Read by Laura Atkinson by Willa Cather. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ambassador's Story It often happens that one or another of my friends stops before a red chalk drawing in my study and asks me where I ever found so lovely a creature. I have never told the story of that picture to anyone, and the beautiful woman on the wall until yesterday and all these twenty years has spoken to no one but me. Yesterday a young painter, a countryman of mine, came to consult me on a matter of business, and upon seeing my drawing of Alexandra Ebling, straightway forgot his errand. He examined the date upon the sketch and asked me very earnestly if I could tell him whether the lady were still living. When I answered him, he stepped back from the picture and said slowly, So long ago. She must have been very young. She was happy? As to that, who can say about any one of us, I replied. Out of all that is supposed to make for happiness, she had very little. He shrugged his shoulders and turned away to the window, saying as he did so, well, there is very little use in troubling about anything when we can stand here and look at her, and you can tell me that she has been dead all these years, and that she had very little. We returned to the object of his visit, but when he bade me goodbye at the door, his troubled gaze again went back to the drawing, and it was only by turning sharply about that he took his eyes away from her. I went back to my study fire, and as the rain kept away less impetuous visitors, I had a long time in which to think of Mrs. Ebling. I even got out the little box she gave me, which I had not opened for years. And when Mrs. Hemway brought my tea, I had barely time to close the lid and defeat her disapproving gaze. My young countryman's perplexity as he looked at Mrs. Ebling had recalled to me the delight and pain she gave me when I was of his years. I sat looking at her face and trying to see it through his eyes, freshly, as I saw it first upon the deck of the Germania twenty years ago. Was it her loveliness, I often asked myself, or her loneliness, or her simplicity? Or was it merely my own youth? Was her mystery only that of the mysterious north out of which she came? I still feel that she was very different from all the beautiful and brilliant women I have known, as the night is different from the day, or as the sea is different from the land. But this is our story as it comes back to me. For two years I have been studying Italian and working in the capacity of clerk to the American legation at Rome, and I was going home to secure my first consular appointment. Upon boarding my steamer at Genoa I saw my luggage into my cabin and then started for a rapid circuit of the deck. Everything promised well. The boat was thinly peopled even for a July crossing. The decks were roomy, the day was fine, the sea was blue. I was sure of my appointment, and best of all, I was coming back to Italy. All these things were in my mind, when I stopped sharply before a chaise long placed sideways near the stern. Its occupant was a woman, apparently ill, who lay with her eyes closed, and in her open arm was a chubby little red-haired girl, asleep. I can still remember that first glance at Mrs. Ebling and how I stopped as a wheel does when the band slips. Her splendid, vigorous body lay still and relaxed 
under the loose folds of her clothing. Her white throat and arms and red-gold hair were drenched with sunlight. Such hair as it was, wayward as some kind of gleaming seaweed that curls and undulates with the tide. A moment gave me her face, the high cheekbones, the thin cheeks, the gentle chin arching back to a girlish throat, and singular loveliness of the mouth. Even then it flashed through me that the mouth gave the whole face its peculiar beauty and distinction. It was proud and sad and tender and strangely calm. The curve of the lips could not have been cut more cleanly with the most delicate instrument, and whatever shade of feeling passed over them seemed to partake of their exquisiteness. But I am anticipating. While I stood stupidly staring, as if at twenty-five I had never before beheld a beautiful woman, the whistles broke into a hoarse scream, and the deck under us began to vibrate. The woman opened her eyes, and the little girl struggled into a sitting position, rolled out of her mother's arm, and ran to the deck rail. After putting my chair near the stern, I went forward to see the gangplank up, and did not return until we were dragging out to sea at the end of a long tow-line. The woman in the chaise long was still alone. She lay there all day, looking at the sea. The little girl, Karen, played noisily about the deck. Occasionally she returned and struggled up into the chair, plunged her head round and red as a little pumpkin against her mother's shoulder in an impetuous embrace, and then struggled down again with a lively flourishing of arms and legs. Her mother took such opportunities to pull up the child's socks or to smooth the fiery little braids. Her beautiful hands, rather large and very white, played about the riotous little girl with a quieting tenderness. Karen chattered away in Italian and kept asking for her father, only to be told that he was busy. When any of the ship's officers passed, they stopped for a word with my neighbor, and I heard the first mate address her as Mrs. Ebling. When they spoke to her, she smiled appreciatively and answered in low, faltering Italian, but I fancied that she was glad when they passed on, and left her to her fixed contemplation of the sea. Her eyes seemed to drink the color of it all day long, and after every interruption they went back to it. There was a kind of pleasure in watching her satisfaction, a kind of excitement in wondering what the water made her remember or forget. She seemed not to wish to talk to anyone, but I knew that I should like to hear whatever she might be thinking. One could catch some hint of her thoughts, I imagined, from the shadows that came and went across her lips like the reflection of light clouds. She had a pile of books beside her, but she did not read, and neither could I. I gave up trying at last, and watched the sea, very conscious of her presence, almost of her thoughts. When the sun dropped low and shone in her face, I rose and asked if she would like me to move her chair. She smiled and thanked me, but said the sun was good for her. Her yellow hazel eyes followed me for a moment, and then went back to the sea. After the first bugle sounded for dinner, a heavy man in uniform came up the deck and stood beside the chaise long, looking at its two occupants with a smile of satisfied possession. The breast of his trim coat was hidden by waves of soft blonde beard, as long and heavy as a woman's hair, which blew about his face in glittering profusion. He wore a large turquoise ring upon the thick hand that he rubbed good-humouredly over the little girl's head. To her he spoke Italian, but he and his wife conversed in some Scandinavian tongue. He stood stroking his fine beard until the second bugle blew, then bent stiffly from his hips like a soldier and patted his wife's hand as it lay on the arm of her chair. He hurried down the deck, taking stock of the passengers as he went, and stopped before a thin girl with frizzled hair and a lace coat, asking her a facetious question in thick English. They began to talk about Chicago, and went below. Later I saw him at the head of his table in the dining-room, the befrizzled Chicago lady on his left. They must have gotten a famous start at luncheon, for by the end of the dinner Ebling was peeling figs for her and presenting them on the end of a fork. The doctor confided to me that Ebling was the chief engineer and the dandy of the boat, but this time he would have to behave himself, for he had brought his sick wife along for the voyage. 
She had a bad heart valve, he added, and was in a serious way. After dinner, Ebling disappeared, presumably to his engines, and at ten o'clock, when the stewardess came to put Mrs. Ebling to bed, I helped her to rise from her chair, and the second mate ran up and supported her down to her cabin. About midnight I found the engineer in the card room, playing with the doctor, an Italian naval officer, and the commodore of a Long Island yacht club. His face was even pinker than it had been at dinner, and his fine beard was full of smoke. I thought a long while about Ebling and his wife before I went to sleep. The next morning we tied up at Naples to take on our cargo, and I went on shore for the day. I did not, however, entirely escape the ubiquitous engineer, whom I saw lunching with a Long Island Commodore at a hotel in the Santa Lucia. When I returned to the boat in the early evening, the passengers had gone down to dinner, and I found Mrs. Ebling quite alone upon the deserted deck. I approached her and asked whether she had had a dull day. She looked up smiling and shook her head, as if her Italian had quite failed her. I saw that she was flushed with excitement, and her yellow eyes were shining like two clear topazes. Dull? Oh, no! I love to watch Naples from the sea in this white heat. She has just lain there on her hillside among the vines and laughed for me all day long. I have been able to pick out many of the places I like best. I felt that she was really going to talk to me at last. She had turned to me frankly as to an old acquaintance, and seemed not to be hiding from me anything of what she felt. I sat down in a glow of pleasure and excitement, and asked her if she knew Naples well. Oh, yes! I lived there for a year after I was first married. My husband has a great many friends in Naples. But he was at sea most of the time, so I went about alone. Nothing helps one to know a city like that. I came first by sea like this, directly to Naples from Finnmark, and I had never been south before." Mrs. Ebling stopped and looked over my shoulder. Then with a quick, eager glance at me, she said abruptly, "'It was like a baptism of fire. Nothing has ever been quite the same since. Imagine how this bay looked to a Finnmark girl. It seemed like the overture to Italy." I laughed. And then one goes up the country, song by song, and wine by wine. Mrs. Ebling sighed. Ah, yes, it must be fine to follow it. I have never been away from the seaports myself. We live now in Genoa. The deck steward brought her tray, and I moved forward a little and stood by the rail. When I looked back, she smiled and nodded to let me know that she was not missing anything. I could feel her intentness as keenly as if she were standing beside me. The sun had disappeared over the high ridge behind the city, and the stone pines stood black and flat against the fires of the afterglow. The lilac haze that hung over the long, lazy slopes of Vesuvius warmed with golden light, and films of blue vapor began to float down towards Bayi. The sky, the sea, and the city between them turned a shimmering violet, fading grayer as the lights began to glow like luminous pearls along the waterfront, the necklace of an irreclaimable queen. Behind me I heard a low exclamation, a slight stifled sound, but it seemed the perfect vocalization of that weariness with which we at last let go of beauty, after we have held it until the senses are darkened. When I turned to her again, she seemed to have fallen asleep. That night, as we were moving out to sea and the tail lights of Naples were winking across the widening stretch of black water, I helped Mrs. Ebling to the foot of the stairway. She drew herself up from her chair with effort and leaned on me wearily. I could have carried her all night without fatigue. "'May I come and talk to you tomorrow?' I asked. She did not reply at once. "'Like an old friend?' I added. She gave me her languid hand, and her mouth, set with the exertion of walking, softened altogether. "'Grazia,' she murmured. I returned to the deck and joined a group of my countrywomen, who, primed with inexhaustible information, were discussing the baseness of Renaissance art. 
They were intelligent and alert, and as they leaned forward in their deck chairs under the circle of light, their faces recalled to me Rembrandt's picture of a clinical lecture. I heard them through, against my will, and then went to the stern to smoke and see the last of the island lights. The sky had clouded over, and a soft melancholy wind was rushing over the sea. I could not help thinking how disappointed I would be if rain should keep Mrs. Ebling in her cabin tomorrow. My mind played constantly with her image. At one moment she was very clear and directly in front of me, the next she was far away. Whatever else I thought about, some part of my consciousness was busy with Mrs. Ebling, hunting for her, finding her, losing her, then groping again. How was it that I was so conscious of whatever she might be feeling? That when she sat still behind me and watched the evening sky, I had a sense of speed and change, almost of danger, and when she was tired and sighed, I had wished for night and loneliness. 2. Though when we are young we seldom think much about it, there is now and again a golden day when we feel a sudden arrogant pride in our youth, in the lightness of our feet and the strength of our arms, in the warm fluid that courses so surely within us, when we are conscious of something powerful and mercurial in our breasts, which comes up, wave after wave, and leaves us irresponsible and free. All the next morning I felt this flow of life, which continually impelled me towards Mrs. Ebling. After the merest greeting, however, I kept away. I found it pleasant to thwart myself, to measure myself against a current that was sure to carry me with it in the end. I was content to let her watch the sea, the sea that seemed now to have come into me, warm and soft, still and strong. I played shuffleboard with a commodore who was anxious to keep down his figure, and ran around the deck with the stout legs of the little pumpkin-colored Karen about my neck. It was not until the child was having her afternoon nap below that I at last came up and stood beside her mother. "'You are better today,' I exclaimed, looking down at her white gown. She colored unreasonably, and I laughed with a familiarity which she must have accepted as the mere foolish noise of happiness, or it would have seemed impertinent. We talked at first of a hundred trivial things, and we watched the sea. The coast of Sardinia had lain to our port for some hours, and would lie there for hours to come, now advancing in rocky promontories, now retreating behind blue bays. It was the naked south coast of the island, and though our course held very near the shore, not a village or habitation was visible. There was not even a goatherd's hut hidden away among the low pinkish sand hills pinkish sand hills and yellow headlands, with dull-colored shrubby bushes massed around their bases and following the dried watercourses. A narrow strip of beach glistened like white paint between the purple sea and the umber rocks, and the whole island lay gleaming in the yellow sunshine and translucent air. Not a wave broke on that fringe of white sand, not the shadow of a cloud played across the bare hills. In the air about us there was no sound but that of a vessel moving rapidly through absolutely still water. She seemed like some great sea animal, swimming silently, her head well up. The sea before us was so rich and heavy and opaque that it might have been lapis lazuli. It was the blue of legend, simply, the color that satisfies the soul like sleep. And it was of the sea we talked, for it was the substance of Mrs. Ebling's story. She seemed always to have been swept along by ocean streams, warm or cold, and to have hovered about the edge of great waters. She was born and had grown up in a little fishing town on the Arctic Ocean. Her father was a doctor, a widower, who lived with his daughter and who divided his time between his books and his fishing rod. Her uncle was skipper on a coasting vessel, and with him she had made many trips along the Norwegian coast. But she was always reading and thinking about the blue seas of the south. There was a curious old woman in our village, Dame Erickson, who had been in Italy in her youth. She had gone to Rome to study art, and had copied a great many pictures there. She was well connected, but had little money, and as she grew older and poorer, she sold her pictures one by one, until there was scarcely a well-to-do family in our district that did not own one of Dame Erickson's paintings. 
but she brought home many other strange things, a little orange tree which she cherished until the day of her death, and bits of colored marble, and seashells, and pieces of coral, and a thin flask full of water from the Mediterranean. When I was a little girl she used to show me her things, and tell me about the South, about the coral fishes, and the pink islands, and the smoking mountains, and the old underground Naples. I suppose the water in her flask was like any other, but it never seemed so to me. It looked so elastic and alive that I used to think if one unsealed the bottle something penetrating and fruitful might leap out and work an enchantment over Finmark. Lars Ebling, I learned, was one of her father's friends. She could remember him from the time when she was a little girl, and he a dashing young man who used to come home from the sea and make a stir in the village. After he got his promotion to an Atlantic liner and went south, she did not see him until the summer she was twenty, when he came home to marry her. That was five years ago. The little girl, Karen, was three. From her talk, one might have supposed that Ebling was proprietor of the Mediterranean and its adjacent lands, and could have kept her away at his pleasure. Her own rights in him she seemed not to consider. But we wasted very little time on Lars Ebling. We talked like two very young persons of arms and men, of the sea beneath us and the shores it washed. We were carried a little beyond ourselves, for we were in the presence of the things of youth that never change, fleeing past them. Tomorrow they would be gone, and no effort of will or memory could bring them back again. All about us was the sea of great adventure, and below us, caught somewhere in its gleaming meshes, were the bones of nations and navies, nations and navies that gave youth its hope, and made life something more than a hunger of the bowels. The unpeopled Sardinian coast unfolded gently before us like something left over out of a world that was gone, a place that might well have had no later news since the corn ships brought the tidings of Actium. I shall never go to Sardinia, said Mrs. Ebling. It could not possibly be as beautiful as this. Neither shall I, I replied. As I was going down to dinner that evening, I was stopped by Lars Ebling, freshly brushed and scented, wearing a white uniform and polished and glistening as one of his own engines. He smiled at me with his own kind of geniality. You have been very kind to talk to my wife, he explained. It is very bad for her, this trip, that she speaks no English. I am indebted to you." I told him curtly that he was mistaken, but my acrimony made no impression upon his blandness. I felt that I should certainly strike the fellow if he stood there much longer, running his blue ring up and down his beard. I should have probably hated any man who was Mrs. Ebling's husband. But Ebling made me sick. Three. The next day I began my drawing of Mrs. Ebling. She seemed pleased and a little puzzled when I asked her to sit for me. It occurred to me that she had always been among dull people who took her looks as a matter of course, and that she was not at all sure that she was really beautiful. I can see now her quick, confused look of pleasure. I thought very little about the drawing then, except that the making of it gave me an opportunity to study her face, to look as long as I pleased into her yellow eyes, at the noble lines of her mouth, at her splendid, vigorous hair. "'We have a yellow vine at home,' I told her, "'that is very like your hair. It seems to be growing while one looks at it, and it twines and tangles about itself and throws out little tendrils in the wind. Has it any name? We call it Love Vine.' How little a thing could disconcert her! As for me, nothing disconcerted me. I awoke every morning with a sense of speed and joy. At night I loved to hear the swish of the water rushing by. As fast as the pistons could carry us, as fast as the water could bear us, we were going forward to something delightful, to something together. When Mrs. Ebling told me that she and her husband would be five days in the docks in New York and then return to Genoa, I was not disturbed, for I did not believe her. I came and went, and she sat still all day watching the water. I heard an American lady say that she watched it like one who was going to die. But even that did not frighten me. 
I somehow felt that she had promised me to live. All those long blue days when I sat beside her talking about Finmark and the sea, she must have known that I loved her. I sat with my hands idle on my knees and let the tide come up in me. It carried me so swiftly that across the narrow space of deck between us it must have swayed her, too, a little. I had no wish to disturb or distress her. If a little, a very little of it reached her, I was satisfied. If it drew her softly, but drew her, I wanted no more. Sometimes I could see that even the light pressure of my thoughts made her paler. One still evening, after a long talk, she whispered to me, You must go and walk now, and don't think about me. She had been held too long and too closely in my thoughts, and she begged me to release her for a little while. I went out into the bow and put her far away at the skyline with the faintest star and thought of her gently across the water. When I went back to her, she was asleep. But even in those first days I had my hours of misery. Why, for instance, should she have been born in Finmark, and why should Lars Ebling have been her only door of escape? Why should she be silently taking leave of the world at the age when I was just beginning it, having had nothing, nothing of whatever is worth while? She never talked about taking leave of things, and yet I sometimes felt that she was counting the sunsets. One yellow afternoon, when we were gliding between the shores of Spain and Africa, she spoke of her illness for the first time. I had got some magnolias at Gibraltar and she wore a bunch of them in her girdle, and the rest lay on her lap. She held the cool leaves against her cheek and fingered the white petals. I can never, she remarked, get enough of the flowers of the South. They make me breathless, just as they did at first. Because of them I should like to live a long while, almost forever. I leaned forward and looked at her. We could live almost forever if we had enough courage. It's of our lives that we die. If we had the courage to change it all, to run away to some blue coast like that over there, we could live on and on until we were tired. She smiled tolerantly and looked southward through half-shut eyes. I am afraid I should never have courage enough to go beyond that mountain, at least. Look at it. It looks as if it hid horrible things. A sea mist blown in from the Atlantic began to mask the impassive African coast, and above the fog the gray mountain peak took on the angry red of the sunset. It burned sullen and threatening, until the dark land drew the night about her and settled back into the sea. We watched it sink, while under us, slowly but ever increasing, we felt the throb of the Atlantic come and go, the thrill of the vast untamed waters of that lugubrious and passionate sea. I drew Mrs. Ebling's wraps about her and shut the magnolias under her cloak. When I left her, she slipped me one warm white flower. 4. From the Straits of Gibraltar we dropped into the abyss, and by morning we were rolling in the trough of a sea that drew us down and held us deep, shaking us gently back and forth until the timbers creaked, and then shooting us out on the crest of a swelling mountain. The water was bright and blue, but so cold that the breath of it penetrated one's bones, as if the chill of the deep under fathoms of the sea were being loosed upon us. There were not more than a dozen people upon the deck that morning and Mrs. Ebling was sheltered behind the stern, muffled in a sea-jacket, with drops of moisture upon her long lashes and on her hair. When a shower of ice spray beat back over the deck rail, she took it gleefully. After all, she insisted, this is my own kind of water, the kind I was born in. This is first cousin to the pole waters, and the sea we have left is only a kind of fairy tale. It's like the burnt-out volcanoes. Its day is over. This is the real sea now, where the doings of the world go on. 
"'It is not our reality, at any rate,' I answered. "'Oh, yes, it is. These are the waters that carry men to their work, and they will carry you to yours.' I sat down and watched her hair grow more alive and iridescent in the moisture. "'You are pleased to take an attitude,' I complained. "'No, I don't love realities any more than another. But I admit them all the same.' "'And who are you and I to define the realities?' "'Our minds define them clearly enough. Yours and mine, everybody's. Those are the lines we never cross, though we flee from the equator to the pole. I have never really got out of Finnmark, of course. I shall live and die in a fishing town on the Arctic Ocean, and the blue seas and the pink islands are as much a dream as they ever were. All the same, I shall continue to dream them. The Gulf Stream gave us warm blue days again, but pale like sad memories. The water had faded, and the thin, tepid sunshine made something tighten about one's heart. The stars watched us coldly, and seemed always to be asking me what I was going to do. The advancing line on the chart, which at first had been mere foolishness, began to mean something, and the wind from the west brought disturbing fears and forebodings. I slept lightly, and all day I was restless and uncertain, except when I was with Mrs. Ebling. She quieted me as she did little Karen, and soothed me without saying anything, as she had done that evening at Naples when we watched the sunset. It seemed to me that every day her eyes grew more tender and her lips more calm. A kind of fortitude seemed to be gathering about her mouth, and I dreaded it. Yet when, in an involuntary glance, I put to her the question that tortured me, her eyes always met mine steadily, deep and gentle full of reassurance. That I had my word at last happened almost by accident. On the second night out from shore there was the concert for the sailors' orphanage, and Mrs. Ebling dressed and went down to dinner for the first time, and sat on her husband's right. I was not the only one who was glad to see her. Even the women were pleased. She wore a pale green gown, and she came up out of it regally, white and gold. I was so proud that I blushed when anyone spoke of her. After dinner she was standing by her deck chair, talking to her husband when people began to go below for the concert. She took up a long cloak and attempted to put it on. The wind blew the light thing about, and Ebling chatted and smiled his public smile while she struggled with it. Suddenly his roving eye caught sight of the Chicago girl, who was having a similar difficulty with her draperies and he pranced half the length of the deck to assist her. I had been watching from the rail, and when she was left alone I threw my cigar away and wrapped Mrs. Ebling up roughly. "'Don't go down,' I begged. "'Stay up here. I want to talk to you.' She hesitated a moment and looked at me thoughtfully. Then with a sigh she sat down. Everyone hurried down to the saloon, and we were absolutely alone at last, behind the shelter of the stern, with the thick darkness all about us, and a warm east wind rushing over the sea. I was too sore and angry to think. I leaned toward her, holding the arm of her chair with both hands, and began anywhere. You remember those two blue coasts out of Gibraltar? It shall be either one you choose, if you will come with me. I have not much money. But we shall get on somehow. There has got to be an end of this. We are neither one of us cowards, and this is humiliating, intolerable. She sat looking down at her hands, and I pulled her chair impatiently toward me. I felt, she said at last, that you were going to say something like this. You are sorry for me, and I don't wish to be pitied. You think Ebling neglects me, but you are mistaken. He has had his disappointments, too. He wants children and a gay, hospitable house, and he is tied to a sick woman who cannot get on with people. He has more to complain of than I have, and yet he bears with me. I am grateful to him, and there is no more to be said. Oh, isn't there? I cried. And I? She laid her hand entreatingly upon my arm. Ah, you! You! Don't ask me to talk about that. You. Her finger slipped down my coat sleeve to my hand and pressed it. I caught her two hands and held them, 
telling her that I would never let them go. And you meant to leave me day after tomorrow, to say goodbye to me as you will to the other people on this boat. You meant to cut me adrift like this, with my heart on fire and all my life unspent in me. She sighed despondently. I am willing to suffer, whatever I must suffer, to have had you, she answered simply. I was ill and so lonely, and it came so quickly and quietly. Ah, don't begrudge it to me. Do not leave me in bitterness. If I have been wrong, forgive me. She bowed her head and pressed my fingers entreatingly. A warm tear splashed on my hand. It occurred to me that she bore my anger as she bore little Karen's importunities, as she bore Ebling. What a circle of pettiness she had about her. I fell back in my chair and my hands dropped at my side. I felt like a creature with its back broken. I asked her what she wished me to do. Don't ask me, she whispered. There is nothing we can do. I thought you knew that. You forget that, that I am too ill to begin my life over. Even if there were nothing else in the way, that would be enough. And that is what has made it all possible. Our loving each other, I mean. If I were well, we couldn't have had even this much. Don't reproach me. Hasn't it been at all pleasant to you to find me waiting for you every morning? To feel me thinking of you when you went to sleep? Every night I have watched the sea for you, as if it were mine and I had made it. And I have listened to the water rushing by you, full of sleep and youth and hope, and everything you had done or said during the day came back to me. And when I went to sleep it was only to feel you more. You see, there was never anyone else. I have never thought of anyone in the dark but you." She spoke pleadingly, and her voice had sunk so low that I could scarcely hear her. "'And yet you will do nothing,' I groaned. You will dare nothing. You will give me nothing. Don't say that. When I leave you day after tomorrow, I shall have given you all my life. I can't tell you how, but it is true. There is something in each of us that does not belong to the family, or to society, or even to ourselves. Sometimes it is given in marriage, and sometimes it is given in love but oftener it is never given at all. We have nothing to do with giving or withholding it. It is a wild thing that sings in us once and flies away and never comes back. And mine has flown to you. When one loves like that, it is enough somehow. The other things can go if they must. That is why I can live without you and die without you. I caught her hands and looked into her eyes that shone warm in the darkness. She shivered and whispered in a tone so different from any I ever heard from her before or afterward. Do you grudge it to me? You are so young and strong, and you have everything before you. I shall have only a little while to want you in, and I could want you forever and not weary. I kissed her hair, her cheeks, her lips, until her head fell forward on my shoulder, and she put my face away with her soft, trembling fingers. She took my hand and held it close to her, in both her own. We sat silent, and the moments came and went, bringing us closer and closer, and the wind and water rushed by us, obliterating our tomorrows and all our yesterdays. The next day Mrs. Ebling kept her cabin, and I sat stupidly by her chair until dark, with the rugged little girl to keep me company, and an occasional nod from the engineer. I saw Mrs. Ebling again only for a few moments, when we were coming into the New York harbor. She wore a street dress and a hat, and these alone would have made her seem far away from me. She was very pale, and looked down when she spoke to me as if she had been guilty of a wrong toward me. 
I have never been able to remember that interview without heartache and shame. But then I was too desperate to care about anything. I stood like a wooden post and let her approach me, let her speak to me, let her leave me as if it were a hard thing to do, and held out a little package timidly. And her gloved hand shook as if she were afraid of me. I want to give you something, she said. You will not want it now, so I shall ask you to keep it until you hear from me. You gave me your address a long time ago when you were making that drawing. Some day I shall write to you and ask you to open this. You must not come to tell me good-bye this morning, but I shall be watching you when you go ashore. Please don't forget that. I took the little box mechanically and thanked her. I think my eyes must have filled, for she uttered an exclamation of pity, touched my sleeve quickly, and left me. It was one of those strange, low, musical exclamations which mean everything and nothing, like the one that had thrilled me that night at Naples, and it was the last sound I ever heard from her lips. An hour later I went on shore one of those who crowded over the gangplank the moment it was lowered. But the next afternoon I wandered back to the docks and went on board the Germania. I asked for the engineer, and he came up in his shirt-sleeves from the engine-room. He was red and disheveled, angry and voluble. His bright eye had a hard glint, and I did not once see his masterful smile. When he heard my inquiry he became profane. Mrs. Ebling had sailed for Bremen on the Hohenstaufen that morning at eleven o'clock. She had decided to return by the northern route and pay a visit to her father in Finnmark. She was in no condition to travel alone, he said. He evidently smarted under her extravagance. But who, he asked with a blow of his fist on the rail, could stand between a woman and her whim? She had always been a willful girl, and she had a doting father behind her. When she set her head with a wind, there was no holding her. She ought to have married the Arctic Ocean. I think Ebling was still talking when I walked away. I spent that winter in New York. My consular appointment hung fire. Indeed, I did not pursue it with much enthusiasm. And I had a good many idle hours in which to think of Mrs. Ebling. She had never mentioned the name of her father's village, and somehow I could never quite bring myself to go to the docks when Ebling's boat was in and ask for news of her. More than once I made up my mind definitely to go to Finnmark and take my chance at finding her. The shipping people would know where Ebling came from. But I never went. I have often wondered why. When my resolve was made and my courage high, when I could almost feel myself approaching her, suddenly everything crumbled under me, and I fell back as I had done that night when I dropped her hands, after telling her only a moment before that I would never let them go. In the twilight of a wet March day, when the gutters were running black outside and the square was liquefying under crusts of dirty snow, the housekeeper brought me a damp letter which bore a blurred foreign postmark. It was from Niels Donestadt, who wrote that it was his sad duty to inform me that his daughter, Alexandra Abling, had died on the second day of February in the twenty-sixth year of her age. Complying with her request, he enclosed a letter which he had written some days before her death. I at last brought myself to break the seal of the second letter. It read thus. My friend, you may open now the little package I gave you. May I ask you to keep it? I gave it to you because there is no one else who would care about it in just that way. Ever since I left you I have been thinking what it would be like to live a lifetime caring and being cared for like that. It was not the life I was meant to live, and yet, in a way, I have been living it ever since I first knew you. Of course you understand now why I could not go with you. I would have spoiled your life for you. Besides that, I was ill, and I was too proud to give you the shadow of myself. I had much to give you, if you had come earlier. As it was, I was ashamed. Vanity sometimes saves us when nothing else will, and mine saved you. Thank you for everything. 
I hold this to my heart, where I once held your hand. Alexandra The dusk had thickened in the night long before I got up from my chair and took the little box from its place in my desk drawer. I opened it and lifted out a thick coil, cut from where her hair grew thickest and brightest. It was tied firmly at one end, and when it fell over my arm, it curled and clung about my sleeve like a living thing set free. How it gleamed! How it still gleams in the firelight! It was warm and softly scented under my lips and stirred under my breath like seaweed in the tide. This, and a withered magnolia flower, and two pink seashells, nothing more. And it was all twenty years ago. End of On the Gull's Road by Willa Cather Read by Winston Tharp The Olive by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander the Olive by Algernon Blackwood He laughed involuntarily as the olive rolled towards his chair across the shiny parquet floor of the hotel dining room. His table in the cavernous salle à manger was apart. He sat alone, a solitary guest. The table from which the olive fell and rolled towards him was some distance away. The angle, however, made him an unlikely objective. Yet the lopsided, juicy thing, after hesitating once or twice en route, as it plopped along, came to rest finally against his feet. It settled with an inviting, almost an aggressive air, and he stooped and picked it up, putting it rather self-consciously because of the girl from whose table it had come, on the white tablecloth beside his plate. Then, looking up, he caught her eye and saw that she too was laughing, though not a bit self-consciously. As she helped herself to the hors d'oeuvre, a false move had sent it flying. She watched him pick up the olive and set it beside his plate. Her eyes then suddenly looked away again at her mother questioningly. The incident was closed. But the little oblong, succulent olive lay beside his plate, so that his fingers played with it. He fingered it automatically from time to time, until his lonely meal was finished. When no one was looking, he slipped it into his pocket, as though having taken the trouble to pick it up, this was the very least he could do with it. Heaven alone knows why, but he then took it upstairs with him setting it on the marble mantelpiece among his field glasses tobacco tins ink bottles pipes and candlestick at any rate he kept it the moist shiny lopsided juicy little oblong olive the hotel lounge wearied him he came to his room after dinner to smoke at his ease his coat off and his feet on a chair to read another chapter of freud to write a letter or two he didn't in the least want to write, and then go to bed at ten o'clock. But this evening the olive kept rolling between him and the thing he read. It rolled between the paragraphs, between the lines. The olive was more vital than the interest of these eternal complexes and suppressed desires. The truth was that he kept seeing the eyes of the laughing girl beyond the bouncing olive. She had smiled at him in such a natural, spontaneous, friendly way before her mother's glance had checked her, a smile, he felt, that might lead to acquaintance on the morrow. He wondered. A thrill of possible adventure ran through him. She was a merry-looking sort of girl with a happy, 
half roguish face that seemed on the lookout for somebody to play with her mother like most of the people in the big hotel was an invalid the girl a dutiful and patient daughter they had arrived that very day apparently a laugh is a revealing thing he thought as he fell asleep to dream of a lopsided olive rolling consciously towards him and of a girl's eyes that watched its awkward movements then looked up into his own and laughed in his dream the olive had been deliberately and cleverly dispatched upon its uncertain journey it was a message he did not know of course that the mother chiding her daughter's awkwardness had muttered there you go again child true to your name you never see an olive without doing something queer and odd with it a youngish man whose knowledge of chemistry including invisible inks and such like mysteries had proved so valuable to the censor's department that for five years he had overworked without a holiday the italian riviera had attracted him and he had come out for a two months rest it was his first visit sun mimosa blue seas and brilliant skies had tempted him exchange made a pound worth forty fifty sixty and seventy shillings he found the place lovely but somewhat untenanted having chosen at random he had come to a spot where the companionship he hoped to find did not exist the place languished after the war slow to recover the colony of resident english was scattered still travellers preferred the coast of france with menton and monte carlo to enliven them the country moreover was distracted by strikes the electric light failed one week letters the next and as soon as the electricians and postal workers resumed the railways stopped running few visitors came and the few who came soon left he stayed on however caught by the sunshine and the good exchange also without the physical energy to discover a better livelier place he went for walks among the olive groves he sat beside the sea and palms he visited shops and bought things he did not want because the exchange made them seem cheap he paid immense extras in his weekly bill then chuckled as he reduced them to shillings and found that a few pence covered them he lay with a book for hours among the olive groves the olive groves his daily life could not escape the olive groves to olive groves sooner or later his walks his expeditions his meanderings by the sea his shopping all led him to these ubiquitous olive groves if he bought a picture postcard to send home there was sure to be an olive grove in one corner of it the whole place was smothered with olive groves the people owed their incomes and existence to these irrepressible trees the villages among the hills swam roof deep in them they swarmed even in the hotel gardens the guidebooks praised them as persistently as the resident brought them sooner or later into every conversation they grew lyrical over them and how do you like our olive trees ah you think them pretty at first most people are disappointed they grow on one they do he agreed i'm glad you appreciate them i find them the embodiment of grace and when the wind lifts the underleaves across the whole mountain slope why it's wonderful isn't it one realizes the meaning of olive green one does he sighed but all the same i should like to get one to eat an olive i mean ah to eat yes that's not so easy you see the crop is exactly he interrupted impatiently weary of the habitual and evasive explanations but i should like to taste the fruit i should like to enjoy one for after a stay of six weeks he had never once seen an olive on the table in the shops nor even on the street barrows at the market-place 
he had never tasted one no one solid olive though olive trees were a drug in the place no one bought them no one asked for them it seemed that no one wanted them the trees when he looked closely were thick with a dark little berry that seemed more like a sour slow than the succulent delicious spicy fruit associated with its name men climbed the trunks everywhere shaking the laden branches and hitting them with long bamboo poles to knock the fruit off while women and children squatting on their haunches spent laborious hours filling baskets underneath then loading mules and donkeys with their daily catch but an olive to eat was unobtainable he had never cared for olives but now he craved with all his soul to feel his teeth in one ah but it is the spanish olive that you eat explained the head waiter a german from basel these are for oil only after which he disliked the olive more than ever until that night when he saw the first eatable specimen rolling across the shiny parquet floor propelled towards him by the careless hand of a pretty girl who then looked up into his eyes and smiled he was convinced that eve similarly had rolled the apple towards adam across the emerald sward of the first garden in the world he slept usually like the dead it must have been something very real that made him open his eyes and sit up in bed alertly there was a noise against his door he listened the room was still quite dark it was early morning the noise was not repeated who's there he asked in a sleepy whisper what is it the noise came again someone was scratching on the door no it was somebody tapping what do you want he demanded in a louder voice come in he added wondering sleepily whether he was presentable either the hotel was on fire or the porter was waking the wrong person for some sunrise expedition nothing happened wide awake now he turned the switch on but no light flooded the room the electricians he remembered with a curse were out on strike he fumbled for the matches and as he did so a voice in the corridor became distinctly audible it was just outside his door aren't you ready he heard you sleep forever and the voice although never having heard it before he could not have recognized it belonged he knew suddenly to the girl who had let the olive fall in an instant he was out of bed he lit a candle i'm coming he called softly as he slipped rapidly into some clothes i'm sorry i've kept you i shan't be a minute be quick then he heard while the candle flame slowly grew and he found his garments less than three minutes later he opened the door and candle in hand peered into the dark passage blow it out came a peremptory whisper he obeyed but not quick enough a pair of red lips emerged from the shadows there was a puff and the candle was extinguished i've got my reputation to consider we mustn't be seen of course the face vanished in the darkness but he had recognized it the shining skin the bright glancing eyes the sweet breath touched his cheek the candlestick was taken from him by a swift deft movement he heard it knock the wainscoting as it was set down he went out into a pitch-black corridor where a soft hand seized his own and led him by a back door it seemed out into the open air of the hillside immediately behind the hotel he saw the stars the morning was cool and fragrant the sharp air waked him and the last vestige of sleep went flying he had been drowsy and confused had obeyed the summons without thinking he now realized suddenly that he was engaged in an act of madness 
the girl dressed in some flimsy material thrown loosely about her head and body stood a few feet away looking he thought like some figure called out of dreams and slumber of a forgotten world out of legend almost he saw her evening shoes peep out he divined an evening dress beneath the gauzy covering the light wind blew it close against her figure he thought of a nymph i say but haven't you been to bed he asked stupidly he had meant to expostulate to apologize for his foolish rashness to scold and say they must go back at once instead this sentence came he guessed she had been sitting up all night he stood still a second staring in mute admiration his eyes full of bewildered question watching the stars she met his thought with a happy laugh orion has touched the horizon i came for you at once we've got just four hours the voice the smile the eyes the reference to orion swept him off his feet something in him broke loose and flew wildly recklessly to the stars let us be off he cried before the bear tilts down already alcon begins to fade i'm ready come she laughed the wind blew the gauze aside to show two ivory white limbs she caught his hand again and they scampered together up the steep hillside towards the woods soon the big hotel the villas the white houses of the little town where natives and visitors still lay soundly sleeping were out of sight the farther sky came down to meet them the stars were paling but no sign of actual dawn was yet visible the freshness stung their cheeks slowly the heavens grew lighter the east turned rose the outline of the trees defined themselves there was a stirring of the silvery green leaves they were among olive groves but the spirits of the trees were dancing far below them a pool of deep color they saw the ancient sea they saw the tiny specks of distant fishing boats the sailors were singing to the dawn and birds among the mimosa of the hanging gardens answered them pausing a moment at length beneath a gaunt old tree who struggled to leave the clinging earth had tortured its great writhing arms and trunk they took their breath gazing at one another with eyes full of happy dreams you understood so quickly said the girl my little message i knew by your eyes and ears you would and she first tweaked his ears with two slender fingers mischievously then laid her soft palm with a momentary light pressure on both eyes you're half and half at any rate she added looking him up and down for a swift instant of appraisement if you're not all together the laughter showed her white even little teeth you know how to play and that's something she added then as if to herself you'll be all together before i've done with you shall i he stammered afraid to look at her puzzled some spirit of compromise still lingering in him he knew not what she meant he knew only that the current of life flowed increasingly through his veins but that her eyes confused him i'm longing for it he added how wonderfully you did it they roll so awkwardly oh that she peered at him through a wisp of hair you've kept it i hope rather it's on my mantelpiece you're sure you haven't eaten it and she made a delicious mimicry with her red lips so that he saw the tip of a small pointed tongue i shall keep it he swore as long as these arms have life in them and he seized her just as she was crouching to escape and covered her with kisses i knew you longed to play she panted when he released her still it was sweet of you to pick it up before another got it another he exclaimed the gods decide 
it's a lopsided thing remember it can't roll straight she looked oddly mischievous elusive he stared at her if it had rolled elsewhere and another had picked it up he began i should be with that other now and this time she was off and away before he could prevent her and the sound of her silvery laughter mocked him among the olive trees beyond he was up and after her in a second following her slim whiteness in and out of the old world groove as she flitted lightly her hair flying in the wind her figure flashing like a ray of sunlight or the rays of foaming water till at last he caught her and drew her down upon his knees and kissed her wildly forgetting who and where and what he was hark she whispered breathlessly one arm close about his neck i hear their footsteps listen it is the pipe the pipe he repeated conscious of a tiny but delicious shudder for a sudden chill ran through him as she said it he gazed at her the hair fell loose about her cheeks flushed and rosy with hot kisses her eyes were bright and wild for all their softness her face turned sideways to him as she listened wore an extraordinary look that for an instant made his blood run cold he saw the parted lips the small white teeth the slim neck of ivory the young bosom panting from his temptuous embrace of an unearthly loveliness and brightness she seemed to him yet with this strange remote expression that touched his soul with sudden terror her face turned slowly who are you he whispered he sprang to his feet without waiting for her answer he was young and agile strong too with that quick response of muscle they have who keep their bodies well but he was no match for her her speed and agility outclassed his own with ease she leapt before he had moved one leg forward towards escape she was clinging with soft supple arms and limbs about him so that he could not free himself and as her weight bore him downwards to the ground her lips found his own and kissed them into silence she lay buried again in his embrace her hair across his eyes her heart against his heart and he forgot his question forgot his little fear forgot the very world he knew they come they come she cried gaily the dawn is here are you ready i've been ready for five thousand years he answered leaping to his feet beside her all together came upon a sparkling laugh that was like wind among the olive leaves shaking her last gauzy covering from her she snatched his hand, and they ran forward together to join the dancing throng, now crowding up the slope beneath the trees. Their happy singing filled the sky. Decked with vine and ivy, and trailing silvery green branches, they poured in a flood of radiant life along the mountain side. Slowly they melted away into the blue distance of the breaking dawn and as the last figure disappeared the sun came up slowly out of a purple sea they came to the place he knew the deserted earthquake village and a faint memory stirred in him he did not actually recall that he had visited it already had eaten his sandwiches with hotel friends beneath its crumbling walls but there was a dim troubling sense of familiarity nothing more the houses still stood but pigeons lived in them and weasels stoats and snakes had their uncertain homes in ancient bedrooms not twenty years ago the peasants thronged its narrow streets through which the dawn now peered and cool wind breathed among dew-laden brambles i know the house she cried the house where we would live and raised a flying form of air and sunlight into a tumbled cottage that had no roof 
no floor or windows wild bees had hung a nest against the broken wall he followed her there was sunlight in the room and there were flowers upon a rude simple table lay a bowl of cream with eggs and honey and butter close against a home-made loaf they sank into each other's arms upon a couch of fragrant grass and boughs against the window where wild roses bloomed and the bees flew in and out it was busana the so-called earthquake village because a sudden earthquake had fallen on it one summer morning when all the inhabitants were at church the crashing roof killed sixty the tumbling walls another hundred and the rest had left it where it stood the church he said vaguely remembering the story they were at prayer the girl laughed carelessly in his ear setting his blood in a rush and quiver of delicious joy he felt himself untamed wild as the wind and animals the true god claimed his own she whispered he came back ah they were not ready the old priests had seen to that but he came they heard his music then his tread shook the olive groves the old ground danced the hills leapt for joy and the houses crumbled he laughed as he pressed her closer to his heart and now we've come back she cried merrily we've come back to worship and be glad she nestled into him while the sun rose higher i hear them hark she cried and again leapt dancing from his side again he followed her like wind through the broken window they saw the naked fauns and nymphs and satyrs rolling dancing shaking their soft hoofs amid the ferns and brambles towards the appalling ruptured church they sped with feet of light and air a roar of happy song and laughter rose come he cried we must go too hand in hand they raced to join the tumbling dancing throng she was in his arms and on his back and flung across his shoulders as he ran they reached the broken building its whole roof gone sliding years ago its walls a tremble still its shattered shrines alive with the nesting birds hush she whispered in a tone of awe yet pleasure he is there she pointed her bare arm outstretched above the bending heads there in the empty space where one stood sacred host and cup he sat filling the niche sublimely and with awful power his shaggy form benign yet terrible rose through the broken stone the great eyes shone and smiled the feet were lost in brambles god cried a wild frightened voice yet with deep worship in it and the old familiar panic came with portentous swiftness the great figure rose the birds flew screaming the animals sought holes the worshippers laughing and glad a moment ago rushed tumbling over one another for the doors he goes again who called who called like that his feet shake the ground it's the earthquake screamed a woman's shrill accents in ghastly terror kiss me one kiss before we forget again sighed a laughing passionate voice against his ear once more your arms your heart beating on my lips you recognized his power you are now all together we shall remember but he woke with the heavy bedclothes stuffed against his mouth and the wind of early morning sighing mournfully about the hotel walls have they left again those ladies he inquired casually of the head waiter pointing to the table they were here last night at dinner who do you mean replied the man stupidly gazing at the spot indicated with a face quite blank last night at dinner he tried to think an english lady elderly with her daughter at which moment precisely the girl came in alone 
Lunch was over, the room empty. There was a second's difficult pause. It seemed ridiculous not to speak. Their eyes met. The girl blushed furiously. He was very quick for an Englishman. I was allowing myself to ask after your mother, he began. I was afraid, he glanced at the table laid for one, she was not well, perhaps. Oh, but that's very kind of you, I'm sure, she smiled. He saw the small white even teeth. And before three days had passed, he was so deeply in love that he simply couldn't help himself. I believe, he said lamely, this is yours. You dropped it, you know. Er, may I keep it? It's only an olive. They were, of course, in an olive grove when he asked it, and the sun was setting. She looked at him, looked him up and down, looked at his ears, his eyes. He felt that in another second her little fingers would slip up and tweak the first, or close the second with a soft pressure. Tell me, he begged, did you dream anything that first night I saw you? She took a quick step backwards. No she said, as he followed her more quickly still. I don't think I did. But, she went on breathlessly as he caught her up, I knew from the way you picked it up. Knew what? he demanded, holding her tightly, so that she could not get away again. That you were already half and half, but would soon be all together. And, as he kissed her, he felt her soft little fingers tweak his ears end of the olive by algernon blackwood read by lars rolander the haunted mind by nathaniel hawson this is a remote recording all of your recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Haunting Mind by Nathaniel Hawson What a single moment is the first one, when you have hardly begun to recollect yourself after starting from midnight slumber. By unclosing your eyes so suddenly, you seem to have surprised the personages of your dream in full communication around your bed, and catch one broad glance at them before they can flit into obscurity. Or, to vary the metaphor, you find yourself, for a single instant, wide awake in that realm of illusions, with a sleep has been the passport, and behold its ghostly inhabitants and wondrous scenery, with a perception of a strangeness, such as you never attain while the dream is undisturbed. The distant sound of a church clock is borne faintly on the wind. You question with yourself, half seriously, as I just turn to your waking ear from some great tower that stood within the precincts of your dream. While yet in suspense, another clock flings its heavy clang over the slumbering town, with so full and distinct a sound, and such a long murmur in the neighboring air, but you are certain it must proceed from the steeple at the nearest corner. You count the strokes, one, two, and there they cease with a booming sound, like the gathering of a third stroke within the bell. If you could choose an hour of wakefulness out of the whole night, it would be this. Since your sober bedtime, at eleven, you have had rest enough to take off the pressure of yesterday's fatigue, while before you, till the sun comes from Farquhar to brighten your window, there is almost the space of a summer night, one hour to be spent in thought, with the mind's eye half shut, and two in pleasant dreams, and two in that strangest of enjoyments, the forgetfulness alike of joy and woe. The moment of rising belongs to another period of time, and appears so distant, that the plunge out of a warm bed into the first year cannot yet be anticipated with dismay. Yesterday has already vanished among the shadows of the past. Tomorrow has not yet emerged from the future. You have found an intermediate space, 
where the business of life does not intrude, where the passing moment lingers and becomes truly the present, a spot where Father Time, when he thinks nobody is watching him, sits down by the wayside to take breath. Oh, that he would fall asleep and let mortals live on without growing older. Hitherto, so you have lain perfectly still because the slightest motion would dissipate the fragments of your slumber. Now, being irrevocably awake, you peep through the half drawn window curtain and observe that the glass is ornamented with fanciful devices in first work and that each pane presents something like a frozen dream. There will be time enough to trace out the analogy while waiting the summons to breakfast. Seen through the clear portion of the glass, where the silvery mountain peaks of the frost scenery do not ascend, the most conspicuous object is a steeple, the white spire of which directs you to the wintry luster of the firmament. You may almost distinguish the figures on the clock that has just told the hour. Such a frosty sky, and the snow-covered roofs, and the long vista of the frozen street, all white, and the distant water hardened into rock, might make you shiver, even under four blankets and a woollen comforter. Yet, look at that one glorious star. Its beams are distinguishable from all the rest, and actually cast a shadow of the casement on the bed, with a radiance of deeper hue than moonlight, though not so accurate an outline. You sink down and muffle your head in the clothes, shivering all the while, but less from bodily chill than the bare idea of a polar atmosphere. It is too cold, even for the thoughts to venture abroad. You speculate on the luxury of wearing out a whole existence in bed, like an oyster in its shell, content with a sluggish ecstasy of inaction, and drowsily conscious of nothing but delicious warmth, such as you know for again. Ah, that idea has brought a hideous one in its train. You think how the dead are lying in their cold shrouds and narrow coffins through the drear winter of the grave, and cannot persuade your fancy that they neither shrink nor shiver, when the snow is drifting over their little hillocks, and the bitter blast howls against the door of the tomb. That gloomy thought will collect a gloomy multitude, and throw its complexion over your wakeful hour. In the depth of every heart, there is a tomb and a dungeon, though the lights, the music, and a revelry above may cause us to forget their existence, and the buried ones or prisoners whom they hide. But sometimes, and oftenest at midnight, these dark receptacles are flung wide open. In an hour like this, when the mind has a passive sensibility but no active strength, when the imagination is a mirror imparting vividness to all ideas, without the power of selecting or controlling them, then pray that your grief may slumber, and the brotherhood of remorse not break that chain. It is too late. A funeral train comes gliding by your bed, in which passion and feeling assume bodily shape, and things of the mind become dire spectres to the eye. There is your earliest sorrow, a pale young mourner, wearing a sister's likeness to first love, sadly beautiful, with a hallowed sweetness in her melancholy features, and graced in the flow of her sable robe. Next appears a shape of ruined loveliness, with dust among her golden hair, and our bright garments all faded and defaced, stealing from a glance with drooping head, as fearful of reproach. She was your fondest hope, but a delusive one. So call her disappointment now. A stern form succeeds, with a brow of wrinkles, a look and gesture of iron authority. There is no name for him, unless it be fatality, an emblem of the evil influence that rules your fortunes, a demon to whom you subjected yourself by some error at the outset of life, and were born his slave forever by once obeying him. See, with fiendish lineaments graven on the darkness, the right leap of scorn, the mockery of that living eye, the pointing finger, touching the sore place in your heart. Do you remember any act of enormous folly, at which you would blush, even in the remotest cavern of the earth? Then. Recognize her shame. Pass, wretched Ben, well for the wakeful one, if riotously miserable, a fierce tribe do not surround him, the devils of a guilty heart that holds itself within itself. 
What if remorse should assume the features of an injured friend? What if the fiend should come in woman's garments, with a pale beauty amid sin and desolation, and lie down by your side? What if he should stand at your bed's foot, in the likeness of a corpse, with a bloody stain upon the shroud? Sufficient without such guilt is this nightmare of the soul, this heavy, heavy sinking of the spirits, this wintry gloom about the heart, this indistinct horror of the mind, blending itself with the darkness of the chamber. By desperate effort, you start upright, breaking from a sort of conscious sleep, and gazing widely round the bed, as if the fiends were anywhere but in your haunted mind. At the same moment, the slumbering embers on the hearth sent forth a gleam which palely illuminates the whole outer room, and flickered through the door of the bedchamber, but cannot quite dispel its obscurity. Your eye searches for whatever reminds you of the living world. With eager magnetness, you take note of the table near the fireplace, the book with an ivory knife between its leaves, the unfolded letter, the hat, and the fallen glove. Soon the flame vanishes, and with it the whole scene is gone, though its image remains an instant in our mind's eye, when darkness has swallowed the reality. Throughout the chamber, there is the same obscurity as before, but not the same gloom within your breast. As your head falls back upon the pillow, you think, in a whisper be it spoken, how pleasant in this night solitude would be the rise and fall of a softer breathing than your own, the slight pressure of a tender bosom, the quiet throb of a pure heart, imparting its peacefulness to your troubled one, as if the fond sleeper were involving you in her dream. Her influence is over you, though she has no existence, but in that momentary image. You sink down in a flowery spot, on the borders of sleep and wakefulness, while your thoughts rise before you in pictures, all disconnected, yet all assimilated by parading gladsomeness and beauty. The wheeling of gorgeous squadrons, a glitter in the sun, is succeeded by the merriment of children round the door of a schoolhouse, beneath the glimmering shadow of old trees at the corner of a rustic lane. You stand in the sunny rain of a summer shower, and wander among the sunny trees of an autumnal wood, and look upward at the brightest of all rainbows, over arching the unbroken sheet of snow on the American side of Niagara. Your mind struggles pleasantly between the dancing radiance around the harp of a young man and his recent bride, and the twittering flight of birds in spring about that new-made nest. You feel the merry pounding of a ship before the breeze, and watch the tuneful feet of rosy girls as they twine their last and merriest dance in a splendid ballroom, and find yourself in the brilliant circle of a crowded theatre, as the curtain falls over a light and airy scene. With an involuntary start, you seize hold on consciousness, and prove yourself but half awake, by running a doubtful parallel between human life and the hour which has now elapsed. In both you emerge from mystery, pass through a vicissitude that you can but imperfectly control, are borne onward to another mystery. Now comes the pay of the distant clock, with fainter and fainter strokes as you plunge further into the wilderness of sleep. It is the knell of a temporary death. Your spirit has departed, and strays like a free citizen among the people of a shadowy world, beholding a strange sights, yet without wonder or dismay. So calm, perhaps, will be the final change, so undisturbed, as if among familiar things, the entrance of the soul to its eternal home. End of the Haunted Mind by Nathaniel Hawson Read by Britannia A Romance in Encyclopedia Land by Robert C. Benchley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. A Romance in Encyclopedia Land by Robert C. Benchley Written after three hours browsing in a new Britannica set. Picture to yourself an early spring afternoon along the banks of the river A, which, rising in the Teutoburger Wald, joins the Ver at 
Hereford, and is navigable as far as St. Omer. Branching bryophytu spread their flat, dorsi-ventral bodies, closely applied to the substratum on which they grew, and leafy carophyllaceae twined their sepals in prodigal profusion, lending a touch of color to the scene. It was clear that nature was in preparation for her estivation. But it was not this which attracted the eye of the young man who, walking along the phonolithic formation of the river bank, was playing softly to himself on a double curtail, or converted bass palmer, an octave below the single curtail, and therefore identical in pitch and construction with an early fagato in C. His mind was on other things. He was evidently of melanochronic extraction, with a pentagonal facial angle and strong orbital ridges, but he combined with this the fine lines of a full-blooded native of Col, where, indeed, he was born, seven miles west of Kaliak Point in Mull, and in full view of the rugged Nice. As he swung along, there throbbed again and again through his brain the beautiful opening paragraph of Frantisek Palakis, 1798-1876, to Zur Bon Mission Geschichtsschreibung, Prague, 1871, written just after the author had refused a portfolio in the Pillersdorf cabinet, and had also declined to take part in the preliminary diet at Kromatschi. If he could believe such things, why cannot I? murmured the young man, and crushed a ginkgo beneath his feet. Young men are often so. It is due to the elaterium of spring. By Ereshkigal, he swore softly to himself, I'll do it. No sooner had he spoken than he came suddenly out of the tangle of gymnosperms, through whose leaves, needle-like and destitute of oil glands as they were, he had been making his way and emerged to a full view of the broad sweep of the lake of Zug, just where the Lors enters at its northern extremity, and one and a quarter miles east of where it issues again to pursue its course toward the Ross. Zug, at this point, is 1,368 feet above sea level, and boasted its first steamer in 1852. Well he sighed as he gazed upon the broad area of subsidence. If I were now an exarch, whose dignity was, at one time, intermediate between the patriarchal and the metropolitan, and from whose name has come that of the political religious party, the exarchists, I should not be here daydreaming. I should be far away in Footscray, a city of Bork County, Victoria, Australia, Population, 1901, 18,301. And as he said this, his eyes filled with tears, and under his skin, brown as a fustic, there spread a faint flush, such as is often formed by citricide or by pyrochloric acid when acting on uncured leather. Far down in the valley, the natives were celebrating the birthday of Gambrinus, a mythical Flemish king who was credited with the first brewing of beer. The sound of their voices set in motion longitudinal sound waves, and these, traveling through the surrounding medium, met the surface, separating two media, and were in part reflected, traveling back from the surface into the first medium again, with the velocity with which they approached it, as depicted in figure 10. This caused the echo for which the Lake of Zug is justly famous. The twilight began to deepen, and from far above came the twinkling signals of first Boots, then Coma Berenices, followed a while later by Ursa Major and her little brother Ursa Minor. The stars are clear tonight, he sighed. I wonder if they are visible from the dacite elevation on which she lives. His was an untrained mind. His only school had been 
the Eleatic school, the contention of which was that the true explanation of things lies in the conception of a universal unity of being, or the allness of one. But he knew what he liked. In the calm light of the stars, he felt as if a uban had been lifted from his heart, five ubans being equal to one quat, six quats to one amat, and one hundred and twenty amats to one sauce. He was free again. Turning, he walked swiftly down into the valley, passing returning peasants with their ba-poots, and soon came in sight of the shining lamps of the small but carefully built puros which lined the road. Reaching the corner, he saw the village epi peering over the treetops, and swarms of cicada with the toothed femoras of their anterior legs mingling in a sleepy drone like many cichlids. It was all very homelike to the wanderer. Suddenly, there appeared on a neighboring eminence a party of gussards, such as, during the Saturnalia, and from the Nativity till the Epiphany, were accustomed to disport themselves in odd costumes, all clad in clouting, and evidently returning from taking part in the celebration. As they drew nearer, our hero noticed a young woman in the front rank who was playing folk songs on a cromorne with a double reed mouthpiece enclosed in an air reservoir. In spite of the detritus wrought by the festival, there was something familiar about the buccinator of her face and her little mannerism of elevating her second phalanx. It struck him like the flash of a cloud highly charged by the coalescence of drops of vapor. He approached her tenderly, reverently. Lang, and Francois Elizabeth, he said, I know you. You are a French actress, born in Genoa on the 17th of September, 1772, and you made your first appearance on the stage in Le Cossais in 1788. Your talent and your beauty gave you an enormous success in Pamela. It has taken me years to find you, but now we are united at last. The girl turned like a frightened aardvark still holding the cromorne in her hand. Then she smiled. Weenix, Barnaby, Bernard, 1777 to 1829, she said very slowly. You started business as a publisher in London about 1797. They looked at each other for a moment in silence. He was the first to speak. Miss Lang, Anne, he said, let us go together to Lar, and be happy there, happy as two eyes, or three-toed South American sloths. She lowered her eyes. I will go with you, Mr. Weenix Barney, she said, to the ends of the earth. But why to Lar? Why not to Wem? Because, said the young man, Lar is the capital of Laristan, in... Twenty-seven degrees, thirty minutes north, one hundred eighty miles from Shiraz, and contains an old bazaar consisting of four arcades, each a hundred and eighty feet long. Their eyes met, and she placed her hands in his. And, from the woods, came the mellow whinnying of a herd of vip, the wool of which is highly valued for weaving. End of a Romance in Encyclopedia Land by Robert C. Benchley By Anton Chekhov This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perrar. The Trousseau by Anton Chekhov I have seen a great many houses in my time, little and big, new and old, built of stone and of wood, but of one house I have kept a very vivid memory. 
It was, properly speaking, rather a cottage than a house, a tiny cottage of one story, with three windows, looking extraordinarily like a little old hunchback woman with a cap on. Its white stucco walls, its tiled roof, and dilapidated chimney were all drowned in a perfect sea of green. The cottage was lost to sight among the mulberry trees, acacias, and poplars planted by the grandfathers and great-grandfathers of its present occupants. And yet it is a townhouse. Its wide courtyard stands in a row with other similar green courtyards and forms part of a street. Nothing ever drives down that street, and very few persons are ever seen walking through it. The shutters of the little house are always closed. Its occupants do not care for sunlight. The light is no use to them. The windows are never opened, for they are not fond of fresh air. People who spend their lives in the midst of acacias, mulberries, and nettles have no passion for nature. It is only to the summer visitor that God has vouchsafed an eye for the beauties of nature. The rest of mankind remained steeped in profound ignorance of the existence of such beauties. People never prize what they have always had in abundance. What we have, we do not treasure. And what's more, we do not even love it. The little house stands in an earthly paradise of green trees with happy birds nesting in them. But inside, alas, in summer it is close and stifling within. In winter, hot as a Turkish bath, not one breath of air, and the dreariness. The first time I visited the little house was many years ago on business. I brought a message from the colonel, who was the owner of the house, to his wife and daughter. That first visit I remember very distinctly. It would be impossible, indeed, to forget it. Imagine a limp little woman of forty gazing at you with alarm and astonishment while you walk from the passage into the parlor. You are a stranger, a visitor, a young man. That's enough to reduce her to a state of terror and bewilderment. Though you have no dagger, axe, or revolver in your hand, and though you smile affably, you are met with alarm. Who have I the honor and pleasure of addressing? The little lady asks in a trembling voice. I introduced myself and explained why I had come. The alarm and amazement were at once succeeded by a shrill, joyful, ah! And she turned her eyes upwards to the ceiling. This ah! was caught up like an echo and repeated from the hall to the parlor, from the parlor to the kitchen, and so on down to the cellar. Soon the whole house was resounding with ah! in various voices. Five minutes later, I was sitting on a big, soft, warm lounge in the drawing room, listening to the ah echoing all down the street. There was a smell of moth powder and of goatskin shoes, a pair of which lay on a chair beside me wrapped in a handkerchief. In the window were geraniums and muslin curtains, and on the curtains were torpid flies. On the wall hung the portrait of some bishop, painted in oils, with the glass broken at one corner, and next to the bishop a row of ancestors with lemon-colored faces of a gypsy type. On the table lay a thimble, a reel of cotton, and a half-knitted stocking, and paper patterns, and a black blouse, tacked together, were lying on the floor. In the next room, two alarmed and fluttered old women were hurriedly picking up similar patterns and pieces of tailor's chalk from the floor. You must please excuse us. We are dreadfully untidy, said the little lady. While she talked to me, she stole embarrassed glances towards the other room where the patterns were still being picked up. The door, too, seemed embarrassed, opening an inch or two and then shutting again. What's the matter? said the little lady, addressing the door. Où est mon cravate lequel mon père m'avait envoyé de Corsk? asked the female voice at the door. Ah, et c'est que Marie, que really, it's impossible. Nous avons dans chez nous un homme pour qu'on nous de nous. Ask Lucaria. How well we speak French, though, I read in the eyes of the little lady, who was flushing with pleasure. Soon afterwards, the door opened, and I saw a tall, thin girl of nineteen in a long muslin dress with a gilt belt, from which, I remember, hung a mother-of-pearl fan. She came in, dropped a curtsy, 
and flushed crimson. Her long nose, which was slightly pitted with smallpox, turned red first, and then the flush passed up to her eyes and her forehead. "'My daughter,' chanted the little lady, and Manetchka, this is a young gentleman who has come, etc. I was introduced and expressed my surprise at the number of paper patterns. Mother and daughter dropped their eyes. We had a fair here at Ascension, said the mother. We always buy materials at the fair, and then it keeps us busy with sewing till the next year's fair comes around again. We never put things out to be made. My husband's pay is not very ample, and we are not able to permit ourselves luxuries. So we have to make up everything ourselves. But who will ever wear such a number of things? There are only two of you. Oh, as though we were thinking of wearing them. They are not to be worn. They are for the trousseau. Ah, oh, maman, what are you saying? said the daughter, and she crimsoned again. Our visitor might suppose it was true. I don't intend to be married. Never. She said this, but at the very word married, her eyes glowed. Tea, biscuits, butter, and jam were brought in, followed by raspberries and cream. At seven o'clock we had supper, consisting of six courses, and while we were at supper I heard a loud yawn from the next room. I looked with surprise towards the door. It was a yawn that could only come from a man. "'That's my husband's brother, Yegor Semyonitch. The little lady explained, noticing my surprise. He's been living with us for the last year. Please excuse him. He cannot come in to see you. He is such an unsociable person. He is shy with strangers. He is going into a monastery. He was unfairly treated in the service, and disappointment has preyed on his mind. After supper, the little lady showed the vestment which Yegor Semyonitch was embroidering with his own hands as an offering for the church. Manetchka threw off her shyness for a moment and showed me the tobacco pouch she was embroidering for her father. When I pretended to be greatly struck by her work, she flushed crimson and whispered something in her mother's ear. The latter beamed all over and invited me to go with her to the storeroom. There I was shown five large trunks and a number of smaller trunks and boxes. This is her trousseau, her mother whispered. We made it all ourselves. After looking at these forbidding trunks, I took leave of my hospitable hostesses. They made me promise to come and see them again some day. It happened that I was able to keep this promise. Seven years after my first visit, I was sent down to the little town to give expert evidence in a case that was being tried there. As I entered the little house, I heard the same, Ach! echo through it. They recognized me at once. Well, they might. My first visit had been an event in their lives, and when events are few, they are long remembered. I walked into the drawing-room. The mother, who had grown stouter and was already getting gray, was creeping about on the floor, cutting out some blue material. The daughter was sitting on the sofa, embroidering. There was the same smell of moth powder, there were the same patterns, the same portrait with the broken glass, but yet there was a change. Beside the portrait of the bishop hung a portrait of the colonel, and the ladies were in mourning. The colonel's death had occurred a week after his promotion to be a general. Reminiscences began. The widow shed tears. We have had a terrible loss, she said. My husband, you know, is dead. We are alone in the world now, and have no one but ourselves to look to. Yegor Semyonitch is alive, but I have no good news to tell of him. They would not have him in the monastery, on account of, of intoxicating beverages. And now in his disappointment he drinks more than ever. I am thinking of going to the Marshal of Nobility to lodge a complaint. Would you believe it? He has more than once broken open the trunks and taken Manetchka's trousseau and given it to beggars. He has taken everything out of two of the trunks. If he goes on like this, my Manetchka will be left without a trousseau at all. What are you saying, maman? said Manetchka, embarrassed. Our visitor might suppose. There's no knowing what he might suppose. I shall never, never marry. Manetchka cast her eyes up to the ceiling with a look of hope and aspiration, evidently not for a moment believing what she said. 
A little bald-headed masculine figure in a brown coat and galoshes instead of boots darted like a mouse across the passage and disappeared. Yegor Semyonitch, I suppose, I thought. I looked at the mother and daughter together. They both looked much older and terribly changed. The mother's hair was silvered, but the daughter was so faded and withered that her mother might have been taken for her elder sister, not more than five years her senior. I have made up my mind to go to the marshal, the mother said to me, forgetting she had told me this already. I mean to make a complaint. Yegor Semyonitch lays his hands on everything we make and offers it up for the sake of his soul. My Manetchka is left without a trousseau. Manetchka flushed again, but this time she said nothing. We have to make them all over again, and God knows we are not so well off. We are all alone in the world now. We are all alone in the world, repeated Manetchka. A year ago, fate brought me once more to the little house. Walking into the drawing room, I saw the old lady, dressed all in black with heavy crepe pleurosis. She was sitting on the sofa, sewing. Beside her sat the little old man in the brown coat and the galoshes instead of boots. On seeing me, he jumped up and ran out of the room. In response to my greeting, the old lady smiled and said, Je suis charmé de vous revoir, monsieur. What are you making? I asked a little later. It's a blouse. When it's finished, I shall take it to the priests to be put away, or else Yegor Semyonitch should carry it off. I store everything at the priests now, she added in a whisper. And looking at the portrait of her daughter, which stood before her on the table, she sighed and said, We are all alone in the world. And where was the daughter? Where was Manetchka? I did not ask. I did not dare to ask the old mother, dressed in her new deep mourning. And while I was in the room, and when I got up to go, no Manetchka came out to greet me. I did not hear her voice, nor her soft, timid footstep. I understood, and my heart was heavy. End of The Trousseau by Anton Chekhov by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Lau. Once upon a time, two poor woodcutters were making their way home through a great pine forest. It was winter, and a night of bitter cold. The snow lay thick upon the ground, and upon the branches of the trees. The frost kept snapping the little twigs on either side of them as they passed. And when they came to the mountain torrent, she was hanging motionless in air, for the Ice King had kissed her. So cold was it that even the animals and the birds did not know what to make of it. Ugh! snarled the wolf, as he limped through the brushwood with his tail between his legs. This is perfectly monstrous weather. Why doesn't the government look to it? Wheat, 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 twittered the green linnets. The old earth is dead, and they have laid her out in her white shroud. The earth is going to be married, and this is her bridal dress, whispered the turtle doves to each other. Their little pink feet were quite frostbitten, but they felt that it was their duty to take a romantic view of the situation. Nonsense, growled the wolf. I tell you that it is all the fault of the government. And if you don't believe me, I shall eat you. The wolf had a thoroughly practical mind, and was never at a loss for a good argument. Well, for my own part, said the woodpecker, who is a born philosopher, I don't care an atomic theory for explanations. If a thing is so, it is so. And at present, it is terribly cold. Terribly cold, it certainly was. The little squirrels who lived inside the tall fir tree kept rubbing each other's noses to keep themselves warm. And the rabbits curled themselves up in their holes and did not venture even to look out of doors. The only people who seemed to enjoy it were the great horned owls. Their feathers were quite stiff with rime, but they did not mind, and they rolled their large yellow eyes and called out to each other across the forest, To wit to woo, to wit to woo. 
what delightful weather we are having on and on went the two woodcutters blowing lustily upon their fingers and stamping with their huge iron-shod boots upon the caked snow once they sank into a deep drift and came out as white as millers are when the stones are grinding and once they slipped on the hard smooth ice where the marsh water was frozen and their faggots fell out of their bundles and they had to pick them up and bind them together again and once they thought they had lost their way and a great terror seized on them for they knew that the snow is cruel to those who sleep in her arms but they put their trust in the good saint martin who watches over all travellers and retraced their steps and went warily and at last they reached the outskirts of the forest and saw far down in the valley beneath them the lights of the village in which they dwelt so overjoyed were they at their deliverance that they laughed aloud and the earth seemed to them like a flower of silver and the moon like a flower of gold yet after that they had laughed they became sad for they remembered their poverty and one of them said to the other why did we make merry seeing that life is for the rich and not for such as we are better that we had died of cold in the forest or that some wild beast had fallen upon us and slain us truly answered his companion much is given to some and little is given to others injustice has parcelled out the world nor is there equal division of aught save of sorrow but as they were bewailing their misery to each other this strange thing happened there fell from heaven a very bright and beautiful star it slipped down the side of the sky passing by the other stars in its course and as they watched it wondering it seemed to sink behind a clump of willow trees that stood by a little sheepfold no more than a stone's throw away why there is a crook of gold for whoever finds it they cried and they set to and ran so eager were they for the gold and one of them ran faster than his mate and outstripped him and forced his way through the willows and came out on the other side and lo there was indeed a thing of gold lying in the white snow so he hastened towards it and stooping down placed his hands upon it and it was a cloak of golden tissue curiously wrought with stars and wrapped in many folds and he cried out to his comrade that he had found a treasure that had fallen from the sky and when his comrade had come up they sat them down in the snow and loosened the folds of the cloak that they might divide the pieces of gold but alas no gold was in it nor silver nor indeed treasure of any kind but only a little child who was asleep and one of them said to the other this is a bitter ending to our hope nor have we any good fortune for what doth a child profit to a man let us leave it here and go our way seeing that we are poor men and have children of our own whose bread we may not give to another but his companion answered him nay but it were an evil thing to leave the child to perish here in the snow and though i am as poor as thou art and have many mouths to feed and but little in the pot yet i will bring it home with me and my wife shall have care of it so very tenderly he took up the child and wrapped the cloak around it to shield it from the harsh cold and made his way down the hill to the village his comrade marvelling much at his foolishness and softness of heart and when they came to the village his comrade said to him thou hast a child therefore give me the cloak for it is meet that we should share but he answered him nay for the cloak is neither mine nor thine but a child's only and he bade him god speed and went to his own house and knocked and when his wife opened the door and saw that her husband had returned safe to her she put her arms around his neck and kissed him and took from his back the bundle of faggots and brushed the snow off his boots and bade him come in but he said to her i have found something in the forest and i have brought it to thee to have care of it and he stirred not from the threshold what is it she cried show it to me for the house is bare and we have need of many things and he drew the cloak back and showed her the sleeping child alack good man 
she murmured, have we not children of our own, that thou must needs bring a changeling to sit by the hearth? And who knows if it will not bring us bad fortune? How shall we tend it? And she was wroth against him. Nay, but it is a star child, he answered, and he told her the strange manner of the finding of it. But she would not be appeased, but mocked at him, and spoke angrily, and cried, Our children lack bread, and shall we feed the child of another? Who is there who careth for us, and who giveth us food? Nay, but God careth for the sparrows even, and feedeth them, he answered. Do not the sparrows die of hunger in the winter? she asked. And is it not winter now? And the man answered nothing, but stirred not from the threshold. And a bitter wind from the forest came in through the open door, and made her tremble. And she shivered, and said to him, Wilt thou not close the door? There cometh a bitter wind into the house, and I am cold. Into a house where a heart is hard, cometh there not always a bitter wind? He asked. And the woman answered him nothing, but crept closer to the fire. And after a time she turned round, and looked at him and her eyes were full of tears. And he came in swiftly, and placed the child in her arms. And she kissed it, and laid it in a little bed, where the youngest of their own children was lying. And on the morrow the woodcutter took the curious cloak of gold, and placed it in a great chest, and the chain of amber that was round the child's neck his wife took, and set it in the chest also. So the star-child was brought up with the children of the woodcutter, and sat at the same board with them, and was their playmate. And every year he became more beautiful to look at, so that all those who dwelt in the village were filled with wonder. For while they were swarthy and black-haired, he was white and delicate as sawn ivory, and his curls were like the rings of the daffodil. His lips also were like the petals of a red flower, and his eyes like violets, by a river of pure water, and his body like the narcissus of a field, where the mower comes not. Yet did his beauty work him evil, for he grew proud, and cruel, and selfish. The children of the woodcutter, and the other children of the village, he despised, saying that they were of mean parentage, while he was noble, being sprang from a star, and he made himself master over them, and called them his servants. No pity had he for the poor, or for those who were blind, or maimed, or in any way afflicted, but would cast stones at them, and drive them forth on to the highway, and bid them beg their bread elsewhere, so that none save the outlaws came twice to that village to ask for alms. Indeed, he was as one enamoured of beauty, and would mock at the weakly and ill-favoured, and make jest of them, and himself he loved. And in summer, when the winds were still, he would lie by the well in the priest's orchard, and look down at the marvel of his own face, and laugh for the pleasure he had in his fairness. Often did the woodcutter and his wife chide him, and say, We did not deal with thee as thou dealest with those who are left desolate, and have none to succour them, wherefore art thou so cruel to all who need pity? Often did the old priest send for him, and seek to teach him the love of living things, saying to him, The fly is thy brother, do it no harm. The wild birds that roam through the forest have their freedom. Snare them not for thy pleasure. God made the blind worm and the mole, and each has its place. Who art thou to bring pain into God's world? Even the cattle of the field praise him. But the star-child heeded not their words, but would frown and flout, and go back to his companions, and lead them. And his companions followed him, for he was fair, and fleet of foot, and could dance, and pipe, and make music. And wherever the star-child led them, they followed, and whatever the star-child bade them do, that did they. And when he pierced with a sharp reed the dim eyes of the mole, they laughed, and when he cast stones at the leper, they laughed also. 
and in all things he ruled them, and they became hard of heart, even as he was. Now there passed one day through the village a poor beggar woman. Her garments were torn and ragged, and her feet were bleeding from the rough road on which she had travelled, and she was in very evil plight, and being weary she sat her down under a chestnut tree to rest. But when the star-child saw her, he said to his companions, See, there sitteth a foul beggar-woman under that fair and green-leaved tree. Come, let us drive her hence, for she is ugly and ill-favoured. So he came near, and threw stones at her, and mocked her, and she looked at him with terror in her eyes, nor did she move her gaze from him. And when the woodcutter, who was cleaving logs in a haggard hard by, saw what the star-child was doing, he ran up and rebuked him, and said to him, Surely thou art hard of heart, and knowest not mercy? For what evil has this poor woman done to thee, that thou shouldst treat her in this wise? And the star-child grew red with anger, and stamped his foot upon the ground, and said, Who art thou to question me what I do? I am no son of thine to do thy bidding. Thou speakest truly, answered the woodcutter, Yet did I show thee pity, when I found thee in the forest. And when the woman heard these words, she gave a loud cry, and fell into a swoon. And the woodcutter carried her to his own house, and his wife had care of her. And when she rose up from the swoon into which she had fallen, they set meat and drink before her, and bade her have comfort. But she would neither eat nor drink, but said to the woodcutter, didst thou not say that a child was found in a forest and was it not ten years from this day and the woodcutter answered yea it was in the forest that i found him and it is ten years from this day and what signs didst thou find with him she cried bear he not upon his neck a chain of amber was not round him a cloak of gold tissue broidered with stars truly answered the woodcutter it was even as thou sayest. And he took the cloak and the amber chain from the chest where they lay, and showed them to her. And when she saw them, she wept for joy, and said, He is my little son, whom I lost in the forest. I pray thee, send for him quickly, for in search of him have I wandered over the whole world. So the woodcutter and his wife went out and called to the star-child, and said to him, Go into the house, and there shalt thou find thy mother, who is waiting for thee. So he ran in, filled with wonder and great gladness. But when he saw her, who was waiting there, he laughed scornfully and said, Why, where is my mother? For I see none here but this vile beggar-woman. And the woman answered him, I am thy mother. Thou art mad to say so, cried the star-child angrily. I am no son of thine, for thou art a beggar, and ugly, and in rags. Therefore get thee hence, and let me see thy foul face no more. Nay, but thou art indeed my little son, whom I bear in the forest, she cried, and she fell on her knees, and held out her arms to him. The robber stole thee from me, and left thee to die, she murmured, but I recognised thee when I saw thee and the signs also have I recognised, the cloak of golden tissue, and the amber chain. Therefore I pray thee come with me, for over the whole world have I wandered in search of thee. Come with me, my son, for I have need of thy love. But the star-child stirred not from his place, but shut the doors of his heart against her. Nor was there any sound heard, save the sound of the woman weeping for pain. And at last he spoke to her, and his voice was hard and bitter. If in very truth thou art my mother, he said, it had been better hadst thou stayed away, and not come here to bring me to shame, seeing that I thought I was the child of some star, and not a beggar's child, as thou tellest me that I am. Therefore get thee hence, and let me see thee no more. Alas, my son! she cried, Wilt thou not kiss me before I go? For I have suffered much to find thee. Nay, 
said the star child but thou art too foul to look at and rather would i kiss the adder or the toad than thee so the woman rose up and went away into the forest weeping bitterly and when the star child saw that she had gone he was glad and ran back to his playmates that he might play with them but when they beheld him coming they mocked him and said why thou art as foul as the toad and as loathsome as the adder get thee hence for we will not suffer thee to play with us and they drave him out of the garden and the star child frowned and said to himself what is this that they say to me i will go to the well of water and look into it and it shall tell me of my beauty so he went to the well of water and looked into it and lo his face was as the face of a toad and his body was sealed like an adder and he flung himself down on the grass and wept and said to himself surely this has come upon me by reason of my sin for i have denied my mother and driven her away and been proud and cruel to her wherefore i will go and seek her through the whole world nor will i rest till i have found her and there came to him the little daughter of the woodcutter and she put her hand upon his shoulder and said what doth it matter if thou hast lost thy comeliness stay with us and i will not mock at thee and he said to her nay but i have been cruel to my mother and as a punishment has this evil been sent to me wherefore i must go hence and wander through the world till i find her and she give me her forgiveness so he ran away into the forest and called out to his mother to come to him but there was no answer all day long he called to her and when the sun set he lay down to sleep on a bed of leaves and the birds and the animals fled from him for they remembered his cruelty and he was alone save for the toad that watched him and the slow adder that crawled past and in the morning he rose up and plucked some bitter berries from the trees and ate them and took his way through the great wood weeping sorely and of everything that he met he made inquiry if perchance they had seen his mother he said to the mole thou canst go beneath the earth tell me is my mother there and the mole answered thou hast blinded mine eyes how should i know and he said to the linnet thou canst fly over the tops of the tall trees and canst see the whole world tell me canst thou see my mother and the linnet answered thou hast clipped my wings for thy pleasure how should i fly and to the little squirrel who lived in the fir tree and was lonely he said where is my mother and the squirrel answered thou hast slain mine dost thou seek to slay thine also and the star-child wept and bowed his head and prayed forgiveness of god's things and went on through the forest seeking for the beggar-woman and on the third day he came to the other side of the forest and went down into the plain and when he had passed through the villages the children mocked him and threw stones at him and the carlots would not suffer him even to sleep in the byres lest he might bring mildew on the stored corn so foul was he to look at and their hired men drave him away and there was none who had pity on him nor could he hear anywhere of the beggar-woman who was his mother though for the space of three years he wandered over the world and often seemed to see her on the road in front of him and would call to her and run after her till the sharp flints made his feet to bleed but overtake her he could not and those who dwelt by the way did ever deny that they had seen her or any like to her and they made sport of his sorrow for the space of three years he wandered over the world and in the world there was neither love nor loving-kindness nor charity for him but it was even such a world as he had made for himself in the days of his great pride and one evening he came to the gate of a strong-walled city that stood by a river and weary and footsore though he was he made to enter in but the soldiers who stood on guard dropped their halberts across the entrance and said roughly to him 
What is thy business in the city? I am seeking for my mother, he answered, and I pray ye to suffer me to pass, for it may be that she is in this city. But they mocked at him, and one of them wagged a black beard, and set down his shield and cried, Of a truth thy mother will not be merry when she sees thee, for thou art more ill-favoured than the toad of the marsh, or the adder that crawls in the fen. Get thee gone, get thee gone, thy mother dwells not in this city. And another, who held a yellow banner in his hand, said to him, Who is thy mother, and wherefore art thou seeking for her? And he answered, My mother is a beggar, even as I am, and I have treated her evilly, and I pray ye to suffer me to pass, that she may give me her forgiveness, if it be that she tarrieth in this city. But they would not, and pricked him with their spears. And as he turned away weeping, one whose armour was inlaid with gilt flowers, and on whose helmet couched a lion that had wings, came up and made inquiry of the soldiers, who it was who had sought entrance. And they said to him, It is a beggar, and a child of a beggar, and we have driven him away. Nay, he cried laughing, but we will sell the foul thing for a slave, and his price shall be the price of a bowl of sweet wine. And an old and evil-visaged man, who passing by, called out and said, I will buy him for that price. And when he had paid the price, he took the star-child by the hand, and led him into the city. And after that they had gone through many streets, they came to a little door, that was set in a wall, that was covered with a pomegranate tree. And the old man touched the door, with a ring of grave jasper, and it opened. And they went down five steps of brass, into a garden filled with black poppies, and green jars of burnt clay. And the old man took then from his turban, a scarf of figured silk, and bound with it the eyes of the star-child, and drave him in front of him. And when the scarf was taken off his eyes, the star-child found himself in a dungeon that was lit by a lantern of horn. And the old man set before him some mouldy bread on a trencher, and said, Eat! And some brackish water in a cup, and said, Drink! And when he had eaten and drunk, the old man went out, locking the door behind him, and fastening it with an iron chain. And on the morrow the old man, who was indeed the subtlest of the magicians of Libya, and had learned his art from one who dwelt in the tombs of the Nile, came in to him, and frowned at him, and said, In a wood that is nigh to the gate of this city of Gianos, there are three pieces of gold. One is of white gold and another is of yellow gold, and the gold of the third one is red. Today thou shalt bring me the piece of white gold, and if thou bringest it not back, I will beat thee with a hundred stripes. Get thee away quickly, and at sunset I will be waiting for thee at the door of the garden. See that thou bringest the white gold, or it shall go ill with thee, for thou art my slave, and I have bought thee for a price of a bowl of sweet wine and he bound the eyes of the star-child with the scarf of figured silk, and led him through the house, and through the garden of poppies, and up the five steps of brass, and having opened a little door with his ring, he set him in the street. And the star-child went out of the gate of the city, and came to the wood of which the magician had spoken to him. Now this wood was very fair to look at from without, and seemed full of singing birds, and of sweet-scented flowers, and the star-child entered it gladly. Yet did its beauty profit him little, for wherever he went harsh briars and fawns shot up from the ground and encompassed him, and the evil nettles stung him, and a thistle pierced him with her daggers, so that he was in sore distress. Nor could he anywhere find a piece of white gold of which the magician had spoken. Though he sought for it from morn to noon, and from noon to sunset, and at sunset he set his face towards home, weeping bitterly, for he knew what fate was in store for him. But when he reached the outskirts of the wood, he heard from a thicket a cry as of someone in pain, and forgetting his own sorrow he ran back to the place, and saw there a little hare caught in a trap that some hunter 
had set for it. And the star-child had pity on it, and released it, and said to it, I am myself but a slave, yet may I give thee thy freedom. And the hare answered him, and said, Surely thou hast given me freedom, and what shall I give thee in return? And the star-child said to it, I am seeking for a piece of white gold, nor can I anywhere find it, and if I bring it not to my master, he will beat me. Come thou with me, said the hare, and I will lead thee to it, for I know where it is hidden, and for what purpose. So the star-child went with the hare, and lo, in the cleft of a great oak, he saw the piece of white gold that he was seeking. And he was filled with joy, and seized it, and said to the hare, The service that I did to thee thou hast rendered back again many times over, and the kindness that I showed thee thou hast repaid a hundredfold. Nay, answered the hare, but as thou dealt with me, so I did deal with thee. And it ran away swiftly, and the star-child went towards the city. Now at the gate of the city there was seated one who was a leper. Over his face hung a cowl of grey linen, and through the eyelets his eyes gleamed like red coals. And when he saw the star-child coming, he struck upon a wooden bowl, and clattered his bell, and called out to him, and said, Give me a piece of money, or I must die of hunger, for they have thrust me out of the city, and there is no one who has pity on me. Alas! cried the star-child, I have but one piece of money in my wallet, and if I bring it not to my master, he will beat me, for I am his slave. But the leper entreated him, and prayed of him, till the star-child had pity, and gave him the piece of white gold. And when he came to the magician's house, the magician opened to him, and brought him in, and said to him, Hast thou the piece of white gold? And the child answered, I have it not. So the magician fell upon him, and beat him, and set before him an empty trencher, and said, Eat, and an empty cup, and said, Drink, and flung him again into the dungeon. And on the morrow the magician came to him and said, If to-day thou bringest me not the piece of yellow gold, I will surely keep thee as my slave, and give thee three hundred stripes. So the star-child went to the wood, and all day long he searched for the piece of yellow gold, but nowhere could he find it. And at sunset he sat him down, and began to weep. And as he was weeping, there came to him the little hare that he had rescued from the trap. And the hare said to him, Why art thou weeping, and what dost thou seek in the wood? And the star-child answered, I am seeking for a piece of yellow gold that is hidden here, and if I find it not, my master will beat me, and keep me as a slave. Follow me, cried the hare, and it ran through the wood, till it came to a pool of water, and at the bottom of the pool the piece of yellow gold was lying. How shall I thank thee? said the star-child, for lo, this is the second time that you have succoured me. Nay, but thou hadst pity on me first, said the hare and it ran away swiftly. And the star-child took the piece of yellow gold, and put it in his wallet, and hurried to the city. But the leper saw him coming, and ran to meet him, and knelt down and cried, Give me a piece of money, or I shall die of hunger. And the star-child said to him, I have in my wallet but one piece of yellow gold, and if I bring it not to my master, he will beat me, and keep me as his slave. But the leper entreated him sore, so that the star-child had pity on him, and gave him the piece of yellow gold. And when he came to the magician's house, the magician opened to him, and brought him in, and said to him, Hast thou the piece of yellow gold? And the star-child said to him, I have it not. So the magician fell upon him, and beat him, and loaded him with chains, and cast him again into the dungeon. And on the morrow the magician came to him, and said, If to-day thou bringest me the piece of red gold, I will set thee free, but if thou bringest it not, 
I will surely slay thee. So the star child went to the wood, and all day long he searched for the piece of red gold, but nowhere could he find it, and at evening he sat down and wept, and as he was weeping there came to him the little hare, and the hare said to him, The piece of red gold that thou seekest is in the cavern that is behind thee, therefore weep no more, but be glad. How shall I reward thee? cried the star child, for lo! This is the third time thou hast succoured me. Nay, but thou hadst pity on me first, said the hare, and it ran away swiftly. And the star child entered the cavern, and in its farthest corner he found a piece of red gold. So he put it in his wallet, and hurried to the city. And the leper, seeing him coming, stood in the centre of the road, and cried out, and said to him, Give me the piece of red money, or I must die and the star-child had pity on him again, and gave him the piece of red gold, saying, Thy need is greater than mine. Yet was his heart heavy, for he knew what evil fate awaited him. But lo, as he passed through the gate of the city, the guards bowed down and made obeisance to him, saying, How beautiful is our Lord! And a crowd of citizens followed him, and cried out, Surely there is none so beautiful in the whole world. So that the star-child wept, and said to himself, They are mocking me, and making light of my misery. And so large was the concourse of the people, that he lost the threads of his way, and found himself at last in a great square, in which there was a palace of a king. And the gate of the palace opened, and the priests and the high officers of the city ran forth to meet him, and abased themselves before him, and said, Thou art our Lord, for whom we have been waiting, and the son of our king. And the star-child answered them, and said, I am no king's son, but a child of a poor beggar-woman. And how say ye that I am beautiful, for I know that I am evil to look at? Then he, whose armour was inlaid with gilt flowers, and on whose helmet crouched a lion that had wings, held up a shield, and cried, How saith my lord, that he is not beautiful? And the star-child looked, and lo, his face was even as it had been before, and his comeliness had come back to him, and he saw that in his eyes which he had not seen there before. And the priests and high officers knelt down and said to him, It was prophesied of old that on this day should come he who was to rule over us. Therefore let our Lord take his crown and this sceptre, and be in his justice and mercy our king over us. But he said to them, I am not worthy, for I have denied the mother who bare me, nor may I rest till I have found her and known her forgiveness. Therefore let me go, for I must wander again over the world, and may not tarry here, though ye bring me the crown and the sceptre. And as he spake, he turned his face from them towards the street that led to the gate of the city, and lo! Amongst the crowd that pressed round the soldiers, he saw the beggar-woman, who was his mother, and at her side stood the leper, who had sat by the road. A cry of joy broke from his lips, and he ran over, and kneeling down, he kissed the wounds of his mother's feet, and wet them with his tears. He bowed his head in the dust, and sobbing, as one whose heart might break, he said to her, Mother, I denied thee in the hour of my pride, accept me in the hour of my humility. Mother, I gave thee hatred, do thou give me love. Mother, I rejected thee, receive thy child now. But the beggar-woman answered him not a word. And he reached out his hands, and clasped the white feet of the leper, and said to him, Thrice did I give thee of my mercy, bid thy mother speak to me at once. But the leper answered him not a word, and he sobbed again, and said, Mother, my suffering is greater than I can bear. Give me thy forgiveness, and let me go back to the forest. And the beggar-woman put her hand on his head, and said to him, Rise. And the leper put his hand on his head, and said to him, Rise. 
also. And he rose up from his feet, and looked at them. And lo, they were a king and a queen. And the queen said to him, This is thy father, whom thou hast succoured. And the king said, This is thy mother, whose feet thou hast washed with thy tears. And they fell on his neck, and kissed him, and brought him into the palace, and clothed him in fair raiment, and set the crown upon his head, and a sceptre in his hand, and over the city that stood by the river he ruled, and was its lord. Much justice and mercy did he show to all, and the evil magician he banished, and to the woodcutter and his wife he sent many rich gifts, and to their children he gave high honour, nor would he suffer any to be cruel to bird or beast, but taught love and loving kindness and charity, and to the poor he gave bread, and to the naked he gave raiment, and there was a peace and plenty in the land. Yet ruled he not long, so great had been his suffering, and so bitter the fire of his testing, for after the space of three years he died, and he who came after him ruled evilly. End of the Star Child by Oscar Wilde Read by Alex Lau www.twitter.com slash alex of the day The Squire by Elsie Singmaster This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Squire by Elsie Singmaster The Squire was a bachelor, and lived alone in his house, therefore he was able to use the parlour and dining-room for offices. The parlour contained only a pine-desk, a map hanging at the wall, as Millerstown would have said, and a dozen or so plain pine-chairs. The law was administered with scant ceremony in Millerstown. The squire sat now in the twilight in his back office, which was furnished with another pine table, two chairs, and a large old-fashioned iron safe. He was clearly of a geographical turn of mind, for table, safe, and floor were littered with railroad maps and folders. The squire was about sixty years old, he had all the grey beauty which the Gormer men acquired. Their hair did not thin as it turned grey, their smooth-shaven faces did not wrinkle. They all looked stern, but their faces brightened readily at sight of a little child or an old friend, or with amusement over some untold thought. The squire's face glowed. He was going, his age, his inexperience the certain disapproval of Millerstown notwithstanding, he was going round the world. He would start in a month, and thus far he had told no one but Edwin Seam, an adventurous young Millerstonian, who was to leave that night for a ranch in Kansas, and whom the squire was to visit on his own journey. For thirty years he had kept Millerstown straight. There was no possible case for which his substitute would not find a precedent. Fortunately, there were no trusts to be investigated and reproved, and no vote-buyers or bribers to be imprisoned or fined. There were disputes of all kinds, dozens of them. There was one waiting for the squire now in the outer office. He shook his head solemnly at thought of it, as he gathered up his maps and thrust them back into the safe that precious old safe which held the money for his journey. He had been thirty years gathering the money together. The law might be administered in Millerstown without formality, but it was not administered without the eager attention of the citizens. Everyone in the village was on hand when simple-minded Venus Stubber was indicted for stealing, or when the various dramatic scenes of the miller weitzel -Feud was enacted. This evening's case, Sula Myers versus Adam Myers, for non-support, might be considered part of the Miller-Weitzelfeuille 
since the two real principals sula's mother and adam's mother had been respectively sally miller and maria weitzel the air was sultry and rain threatened the clouds seemed to rest on the tops of the maple trees it was only because the millestonians knew the rough brick pavements as they knew the palms of their hands that there were no serious falls in the darkness they laughed as they hurried to the hearing it was seldom that a dispute promised so richly there was almost no one in the village who could not have been subpoenaed as a witness so thoroughly was everyone's knowledge of the case already the real principals faced each other glaring under the blinding light of the squire's hanging lamp it made no difference that millistown listened and chuckled or that the squire had taken his seat behind the pine desk when it don't give any religion it don't give any decent behaving but god tryeth the hearts of the righteous said mrs myers meaningly she was a large commanding woman who had been converted in the middle life to the fervent sect of the new mennonites and young adam had been brought up in that persuasion except for his marriage young adam had been thus far his mother's creature body and soul sula's mother mrs hill was large also she took off her sunbonnet and folded her arms as tightly as possible across her broad bosom there is sometimes too much religion she said not in your family sally rejoined mrs myers her glance including not only mrs hill and sula but all their sympathizers and even caleb stemmel who was supposed to be neutral caleb stemmel belonged in the same generation with the squire his interest could be only general caleb did not see mrs myers scornful glance he was watching pretty sula who sat close by her mother's side sula looked at nobody neither at her angry mother beside her nor at her angry mother-in-law opposite nor even at adam her husband sitting close by his mother she wore her best clothes her pretty summer hat the white dress in which she had been married a year before even her wedding handkerchief was tucked into her belt sula had been strangely excited when she dressed in the bedroom of her girlhood for the hearing there was the prospect of getting even with her mother-in-law with whom she had lived for a year and whom she hated there was the prospect of seeing adam's embarrassment there was another reason soothing to her pride and as yet almost unacknowledged even to herself now however the glow had begun to fade and she felt uncomfortable and distressed she heard only dimly mrs myers attack and her mother's response immediately mrs myers told mrs hill to be quiet and mrs hill replied with equal elegance you will both be quiet said the squire sternly the court will come to order now sula you are the one that complains you will tell us what you want sula did not answer she was tugging at her handkerchief the handkerchief had been pinned fast its loosening took time it was this way began mrs myers and mrs hill together the squire lifted his hand we'll wait for sula he looked sternly at mrs hill no whispering sally sula's complaint came out with a burst of tears he won't support me for three months already i didn't have a cent all this time i supported her said her mother she had a good home and wouldn't stay in it said mrs myers the squire commanded silence again sula you were willing to live with adam's mother when you were married why aren't you now she she wouldn't give me no peace she wouldn't let him take me for a wedding trip not even to the fair she repeated it as though it were the worst of all her grievances not even a wedding trip to the fair would he dare to take mrs hill burst forth again she would have spoken if decapitation had followed he gave all his money to his mum he's yet under age said mrs myers 
again mrs hill burst forth she wanted that Sula should convert herself to the mennonites i wanted to save her soul declared mrs myers you needn't to worry yourself about her soul answered mrs hill when you behave as well as Sula when you're young you needn't to worry yourself about other people's souls when you get old mrs myers youth had not been as straight-laced as her middle age there was a depth of reminiscent innuendo in mrs hill's remark millerstown laughed it was one of the delights of these hearings that no allusion failed to be appreciated besides i did give her money mrs myers hastened to say yes five cents once in a while and i had to ask for it every time said Sula. i might as well stayed at home with my mum as get married like that Sula's eyes wandered about the room and suddenly her face brightened her voice hardened as though someone had waved her an encouraging sign i want him to support me right i must have four dollars a week i can't live off my mum the squire turned for the first time to the defendant well adam what have you to say adam had not glanced toward his wife he sat with bent head staring at the floor his face crimson he was a slender fellow he looked even younger than his nineteen years i did my best he said miserably can't you make a home for her alone adam no how much do you earn about seven dollars a week sometimes ten other people in millerstown live on that but i have nothing to start no furniture or anything your mother will surely give you something and Sula's mother the squire looked commandingly at mrs myers and mrs hills it is better for young ones to begin alone i have nothing to spare said mrs myers stiffly i wouldn't take any of your things blazed Sula. i wouldn't use any of your things or have any of your things you know how much he had when you married him said mrs myers calmly you needn't have run after him run after him cried Sula. it was the climax of sordid insult they had been two irresponsible children mating as birds mate with no thought for the future it was not true that she had run after him she burst into loud crying if you and your son begged me on your knees to come back i wouldn't run after him echoed Sula's mother i had almost to take the broom to him at ten o'clock to get him to go home adam looked up quickly for the moment he was a man he spoke as hotly as his mother his warmth startled even his pretty wife it isn't true she never ran after me he looked down again he could not quarrel he had heard nothing but quarrelling for months it made no difference to him what happened a plan was slowly forming in his mind edwin seam was going west he would go too away from mother and wife alike she can come and live in the home i can give her or she can stay away he said sullenly knowing that Sula would never enter his mother's house the squire turned to Sula once more he had been staring at the back of the room where Caleb Stemmel's keen, selfish face moved now into the light, now back into the shadow. On it was a strange expression, a hungry gleam of the eyes, a tightening of the lips, an eager watching of the girlish figure in the white dress. The squire knew all the gossip of Millerstown, and he knew many things which Millerstown did not know. He had known Caleb Stemmel for fifty years but it was incredible that Caleb Stemmel, with all his wickedness, should have any hand in this. The squire bent forward. Sula, look at me. You are Adam's wife. You must live with him. Won't you go back? Sula looked about the room once more. Sula would do nothing wrong. Yet it was with Caleb Stemmel that her mother advised. 
it was caleb stemmel who came evening after evening to sit on the porch caleb stemmel was a rich man even if he was old enough to be her father and it was many months since anyone else had told sula that her hat was pretty or her dress becoming now with caleb's eyes upon her she said the little speech which had been taught her the speech which set millerstown gasping and sent the squire leaping to his feet furious anger on his face neither millerstown nor the squire english as they had become was yet entirely of the world i will not go back said pretty sula lightly if he wants to apply for a divorce he can sula cried the squire he looked about once more on the faces of sula's mother and caleb stemmel was complacency on the face of mrs myers astonished approval on the faces of the citizens of millerstown except the very oldest there was amazement but no dismay there had never been a divorce in millerstown persons quarrelled sometimes they separated sometimes they lived in the same house without speaking to each other for months and years but they were not divorced was this the beginning of a new order if there were to be a new order it would not come during the two months before the squire started on his long journey he shook his fist his eyes blazing there is to be no such threatening in this court he cried and no talking about divorce while i am here sula maria sally are you out of your heads there are higher courts said mrs hill miller's tongue gasped visibly at her defiance to its further amazement the squire made no direct reply instead he went toward the door of the back office adam he commanded come here adam rose without a word to obey he had some respect for the majesty of the law sula you come too for an instant sula held back don't you do it sula said her mother sula said the squire and sula too rose don't you give up commanded her mother then she got up to her feet i'm going in there too again the squire did not answer he presented instead the effectual response of a closed and locked door the back office was as dark as a pocket the squire took a match from the safe and lit the lamp behind them the voices of mrs myers and mrs hill answered each other with antiphonal regularity adam stood by the window sula advanced no farther than the door the squire spoke sharply adam adam turned from the window sula sula looked up she had always held the squire in awe now without the support of her mother's elbow and caleb stemmel's eyes she was badly frightened moreover it seemed to her suddenly that the thing she had said was monstrous the squire frightened her no further he was now gentleness itself sula he said you didn't mean what you said in there did you sula burst into tears not of anger but of wretchedness you'd say anything too if you had to stand the things i did sit down both of you commanded the squire now adam what are you going to do adam hid his face in his hands the other room had been a torture chamber i don't know then at the squire's next question he lifted his head suddenly it seemed as if the squire had read his soul when is edwin seem going west tonight how would you like to go with him he wanted me to he could get me a place with good wages but i couldn't save even the fare in half a year suppose the squire hesitated then stopped then went on again suppose i should give you the money give me the money yes lend it to you a red glow came into adam's face i would go to-night and sula 
said the squire i would the boy was young too young to have learnt despair from only one bitter experience besides he had not seen caleb stemmel's eyes i would send for her when i could the squire made a rapid reckoning he did not dare to send the boy away with less than a hundred dollars and it would take a long while to replace it he could not could not send sula too no matter how much he hated divorce no matter how much he feared caleb stemmel's influence over her no matter how much he loved millerstown and every man woman and child in it if he sent sula it would mean that he might never start on his own journey he looked down at her as she sat drooping in her chair what do you say sula sula looked up at him it might have been the thought of parting which terrified her or the recollection of caleb stemmel oh i would try she said faintly i would try to do what is right but they are after me all the time and and her voice failed and she began to cry the squire swung open the door of the old safe you have ten minutes to catch the train he said gruffly you must hurry adam laid a shaking hand on the girl's shoulder it was the first time he had been near her for weeks sula he began wretchedly the squire straightened up he had pulled out from the safe a roll of bills with it came a mass of brightly colored pamphlets which drifted about on the floor here he said i mean both of you of course i'm to go too cried sula of course said the squire edwin will look after you in this dress said sula yes now run for at least ten minutes more the eager company in the next room heard the squire's voice go on angrily each mother was complacently certain that he was having no effect on her child he's telling her she ought to be ashamed of herself said mrs myers he's telling him he's such a mother baby responded mrs hill she will not go back to him while the world stands the righteous shall be justified and the wicked shall be condemned said mrs myers suddenly the squire's monologue ended with a louder burst of oratory the silence which followed frightened mrs hill let me in she demanded rapping on the door this court shall be public not private cried mrs myers she thrust mrs hill aside and knocked more loudly at which imperative summons the squire appeared he stood for an instant with his back to the door the bright light shining on his handsome face seeing him appear alone the two women stood still and stared where is he asked mrs myers where is she demanded mrs hill the squire's voice shook there is to be no divorcing in millerstown yet a while he announced where is he cried mrs myers where is she shrieked mrs hill the squire smiled the parting blast of the train whistle screaming as if in triumph echoed across the little town they had had abundance of time to get aboard he is with her where he should be he answered mrs myers and she is with him where she should be he said to mrs hill and both are together this time it seemed that he was addressing all of millerstown in reality he was looking straight at caleb stemmel you m mean that stammered mrs myers what do you mean demanded mrs hill i mean and now the squire was grinning broadly i mean they are taking a wedding trip end of the squire by elsie singmaster read by lars rolander
The Peasant Marais by Fedor Dostoevsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was the second day in Easter week. The air was warm, the sky was blue, the sun was high, warm, bright. But my soul was very gloomy. I sauntered behind the prison barracks. I stared at the palings of the stout prison fence, counting the movers, but I had no inclination to count them, though it was my habit to do so. This was the second day of the holidays in the prison. The convicts were not taken out to work. There were numbers of men drunk. Loud abuse and quarreling was springing up continually in every corner. There were hideous, disgusting songs and card parties installed beside the platform beds. Several of the convicts who had been sentenced by their comrades for special violence to be beaten till they were half dead were lying on the platform bed, covered with sheepskins till they should recover and come to themselves again. Knives had already been drawn several times. For these two days of holiday, all this had been torturing me till it made me ill and indeed i could never endure without repulsion the noise and disorder of drunken people and especially in this place on these days even the prison officials did not look into the prison made no searches did not look for vodka understanding that they must allow even these outcasts to enjoy themselves once a year and that things would be even worse if they did not at last a sudden fury flamed up in my heart. A political prisoner called M. met me. He looked at me gloomily. His eyes flashed and his lips quivered. Je hais ces brigands, he hissed me through his teeth and walked on. I hate these brigands. I returned to the prison ward, though only a quarter of an hour before I had rushed out of it, as though I were crazy when six stalwart fellows had altogether flung themselves upon the drunken Tatar Gazine to suppress him, and had begun beating him. They beat him stupidly. A camel might have been killed by such blows, but they knew that this Hercules was not easy to kill, and so they beat him without uneasiness. Now, on returning, I noticed on the bed in the farthest corner of the room Gazine was lying unconscious, almost without sign of life. He lay covered with a sheepskin, and everyone walked around him without speaking, though they confidently hoped that he would come to himself next morning. Yet if luck was against him, maybe from a beating like that, the man would die. I made my way to my own place opposite the window with the iron grating, and lay on my back with my hands behind my head and my eyes shut. I liked to lie like that. A sleeping man is not molested, and meanwhile one can dream and think. But I could not dream. My heart was beating uneasily, and M's words, Je hais ces brigands, were echoing in my ears. But why describe my impressions? I sometimes dream, even now, of those times at night, and I have no dreams more agonizing. Perhaps it will be noticed that even to this day I have scarcely once spoken in print of my life in prison. The House of the Dead I wrote fifteen years ago in the character of an imaginary person, a criminal who had killed his wife. I may add, by the way, that since then very many persons have supposed, and even now maintain, that I was sent to penal servitude for the murder of my wife. Gradually I sank into forgetfulness, and by degrees was lost in memories. During the whole course of my four years in prison I was continually recalling all my past, and seemed to live over the whole of my life in recollection. These memories rose up of themselves. It was not often that of my own will that I summoned them. I would begin from some point, some little thing, at times unnoticed, and then by degrees there would rise up a complete picture, some vivid and complete impression. I used to analyze these impressions, give new features to what had happened long ago, and best of all I used to correct it, correct it continually. That was my great amusement. On this occasion, I suddenly, for some reason, remembered an unnoticed moment of my early childhood, when I was only nine years old, a moment which I should have thought I had utterly forgotten, but at that time I was particularly fond of memories of my early childhood. 
I remembered the month of August in our country house, a dry, bright day, but rather cold and windy. Summer was waning, and soon we would have to go to Moscow to be bored all the winter over French lessons, and I was so sorry to leave the country. I walked past the threshing floor, and, going down the ravine, I went up to the dense thicket of bushes that covered the farther side of the ravine as far as the copse and I plunged right into the midst of the bushes, and I heard a peasant plowing alone on the clearing about thirty paces away. I knew that he was plowing up the steep hill, and the horse was moving with effort, and from time to time the peasant's call, Come up, floated upwards to me. I knew almost all of our peasants, but I did not know which it was that was plowing now, and I did not care who it was. I was absorbed in my own affairs. I was busy, too. I was breaking off switches from the nut-trees to whip the frogs with. Nut-sticks make such fine whips, but they do not last, while birch-twigs are just the opposite. I was interested, too, in beetles and other insects. I used to collect them. Some were very ornamental. I was very fond, too, of the little nimble red and yellow lizards with black spots on them, but I was afraid of snakes. Snakes, however, were much more rare than lizards. There were not many mushrooms there. To get mushrooms one had to go to the birch wood, and I was about to set off there. And there was nothing in the world that I loved so much as the wood, with its mushrooms and wild berries, and its beetles and its birds, its hedgehogs and squirrels, with its damp smell of dead leaves which I loved so much, and even as I write I smell the fragrance of our birch wood. These impressions will remain for my whole life. Suddenly, in the midst of the profound stillness, I heard a clear and distinct shout, WOLF! I shrieked, and beside myself with terror, calling out at the top of my voice, ran out into the clearing and straight to the peasant who was plowing. It was our peasant Marais. I don't know if there is such a name, but everyone called him Marais, a thick-set, rather well-grown peasant of fifty, with a good many gray hairs in his dark brown spreading beard. I knew him, but had scarcely ever happened to speak to him till then. He stopped his horse on hearing my cry, and when breathless I caught with one hand at his plow and with the other at his sleeve, he saw how frightened I was. "'There's a wolf!' I cried, panting. He flung up his head and could not help looking round for an instant, almost believing me. "'Where is the wolf?' "'A shout! Someone shouted, "'Wolf!' I, I faltered out. "'Nonsense! Nonsense! A wolf?' Why, it was your fancy. How could there be a wolf, he muttered, reassuring me. But I was trembling all over, and I still kept a tight hold on his smock frock, and I must have been quite pale. He looked at me with an uneasy smile, evidently anxious and troubled over me. Why, you've had a fright. Ay, ay, he shook his head. There, dear, come, little one. Ay, he stretched out his hand, and all at once stroked my cheek. Come, come there, Christ be with you, cross yourself. But I did not cross myself. The corners of my mouth were twitching, and I think that struck him particularly. He put out his thick, black-nailed, earth-stained finger, and softly touched my twitching lips. Ay, there, there, he said to me, with a slow, almost motherly smile. Dear, dear, what's the matter? There, come, come. I grasped at last that there was no wolf, and that the shout that I had heard was my fancy. Yet that shout had been so clear and distinct, but such shouts, not only about wolves, I had imagined once or twice before, and I was aware of that. These hallucinations passed away later as I grew older. Well, I will go then, I said, looking at him timidly and inquiringly. "'Well, do, and I'll keep a watch on you as you go. "'I won't let the wolf get at you,' he added, "'still smiling at me with the same motherly expression. "'Well, Christ be with you. Come, run along, then.' "'And he made the sign of the cross over me, and then over himself. "'I walked away, looking back, almost at every tenth step. "'Mary stood still with his mare as I walked away, "'and looked after me, and nodded to me every time I looked around.' I must own I felt a little ashamed at having let him see me so frightened, but I was still very much afraid of the wolf as I walked away, 
until I reached the first barn halfway up the slope of the ravine. There my fright vanished completely, and all at once our yard-dog Voltchok flew to meet me. With Voltchok I felt quite safe, and I turned around to Marais for the last time. I could not see his face distinctly, but I felt that he was still nodding and smiling affectionately to me. I waved to him, and he waved back, and started his little mare. Come up! I heard his call again in the distance, and the little mare pulled at the plow again. All this I recalled at once. I don't know why, but with extraordinary minuteness of detail. I suddenly roused myself and sat up on the platform bed, and I remember found myself still smiling quietly at my memories. I brooded over them for another minute. When I got home that day, I told no one of my adventure with Marais, and indeed it was hardly an adventure. And in fact I soon forgot Marais. When I met him now and then afterwards, I never even spoke to him about the wolf or anything else. And all at once now, twenty years afterwards, in Siberia, I remembered this meeting with such distinctness to the smallest detail. So it must have lain hidden in my soul, though I knew nothing of it, and rose suddenly to my memory when it was wanted. I remember the soft, motherly smile of the poor serf, the way he signed me with the cross and shook his head, There, there, you have had a fright, little one. And I remembered particularly the thick, earth-stained finger with which he softly and with timid tenderness touched my quivering lips. Of course anyone would have reassured a child, but something quite different seemed to have happened in that solitary meeting. And if I had been his own son, he could not have looked at me with eyes shining with greater love. And what made him like that? He was our serf, and I was his little master, after all. No one would know that he had been kind to me and reward him for it. Was he perhaps very fond of little children? Some people are. It was a solitary meeting in the deserted fields, and only God, perhaps, may have seen from above with what deep and humane, civilized feeling, and with what delicate, almost feminine tenderness, the heart of a coarse, brutally ignorant Russian serf, who had as yet no expectation, no idea even of his freedom, may be filled. Was not this, perhaps, what Konstantin Aksakov meant when he spoke of the high degree of culture in our peasantry? And when I got down off the bed and looked around me, I remember I suddenly felt that I could look at these unhappy creatures with quite different eyes, and that suddenly, by some miracle, all hatred and anger had vanished utterly from my heart. I walked about, looking into the faces that I met, that shaven peasant, branded on his face as a criminal, bawling his hoarse, drunken song, that may be Marais. I cannot look into his heart. I met M. again that evening. Poor fellow! He could have no memories of Russian peasants, and no other view of these people. But J. Hesse Brigon, yes, the Polish prisoner, had more to bear than I. This is the end of Peasant Marais by Fedor Dostoevsky, read by John Shevchik. An Autumn Holiday by Sarah Orne Jewett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org, read by Betsy Bush. An Autumn Holiday by Sarah Orrin Jewett I had started early in the afternoon for a long walk. It was just the weather for walking, and I went across the fields with a delighted heart. The wind came straight in from the sea, and the sky was bright blue. There was a little tinge of red still lingering on the maples, and my dress brushed over the late goldenrods, while my old dog, who seemed to have taken a new lease of youth, jumped about wildly and raced after the little birds that flew up out of the long brown grass, the constant little chickadees that would soon sing before the coming of snow. But this day brought no thought of winter. It was one of the October days when to breathe the air is like drinking wine, 
and every touch of the wind against one's face is a caress like a quick sweet kiss that wind is you have a sense of companionship it is a day that loves you i went strolling along with this dear idle day for company it was a pleasure to be alive and to go through the dry grass and to spring over the stone walls and the shaky pasture fences i stopped by each of the stray apple trees that came in my way to make friends with it or to ask after its health if it were an old friend these old apple trees make very charming bits of the world in october the leaves cling to them later than to the other trees and the turf keeps short and green underneath and in this grass which was frosty in the morning and has not quite dried yet you can find some cold little cider apples with one side knurly and one shiny bright red or yellow cheek they are wet with dew these little apples and a black ant runs anxiously over them when you turn them round and round to see where the best place is to bite there will almost always be a bird's nest in the tree and it is most likely to be a robin's nest the prehistoric robins must have been cave dwellers for they still make their nests as much like cellars as they can though they follow the new fashion and build them aloft one always has a thought of spring at the sight of a robin's nest it is so little while ago that it was spring and we were so glad to have the birds come back and the life of the new year was just showing itself we were looking forward to so much growth and to the realization and perfection of so many things i think the sadness of autumn or the pathos of it is like that of elderly people we have seen how the flowers looked when they bloomed and have eaten the fruit when it was ripe the questions have had their answer the days we waited for have come and gone everything has stopped growing and so the children have grown to be men and women their lives have been lived the autumn has come we have seen what our lives would be like when we were older success or disappointment it is all over at any rate yet it only makes one sad to think it is autumn with the flowers or with one's own life when one forgets that always and always there will be the spring again i am very fond of walking between the roads one grows so familiar with the highways themselves but once leap the fence and there are a hundred roads that you can take each with its own scenery and entertainment every walk of this kind proves itself a tour of exploration and discovery and the fields of my own town which i think i know so well are always new fields i find new ways to go new sights to see new friends among the things that grow and new treasures and pleasures every summer and later when the frosts have come and the swamps have frozen i can go everywhere i like all over my world that afternoon i found something i had never seen before a little grave alone in a wide pasture which had once been a field the nearest house was at least two miles away but by hunting for it i found a very old cellar where the child's home used to be not very far off along the slope it must have been a great many years ago that the house had stood there and the small slate headstone was worn away by the rain and wind so there was nothing to be read if indeed there had ever been any letters on it it had looked many a storm in the face and many a red sunset I suppose the woods nearby had grown and been cut and grown again since it was put there. There was an old sweetbriar bush growing on the short little grave, and in the grass underneath I found a ground sparrow's nest. It was like a little neighborhood, and I have felt ever since as if I belonged to it. And I wondered then if one of the young ground sparrows was not always sent to take the nest when the old ones were done with it. So they came back in the spring year after year to live there and there were always the stone and the sweetbriar bush and the birds to remember the child it was such a lonely place in that wide field under the great sky and yet it was so comfortable too but the sight of the little grave at first touched me strangely and i tried to picture to myself the procession that came out from the house the day of the funeral and i thought of the mother in the evening after all the people had gone home and how she missed the baby 
and kept seeing the new grave out here in the twilight as she went about her work. I suppose the family moved away, and so all the rest were buried elsewhere. I often think of this place, and I link it in my thoughts with something I saw once in the water when I was out at sea. A little boat that some child had lost, that had drifted down the river and out to sea, too long a voyage, for it was a sad little wreck, and even its white sail of a hand-breadth half under water, and its twine rigging trailing astern. It was a silly little boat, and no loss, except to its owner, to whom it had seemed as brave and proud a thing as any ship of the line to you and me. It was a shipwreck of his small hopes, I suppose, and I can see it now, the toy of the great winds and waves, as it floated on its way, while I sailed on mine, out of sight of land. The little grave is forgotten by everybody but me, I think. The mother must have found the child again in heaven a very long time ago. But in the winter I shall wonder if the snow has covered it well, and next year I shall go to see the sweetbriar bush when it is in bloom. God knows what use that life was. The grave is such a short one, and nobody knows whose little child it was. But perhaps a thousand people in the world today are better because it brought a little love into the world that was not there before. I sat so long here in the sun that the dog, after running after all the birds and even chasing crickets and going through a great piece of affectation in barking before an empty woodchuck's hole to kill time, came to sit patiently in front of me, as if he wished to ask when I would go on. I had never been in this part of the pasture before. It was at one side of the way I usually took. So presently I went on to find a favorite track of mine, half a mile to the right, along the bank of a brook. There had been heavy rains the week before, and I found more water than usual running, and the brook was apparently in a great hurry. It was very quiet along the shore of it. The frogs had long ago gone into winter quarters, and there was not one to splash into the water when he saw me coming. I did not see a muskrat, either, though I knew where their holes were by the piles of freshwater mussel shells that they had untidily thrown out at their front door. I thought it might be well to hunt for mussels myself and crack them in a search of pearls, but it was too serene and beautiful a day. I was not willing to disturb the comfort of even a shellfish. It was one of the days when one does not think of being tired, the scent of the dry everlasting flowers, and the freshness of the wind and the cawing of the crows all come to me as I think of it, and I remember that I went a long way before I began to think of going home again. I knew I could not be far from a crossroad, and when I climbed a low hill I saw a house which I was glad to make the end of my walk, for a time at any rate. It was some time since I had seen the old woman who lived there, and I liked her dearly and was sure of a welcome. I went down through the pasture lane, and just then I saw my father drive away up the road, just too far for me to make him hear me when I called. That seemed too bad at first, until I remembered that he would come back again over the same road after a while, and in the meantime I could make my call. The house was low and long and unpainted, with a great many frost-bitten flowers about it. Some hollyhocks were bowed down despairingly, and the morning-glory vines were more miserable still. Some of the smaller plants had been covered to keep them from freezing, and were braving out a few more days, but no shelter would avail them much longer. And already nobody minded whether the gate was shut or not, and part of the great flock of hens were marching proudly about among the wilted posies, which they had stretched their necks wistfully through the fence for all summer. I heard the noise of spinning in the house, and my dog scurried off after the cat as I went in the door. I saw Miss Polly Marsh and her sister Mrs. Snow, stepping back and forward together spinning yarn at a pair of big wheels. The wheels made such a noise with their whirr and creak, and my friends were talking so fast as they twisted and turned the yarn that they did not hear my footstep, and I stood in the doorway watching them. It was such a quaint and pretty sight. They went together like a pair of horses, and kept step with each other to and fro. They were about the same size, and were cheerful old bodies, 
looking a good deal alike with their checked handkerchiefs over their smooth gray hair, their dark gowns made short in the skirts, and their broad little feet in gray stockings and low leather shoes without heels. They stood straight, and though they were quick at their work, they moved stiffly. They were talking busily about someone. I could tell by the way the doctor looked that he didn't think there was much of anything the matter with her, said Miss Polly Marsh. You needn't tell me, says I, the other day, when I see him at Mrs. Martin's. She'd be up in about this minute if she only had a mite resolution. And says he, Aunt Polly, you're as near right as usual. And the old lady stopped to laugh a little. I told him that warn't saying much, said she, with an evident consciousness of the underlying compliment and the doctor's good opinion. I never knew one of that tribe that hadn't a queer streak and wasn't shiftless, but they're tougher than ellum roots. And she gave the wheel an emphatic turn while Mrs. Snow reached for more rolls of wool and happened to see me. Wherever did you come from? said they in great surprise. Why, you wasn't anywhere in sight when I was out speaking to the doctor, said Mrs. Snow. Oh, come over horseback, I suppose. Well, now, we're pleased to see ye. No, said I. I walked across the fields. It was too pleasant to stay in the house, and I haven't had a long walk for some time before. I begged them not to stop spinning, but they insisted that they should not have turned the wheels a half dozen times more, even if I had not come, and they pushed them back to the wall before they came to sit down to talk with me over their knitting, for neither of them were ever known to be idle. Mrs. Snow was only there for a visit. She was a widow and lived during most of the year with her son, and Aunt Polly was at home, but seldom herself, as she was a famous nurse and was often in demand all through that part of the country. I had known her all my days. Everybody was fond of the good soul, and she had been one of the most useful women in the world. One of my pleasantest memories is of a long but not very painful illness one winter when she came to take care of me. There was no end either to her stories or her kindness. I was delighted to find her at home that afternoon, and Mrs. Snow also. Aunt Polly brought me some of her gingerbread, which she knew I liked, and a stout little pitcher of milk, and we sat there together for a while gossiping and enjoying ourselves. I told all the village news that I could think of, and I was just tired enough to know it, and to be comfortable to sit still for a while in the comfortable three-cornered chair by the little front window. The October sunshine lay along the clean kitchen floor, and Aunt Polly darted from her chair occasionally to catch a stray little wisps of wool which the breeze through the door blew along from the wheels. There was a gay string of red peppers hanging over the very high mantel shelf, and the woodwork in the room had never been painted, and had grown dark brown with age and smoke and scouring. The clock ticked solemnly as if it were a judge giving the laws of time, and felt itself to be the only thing that did not waste it. There was a bouquet of asparagus and some late sprigs of larkspur, and white petunias on the table underneath, and a leavitz almanac lay on the county paper, which was itself laying on the big Bible, of which Aunt Polly made a point of reading two chapters every day in course. I remember her saying despairingly one night, half to herself, I don't know, but I may skip the Chronicles next time. But I have never to this day believed that she did. They asked me at once to come into the best room, but I liked the old kitchen best. Who was it that you were talking about as I came in? said I. You said you didn't believe there was much the matter with her. And Aunt Polly clicked her knitting needles faster and told me that it was Mary Susan Ash over by Little Creek. They're dreadful nervous, all them ashes, said Mrs. Snow. You know, young Joe Adams' wife, over by way, is a sister to her, and she's forever a doctorin'. Poor fellow, he's got a drag. I'm real sorry for Joe, but land sakes alive, he might a known better. They said she had an old green band box with a gingham cover that was stowed full of vials that she moved with the rest of her things when she was married, besides some she carried in her hands. I guess she ain't in no more hurry to go than any of the rest of us. I've lost every mite of patience with her. I was over there last week one day, and she'd had a call from the new supply, 
You know, Adams's folks is Methodists, and he was took in by her. She made out she'd got the consumption, and she told how many complaints she had, and what a sight of medicine she took, and she groaned and sighed, and her voice was so weak you couldn't more than just hear it. I stepped right into the bedroom after he'd been a-praying with her, and was taking leave. You'd thought, by what he said, she was going right off then. She was coughing dreadful hard, and I knew she had no more cough than I had. So says I, "'What's the matter, Adeline? I'll get you a drink of water, something in your throat, I suppose. I hope you don't go and get cold and have a cough.' She looked as if she could have bit me, but I was just as pleasant as could be. Land, to see her laying there. I suppose the poor young fellow thought she was all gone. He meant well. I wish he had seen her eating apple dumplings for dinner. She felt better long in the first of the afternoon before he come. I says to her right before him that I guessed them dumplings did her good, but she never made no answer. She will have these dying spells. I don't know she can help it, but she needn't act as if it was a credit to anybody to be sick and laid up. Poor Joe, he come over for me last week another day, and said she'd been having spasms and asking if there wasn't something I could think of. Yes, says I, you just take a pail of stone-cold water and throw it square into her face. That'll bring her out of it. And he looked at me a minute, and then he burst out a-laughing. He couldn't help it. He's too good to her, that's the trouble. You never said that to her about the dumplings, said Aunt Polly admiringly. Well, I shouldn't have dared. And she rocked and knitted away faster than ever while we all laughed. Now with Mary Susan it's different. I suppose she doesn't have the neurology, and she's a poor broken-down creature. I do feel for her more than I do for Adeline. She was always a willing girl, and she worked herself to death, and she can't help these notions, nor being an ash either. I'm the last one to be hard on anybody that's sick and in trouble, said Mrs. Snow. Bless you, she set up with Adeline herself three nights in one week, to my knowledge. It's more than I would do, said Aunt Polly, as if there were danger that I should think Mrs. Snow's kind heart to be made of flint. It ain't what I call watchin', said she apologetically. We both doze off, and then when the folks come in in the morning, she'll tell what a sufferin' night she's had. She likes to have it said she has to have watchers. It's strange what a queer streak there is running through the whole of them, said Aunt Polly presently. It always was so. Far back so you can follow em. Did you ever hear about that great uncle of theirs that lived over to the other side of Denby, over to what they called the Denby Meadows? We had a cousin o' my father's that kept house for him. He was a single man, and I spent most of a summer and fall with her once when I was growing up. She seemed to want company. It was a lonesome sort of place. There, I don't know when I have thought to that, said Mrs. Snow, looking much amused. What stories you did used to tell, after you come home, about the way he used to act. Dear sakes, she used to keep us laughing till we was tired. Do tell her about him, Polly. She'll like to hear. Well, I forgot a good deal about it. You see, it was much as fifty years ago. I wasn't more than seventeen or eighteen years old. He was a very respectable man, old Mr. Daniel Gunn was, and a captain in the militia in his day. Captain Gunn, they always called him. He was well off, but he got sunstruck, and never was just right in his mind afterward. When he was getting over his sickness after the stroke, he was very wandering, and at last he seemed to get it into his head that he was his own sister Patience that died some five or six years before. She was single, too, and she always lived with him. They said when he got so's to sit up in his armchair of an afternoon, when he was getting better, he fought him dreadfully because they fetched him his own clothes to put on. He said they was Brother Daniel's clothes. So sure enough, they got out an old double gown and let him put it on, and he was as peaceable as could be. The doctor told them to humor him, but they thought it was a fancy he took, and he would forget it. But the next day he made him get the double gown again, and a cap, too. And there he used to set up alongside of his bed as prim as a dish. 
when he got round again so he could set up all day they thought he wanted the dress but no he seemed to be himself and had on his own clothes just as usual in the morning but when he took his nap after dinner and waked up again he was in a dreadful frame of mind and had the trousers and coat off in no time and said he was patience he used to fuss with some knitting work he got hold of somehow he was good-natured as could be and sometimes he would make em fetch him the cat because patience used to have a cat that sat in her lap while she knit i wasn't there then you know but they used to tell me about it folks used to call him miss daniel gunn he'd been that way some time when i went over i'd heard about his notions and i was scared of him at first but i found out there wasn't no need don't you know i was sort of afraid to go lisbeth when cousin statery sent for me after she went home from that visit she made here she told us about him but sometimes long at the first of it he used to be cross he never was after i went there he was a clever kind-hearted man if ever there was one said aunt polly with decision he used to go down to the corner to the store sometimes in the morning and he would see to business and before he got feeble sometimes he would work out on the farm all the morning stiddy as any of the men but after he come in to dinner he would take off his coat if he had it on and fall asleep in his armchair or on a lounge there was in his bedroom and when he waked up he would be sort of bewildered for a while and then he'd step round quick as he could and get his dress out of the clothes press and the cap and put em on right over the rest of his clothes he was always small featured and smooth shaved and i don't know as to come in sudden you would have thought he was a man except his hair stood up short and straight all on the top of his head as men folks had a fashion of combing their hair then and i must say he did make a dreadful ordinary-looking woman the neighbors got used to his ways and land i never thought nothing of it after the first week or two his sister's clothes that he wore first was too small for him and so my cousin statery that kept his house she made him a linsey woolsey dress with a considerable short skirt and he was dreadful pleased with it she said because the other one never would button over good and showed his waistcoat and she and i used to make him caps he used to wear the kind all the old women did then with a big crown and close round the face i've got some laid away upstairs now that was my mother's she wore caps very young mother did his nephew that lived with him carried on the farm and managed the business but he always treated the cap'n as if he was head of everything there everybody pitied the cap'n folks respected him but you couldn't help laughing to save ye we tried to keep him in afternoons but we couldn't always tell her about the day he went to meetin said mrs snow why one of us always used to stay to home with him we took turns and somehow or another he never offered to go though by spells he would be constant to meetin in the morning why bless you you'd never think anything ailed him a good deal of the time if you saw him before noon though sometimes he would be freaky and hide himself at the barn or go over in the woods but we always kept an eye on him but this sunday there was going to be a great occasion old parson croden was going to preach he was thought more of than anybody in this region you've heard tell of him a good many times i suppose he was getting to be old and didn't preach much he had a colleague they sat so much by him in his parish and i didn't know's i'd ever get another chance to hear him so i didn't want to stay to home and neither did cousin statery and jacob gunn old mr gunn's nephew he said it might be the last time ever he'd hear parson croden and he sat in the seats anyway so we talked it all over and we got a young boy to come and set long of the cap'n till we got back he hadn't offered to go anywhere of an afternoon for a long time i suppose he thought women ought to be stayers at home according to scripture parson ridley his wife was a niece to old dr croton and the old doctor they was up in the pulpit and the choir was singing the first hymn it was a fuging tune and they was doing their best seems to me it was canterbury new yes it was i remember i thought how splendid it sounded and jacob gunn he was a leadin off and i happened to look down the aisle and who should i see but the poor old cap'n in his cap and gown parading right into meeting before all the folks there i wanted to go through the floor 
Everybody most had seen him at home, but my goodness, to have come into meeting. What did you do? said I. Why, nothing, said Miss Polly. There was nothing to do. I thought I should faint away, but I called Cousin Statery's attention, and she looked dreadful put to it for a minute. And then she says she, open the door for him, I guess he won't make no trouble. And poor soul, he didn't. But to see him come up the aisle, he'd fixed himself nice as could be, poor creature. He'd raked out Miss Patience's old Navarino bonnet with green ribbons and a willow feather, and set it on right over his cap. And he had her bead bag on his arm and her turkey tail fan that he'd got out of the best room. And he'd come with little short steps up to the pew, and I supposed he'd set by the door. But no, he made to go by us, up into the corner, where she used to set, and took her place, and spread his dress out nice, and got his handkerchief out of his bag, just as he's seen her do. He took off his bonnet all of a sudden, as if he'd forgot it, and put it under the seat, like he did his hat. That was the only thing he did that any woman wouldn't have done, and the crown of his hat was bent some. I thought, die, I should. The pew was one of them up beside the pulpit, a square one, you know, right at the end of the right-hand aisle. So I could see the length of it, and up to the door, and there stood that poor boy we'd left to keep the camp in company, looking as pale as ashes. We found he'd tried every way to keep the old gentleman at home, but he said he got fierce as could be, so he didn't dare to say no more. And Captain Gunn drove him back twice to the house, and that's why he got in so late. I didn't know, but it was the boy that had set him on to go to the meeting when I see him walk in, and I could have wrung his neck. But I guess I misjudged him. He was called Stiddy Boy. He married a daughter of Ichabod Pinkham's over to Oak Plains, and I saw a son of his when I was taking care of Miss West last spring through that lung fever. Looked like his father. I wish I'd thought to tell him about that Sunday. I heard he was waiting on that pretty Beckett girl, the orphan one that lives with Nathan Beckett. Her father and mother were both lost at sea, but she's got property. What did they say in church when the captain came in, Aunt Polly? said I. Well, a good many of them laughed. They couldn't help it to save them. But the captain, he was some hard of hearing, so he never noticed it and he sat there in the corner and fanned him, as pleased and satisfied as could be. The singers, they had the worst time, but they had just come to the end of a verse, and they played on the instruments a good while in between, but I could see them shake, and I suppose the tune did stray a little, though they went through it well. And after the first fun of it was over, most of the folks felt bad. You see, the captain had been very much looked up to, and it was his misfortune, and he sat there quiet, listening to the preacher. I see some tears in some of the old folks' eyes. They hated to see him so broke in his mind, you know. There was more than usual of them out that day. They knew how bad he'd feel if he realized it. A good Christian man he was, and dreadful precise, I've heard him say. Did he ever go again? said I. I seem to forget, said Aunt Polly, I dare say. I wasn't there but from the last of June into November, and when I went over again it wasn't for three years, and the captain had been dead some time. His mind failed him more and more along at the last, but I'll tell you what he did do, and it was the week after that very Sunday, too. He heard it given out from the pulpit that the Female Missionary Society would meet with Miss William Sands the Thursday night of that week, the Sewing Society, you know and he looked round to us real knowing, and Cousin Statery says she to me under her bonnet, You don't suppose he'll want to go? And I like to have laughed right out, but sure enough he did. And what do you suppose? But he made us fix over a handsome black-watered silk for him to wear, that had been his sister's best dress. He said he'd outgrown it dreadful quick. Cousin Statery, she wished to heaven she'd thought to put it away, for Jacob had given it to her, and she was meaning to make it over for herself. But it didn't do to cross the captain, and Jacob Gunn gave Statery another one, the best he could get, but it wasn't near so good a piece, she thought. He set everything by Statery, and so did the captain, and well they might. We hoped he'd forget all about it the next day, but he didn't, and I always thought well of those ladies. They treated him so handsome and tried to make him enjoy himself. 
he did eat a great supper, they kept a piling up his plate with everything. I couldn't help wondering if some of em would have put themselves out much if it had been some poor flighty old woman. The captain he was as polite as could be, and when Jacob come to walk home with him, he kissed em all round and asked em to meet at his house. But the greatest was, land, I don't know when I've thought so much about those times. One afternoon he was setting at home in the keepin' room, and Statery was there, and Deacon Abel Pinkham stopped in to see Jacob Gunn about building some fence, and he found he'd gone to mill, so he waited a while, talking friendly as they expected Jacob might be home. And the captain was as pleased as could be, and he urged the deacon to stop to tea. And when he went away, says he to Statery in a dreadful knowing way, which of us do you consider the deacon come to see? You see, the deacon was a widower. Bless you. When I first come home, I used to set everybody laughing, but I forget most of the things now. There was one day, though. Here comes your father, said Mrs. Snow. Now we mustn't let him go by, or you'll have to walk way home. And Aunt Polly hurried out to speak to him, while I took my great bunch of goldenrod, which already drooped a little, and followed her with Mrs. Snow, who confided to me that the captain's nephew, Jacob, had offered to Polly that summer she was over there, and she never could see why she didn't have him. Only love goes where it is sent, and Polly wasn't one to marry for what she could get if she didn't like the man. There was plenty that would have said yes, and thank you too, sir, to Jacob Gunn. That was a pleasant afternoon. I reached home when it was growing dark and chilly, and the early autumn sunset had almost faded in the west. It was a much longer way home around by the road than by the way I had come across the fields. End of An Autumn Holiday by Sarah Orrin Jewett Jeannie's Daughter by Nathaniel Hawthorne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Miles A young man named Giovanni Guasconti came, very long ago, from the more southern region of Italy, to pursue his studies at the University of Padua. Giovanni, who had but a scanty supply of gold ducats in his pocket, took lodgings in a high and gloomy chamber of an old edifice which looked not unworthy to have been the palace of a Paduan noble, and which, in fact, exhibited over its entrance the armorial bearings of a family long since extinct. The young stranger, who was not unstudied in the great poem of his country, recollected that one of the ancestors of this family, and perhaps an occupant of this very mansion, had been pictured by Dante as a partaker of the immortal agonies of his inferno. These reminiscences and associations, together with the tendency to heartbreak natural to a young man for the first time out of his native sphere, caused Giovanni to sigh heavily as he looked around the desolate and ill-furnished apartment. "'Holy Virgin, Signor!' cried old dame Lisabetta, who, won by the youth's remarkable beauty of person, was kindly endeavouring to give the chamber a habitable air. "'What a sigh was that to come out of a young man's heart!' Do you find this old mansion gloomy? For the love of heaven, then, put your head out of the window, and you will see as bright sunshine as you have left in Naples. Guasconti mechanically did as the old woman advised, but could not quite agree with her that the Paduan sunshine was as cheerful as that of southern Italy. Such as it was, however, it fell upon a garden beneath the window, and expended its fostering influences on a variety of plants which seemed to have been cultivated with exceeding care. "'Does this garden belong to the house?' asked Giovanni. "'Heaven forbid, Signor, unless it were fruitful of better pot-herbs than any that grow there now,' answered old Lisabetta. "'No, that garden is cultivated by the own hands of Signor Giacomo Rappaccini, the famous doctor who, I warrant him, has been heard of as far as Naples. It is said, that he distills these plants into medicines that are as potent as a charm. 
oftentimes you may see the signor doctor at work and perchance the signora his daughter too gathering the strange flowers that grow in the garden the old woman had now done what she could for the aspect of the chamber and commending the young man to the protection of the saints took her departure giovanni still found no better occupation than to look down into the garden beneath his window from its appearance he judged it to be one of those botanic gardens which were of earlier date in padua than elsewhere in italy or in the world or not improbably it might once have been the pleasure place of an opulent family for there was the ruin of a marble fountain in the centre sculptured with rare art but so woefully shattered that it was impossible to trace the original design from the chaos of remaining fragments the water however continued to gush and sparkle into the sunbeams as cheerfully as ever a little gurgling sound ascended to the young man's window and made him feel as if the fountain were an immortal spirit that sung its song unceasingly and without heeding the vicissitudes around it while one sentry embodied it in marble and another scattered the perishable garniture on the soil all about the pool into which the water subsided grew various plants that seemed to require a plentiful supply of moisture for the nourishment of gigantic leaves and in some instances flowers gorgeously magnificent there was one shrub in particular set in a marble vase in the midst of the pool that bore a profusion of purple blossoms each of which had the lustre and richness of a gem and the whole together made a show so resplendent that it seemed enough to illuminate the garden even had there been no sunshine every portion of the soil was peopled with plants and herbs which if less beautiful still bore tokens of assiduous care as if all had their individual virtues known to the scientific mind that fostered them some were placed in urns rich with old carving and others in common garden pots some crept serpent-like along the ground or climbed on high using whatever means of ascent was offered them one plant had wreathed itself round a statue of vertumnus which was thus quite veiled and shrouded in a drapery of hanging foliage so happily arranged that it might have served a sculptor for a study while giovanni stood at the window he heard a rustling behind a screen of leaves and became aware that a person was at work in the garden his figure soon emerged into view, and showed itself to be that of no common laborer, but a tall, emaciated, sallow, and sickly-looking man, dressed in a scholar's garb of black. He was beyond the middle term of life, with grey hair, a thin grey beard, and a face singularly marked with intellect and cultivation, but which could never, even in his more youthful days, have expressed much warmth of heart nothing could exceed the intentness with which this scientific gardener examined every shrub which grew in his path it seemed as if he was looking into their inmost nature making observations in regard to their creative essence and discovering why one leaf grew in this shape and another in that and wherefore such and such flowers differed among themselves in hue and perfume nevertheless in spite of this deep intelligence on his part there was no approach to intimacy between himself and these vegetable existences. On the contrary, he avoided their actual touch or the direct inhaling of their odors with a caution that impressed Giovanni most disagreeably, for the man's demeanor was that of one walking among malignant influences, such as savage beasts, or deadly snakes, or evil spirits, which, should he allow them one moment of license, would wreak upon him some terrible fatality. It was strangely frightful to the young man's imagination to see this air of insecurity in a person cultivating a garden, that most simple and innocent of human toils, and which had been alike the joy and labor of the unfallen parents of the race. Was this garden, then, the Eden of the present world? And this man, with such a perception of harm in what his own hands caused to grow, was he the Adam? the distrustful gardener while plucking away the dead leaves or pruning the too luxuriant growth of the shrubs defended his hands with a pair of thick gloves nor were these his only armour when in his walk through the garden he came to the magnificent plant that hung its purple gems beside the marble fountain he placed a kind of mask over his mouth and nostrils as if all this beauty did but conceal a deadlier malice but finding his task still too dangerous 
He drew back, removed the mask, and called loudly, but in the infirm voice of a person affected with inward disease, "'Beatrice! Beatrice! Here am I, my father! What would you?' cried a rich and youthful voice from the window of the opposite house, a voice as rich as a tropical sunset, and which made Giovanni, though he knew not why, think of deep hues of purple or crimson, and of perfumes heavily delectable. "'Are you in the garden?' "'Yes, Beatrice,' answered the gardener, "'and I need your help.' Soon there emerged from under a sculptured portal the figure of a young girl, arrayed with as much richness of taste as the most splendid of the flowers, beautiful as the day, and with a bloom so deep and vivid that one shade more would have been too much. She looked redundant with life, health, and energy, all of which attributes were bound down and compressed, as it were, and girdled tensely in their luxuriance by her virgin zone. Yet Giovanni's fancy must have grown morbid while he looked down into the garden, for the impression which the fair stranger made upon him was as if here were another flower, the human sister of those vegetable ones, as beautiful as they, more beautiful than the richest of them, but still to be touched only with a glove, nor to be approached without a mask. As Beatrice came down the garden path, it was observable that she handled and inhaled the odor of several of the plants, which her father had most sedulously avoided. "'Here, Beatrice,' said the latter, "'see how many needful offices require to be done to our chief treasure. Yet, shattered as I am, my life might pay the penalty of approaching it so closely as circumstances demand. Henceforth, I fear, this plant must be consigned to your sole charge.' "'And gladly will I undertake it!' cried again the rich tones of the young lady, as she bent towards the magnificent plant and opened her arms, as if to embrace it. "'Yes, my sister, my splendour, it shall be Beatrice's task to nurse and serve thee, and thou shalt reward her with thy kisses and perfumed breath, which to her is as the breath of life.' Then, with all the tenderness in her manner that was so strikingly expressed in her words, she busied herself with such attentions as the plant seemed to require, and Giovanni, at his lofty window, rubbed his eyes and almost doubted whether it were a girl tending her favorite flower, or one sister performing the duties of affection to another. The scene soon terminated. Whether Dr. Rappaccini had finished his labors in the garden, or that his watchful eye had caught the stranger's face, he now took his daughter's arm and retired. Night was already closing in, oppressive exhalations seemed to proceed from the plants and steal upward past the open window, and Giovanni, closing the lattice, went to his couch and dreamed of a rich flower and beautiful girl. Flower and maiden were different and yet the same, and fraught with some strange peril in either shape. But there is an influence in the light of morning that tends to rectify whatever errors of fancy or even of judgment we may have incurred during the sun's decline, or among the shadows of the night, or in the less wholesome glow of moonshine. Giovanni's first movement, on starting from sleep, was to throw open the window and gaze down into the garden which his dreams had made so fertile of mysteries. He was surprised, and a little ashamed, to find how real and matter-of-fact an affair it proved to be in the first rays of the sun which gilded the dewdrops that hung upon leaf and blossom, and, while giving a brighter beauty to each rare flower, brought everything within the limits of ordinary experience. The young man rejoiced that, in the heart of the barren city, he had the privilege of overlooking this spot of lovely and luxuriant vegetation. It would serve, he said to himself, as a symbolic language to keep him in communion with nature. Neither the sickly and thought-worn Dr. Giacomo Rappaccini, it is true, nor his brilliant daughter were now visible, so that Giovanni could not determine how much of the singularity which he attributed to both was due to their own qualities, and how much to his wonder-working fancy. But he was inclined to take a most rational view of the whole matter. In the course of the day he paid his respects to Signor Pietro Baglioni, professor of medicine in the university, a physician of eminent repute to whom Giovanni had brought a letter of introduction. The professor was an elderly personage, apparently of genial nature, and habits that might almost be called jovial. He kept the young man to dinner, and made himself very agreeable by the freedom and liveliness of his conversation, 
especially when warmed by a flask or two of Tuscan wine. Giovanni, conceiving that men of science, inhabitants of the same city, must needs be on familiar terms with one another, took an opportunity to mention the name of Dr. Rappaccini. But the professor did not respond with so much cordiality as he had anticipated. Ill would have become a teacher of the divine art of medicine, said Professor Pietro Baglioni, in answer to a question of Giovanni, to withhold due and well-considered praise of a physician so eminently skilled as Rappaccini. But, on the other hand, I should answer it but scantily to my conscience were I to permit a worthy youth like yourself, Signor Giovanni, the son of an ancient friend, to imbibe erroneous ideas respecting a man who might hereafter chance to hold your life and death in his hands. The truth is, our worshipful Dr. Rappaccini has as much science as any member of the faculty, with perhaps one single exception, in Padua, or all Italy, but there are certain grave objections to his professional character. And what are they? asked the young man. Has my friend Giovanni any disease of body or heart, that he is so inquisitive about physicians? said the professor, with a smile. But as for Rappaccini, it is said of him, and I, who know the man well, can answer for its truth, that he cares infinitely more for science than for mankind. His patients are interesting to him only as subjects for some new experiment. He would sacrifice human life, his own among the rest, or whatever else was dearest to him, for the sake of adding so much as a grain of mustard seed to the great heap of his accumulated knowledge. Methinks he is an awful man indeed, remarked Guasconti, mentally recalling the cold and purely intellectual aspect of Rappaccini. And yet, worshipful professor, is it not a noble spirit? Are there many men capable of so spiritual a love of science? God forbid, answered the professor, somewhat testily. At least, unless they take sounder views of the healing art than those adopted by Rappaccini. It is his theory that all medicinal virtues are comprised within those substances which we term vegetable poisons. These he cultivates with his own hands, and is said even to have produced new varieties of poison, more horribly deleterious than nature, without the assistance of this learned person, would ever have plagued the world with all. That the Signor Doctor does less mischief than might be expected with such dangerous substances is undeniable. Now and then, it must be owned, he has effected, or seemed to effect, a marvellous cure. But to tell you my private mind, Signor Giovanni, he should receive little credit for such instances of success, they being probably the work of chance, but should be held strictly accountable for his failures, which may justly be considered his own work. The youth might have taken Baglioni's opinions with many grains of allowance had he known that there was a professional warfare of long continuance between him and Dr. Rappaccini, in which the latter was generally thought to have gained the advantage. If the reader be inclined to judge for himself, we refer him to certain black letter tracts on both sides preserved in the medical department of the University of Padua. I know not, most learned professor, returned Giovanni, after musing on what had been said of Rappaccini's exclusive zeal for science. I know not how dearly this physician may love his art, but surely there is one object more dear to him. He has a daughter. Ah! cried the professor with a laugh. So now our friend Giovanni's secret is out. You have heard of this daughter whom all the young men in Padua are wild about, though not half a dozen have ever had the good hap to see her face. I know little of the Signora Beatrice, save that Rappaccini is said to have instructed her deeply in his science, and that, young and beautiful as fame reports her, she is already qualified to fill a professor's chair. Perchance her father destines her for mine. Other absurd rumors there be, not worth talking about or listening to. So now, Signor Giovanni, drink off your glass of lacrima. Guasconti returned to his lodgings, somewhat heated with the wine he had quaffed, and which caused his brain to swim with strange fantasies in reference to Dr. Rappaccini and the beautiful Beatrice. On his way, 
happening to pass by a florist's, he bought a fresh bouquet of flowers. Ascending to his chamber, he seated himself near the window, but within the shadow thrown by the depth of the wall, so that he could look down into the garden, with little risk of being discovered. All beneath his eye was a solitude. The strange plants were basking in the sunshine, and now and then nodding gently to one another, as if an acknowledgment of sympathy and kindred. In the midst, by the shattered fountain, grew the magnificent shrub, with its purple gems clustering all over it. They glowed in the air, and gleamed back again out of the depths of the pool, which thus seemed to overflow with colored radiance from the rich reflection that was steeped in it. At first, as we have said, the garden was a solitude. Soon, however, as Giovanni had half hoped, half feared would be the case, a figure appeared beneath the antique sculptured portal, and came down between the rows of plants, inhaling their various perfumes as if she were one of those beings of old classic fable that lived upon sweet odors. On again beholding Beatrice, the young man was even startled to perceive how much her beauty exceeded his recollection of it. So brilliant, so vivid was its character, that she glowed amid the sunlight, and, as Giovanni whispered to himself, positively illuminated the more shadowy intervals of the garden path. Her face being now more revealed than on the former occasion, he was struck by its expression of simplicity and sweetness, qualities that had not entered into his idea of her character, and which made him ask anew what manner of mortal she might be. Nor did he fail again to observe, or imagine, an analogy between the beautiful girl and the gorgeous shrub that hung its gem-like flowers over the fountain, a resemblance which Beatrice seemed to have indulged a fantastic humor in heightening, both by the arrangement of her dress and the selection of its hues. Approaching the shrub, she threw open her arms, as with a passionate ardor, and drew its branches into an intimate embrace, so intimate that her features were hidden in its leafy bosom, and her glistening ringlets all intermingled with the flowers. "'Give me thy breath, my sister,' exclaimed Beatrice, "'for I am faint with common air, and give me this flower of thine, which I separate with gentlest fingers from the stem, and place it close beside my heart.' With these words the beautiful daughter of Rappaccini plucked one of the richest blossoms of the shrub, and was about to fasten it in her bosom. But now, unless Giovanni's draughts of wine had bewildered his senses, a singular incident occurred. A small orange-colored reptile, of the lizard or chameleon species, chanced to be creeping along the path just at the feet of Beatrice. It appeared to Giovanni, but at the distance from which he gazed, he could scarcely have seen anything so minute. It appeared to him, however, that a drop or two of moisture from the broken stem of the flower descended upon the lizard's head. For an instant the reptile contorted itself violently, and then lay motionless in the sunshine. Beatrice observed this remarkable phenomenon and crossed herself, sadly, but without surprise, nor did she therefore hesitate to arrange the fatal flower in her bosom. There it blushed and almost glimmered with the dazzling effect of a precious stone, adding to her dress and aspect the one appropriate charm which nothing else in the world could have supplied. But Giovanni, out of the shadow of his window, bent forward and shrank back, and murmured and trembled. "'Am I awake? Have I my senses?' said he to himself. "'What is this being? Beautiful, shall I call her, or inexpressibly terrible?' Beatrice now strayed carelessly through the garden, approaching closer beneath Giovanni's window, so that he was compelled to thrust his head quite out of its concealment, in order to gratify the intense and painful curiosity which she excited. At this moment there came a beautiful insect over the garden wall. It had, perhaps, wandered through the city, and found no flowers or verdure among those antique haunts of men, until the heavy perfumes of Dr. Rappaccini's shrubs had lured it from afar. Without alighting on the flowers, this winged brightness seemed to be attracted by Beatrice, and lingered in the air and fluttered about her head. Now, here it could not be but that Giovanni Guasconti's eyes deceived him. Be that as it might, he fancied that, while Beatrice was gazing at the insect with childish delight, it grew faint and fell at her feet, its bright wings shivered, it was dead. From no cause that he could discern, unless it were the atmosphere of her breath, 
Again Beatrice crossed herself and sighed heavily as she bent over the dead insect. An impulsive movement of Giovanni drew her eyes to the window. There she beheld the beautiful head of the young man, rather a Grecian than an Italian head, with fair, regular features, and a glistening of gold among his ringlets, gazing down upon her like a bean that hovered in mid-air. Scarcely knowing what he did, Giovanni threw down the bouquet which he had hitherto held in his hand. Signora, said he, there are pure and healthful flowers. Wear them for the sake of Giovanni Gusconti. Thanks, Signor, replied Beatrice, with her rich voice, that came forth as it were like a gush of music, and with a mirthful expression half childish and half womanlike. I accept your gift, and would fain recompense it with this precious purple flower, but if I toss it into the air it will not reach you. So Signor Gusconti must even content himself with my thanks. She lifted the bouquet from the ground, and then, as if inwardly ashamed at having stepped aside from her maidenly reserve to respond to a stranger's greeting, passed swiftly homeward through the garden. But few as the moments were, it seemed to Giovanni, when she was on the point of vanishing beneath the sculptured portal, that this beautiful bouquet was already beginning to wither in her grasp. It was an idle thought. There could be no possibility of distinguishing a faded flower from a fresh one at so great a distance. For many days after this incident, the young man avoided the window that looked into Dr. Rappaccini's garden, as if something ugly and monstrous would have blasted his eyesight had he been betrayed into a glance. He felt conscious of having put himself, to a certain extent, within the influence of an unintelligible power by the communication which he had opened with Beatrice. The wisest course would have been, if his heart were in any real danger, to quit his lodgings and Padua itself at once, the next wiser to have accustomed himself, as far as possible, to the familiar and daylight view of Beatrice, thus bringing her rigidly and systematically within the limits of ordinary experience. Least of all, while avoiding her sight, ought Giovanni to have remained so near this extraordinary being that the proximity and possibility even of intercourse should give a kind of substance and reality to the wild vagaries which his imagination ran riot continually in producing. Gusconti had not a deep heart, or, at all events, its depths were not sounded now, but he had a quick fancy and an ardent southern temperament which rose every instant to a higher fever pitch. Whether or no Beatrice possessed those terrible attributes, that fatal breath, the affinity with those so beautiful and deadly flowers, which were indicated by what Giovanni had witnessed, she had at least instilled a fierce and subtle poison into his system. It was not love, although her rich beauty was a madness to him, nor horror, even while he fancied her spirit to be imbued with the same baneful essence that seemed to pervade her physical frame, but a wild offspring of both love and horror that had each parent in it, and burned like one and shivered like the other. Giovanni knew not what to dread, still less did he know what to hope, yet hope and dread kept a continual warfare in his breast, alternately vanquishing one another and starting up afresh to renew the contest. Blessed are all simple emotions, be they dark or bright. It is the lurid intermixture of the two that produces the illuminating blaze of the infernal regions. Sometimes he endeavored to assuage the fever of his spirit by a rapid walk through the streets of Padua or beyond its gates. His footsteps kept time with the throbbings of his brain, so that the walk was apt to accelerate itself to a race. One day he found himself arrested, his arm was seized by a portly personage, who had turned back on recognizing the young man, and expended much breath in overtaking him. "'Signor Giovanni, stay, my young friend!' cried he. "'Have you forgotten me? That might well be the case if I were as much altered as yourself.' It was Baglioni, whom Giovanni had avoided ever since their first meeting, from a doubt that the professor's sagacity would look too deeply into his secrets. Endeavoring to recover himself, he stared forth wildly from his inner world into the outer one, and spoke like a man in a dream. "'Yes, I am Giovanni Gusconti. You are Professor Pietro Baglioni. Now let me pass!' "'Not yet, not yet, Signor Giovanni Gusconti said the professor, smiling, but at the same time scrutinizing the youth with an earnest glance. "'What? Did I grow up side by side with your father? 
and shall his son pass me like a stranger in these old streets of Padua? Stand still, Signor Giovanni, for we must have a word or two before we part. Speedily, then, most worshipful professor, speedily, said Giovanni, with feverish impatience. Does not your worship see that I am in haste? Now, while he was speaking, there came a man in black along the street, stooping and moving feebly, like a person in inferior health. His face was all overspread with a most sickly and sallow hue, but yet so pervaded with an expression of piercing and active intellect that an observer might easily have overlooked the merely physical attributes and have seen only this wonderful energy. As he passed, this person exchanged a cold and distant salutation with Baglioni, but fixed his eyes upon Giovanni with an intentness that seemed to bring out whatever was within him worthy of notice. Nevertheless, there was a peculiar quietness in the look, as if taking merely a speculative, not a human interest, in the young man. "'It is Dr. Rappaccini, whispered the professor when the stranger had passed. "'Has he ever seen your face before?' "'Not that I know,' answered Giovanni, starting at the name. "'He has seen you! He must have seen you!' said Baglioni hastily. "'For some purpose or other this man of science is making a study of you. I know that look of his!' It is the same that coldly illuminates his face as he bends over a bird, or a mouse, or a butterfly, which, in pursuance of some experiment, he has killed by the perfume of a flower, a look as deep as nature itself, but without nature's warmth of love. Signor Giovanni, I will stake my life upon it. You are the subject of one of Rappaccini's experiments. Will you make a fool of me? cried Giovanni passionately. That, Signor Professor, were an untoward experiment. "'Patience, patience!' replied the imperturbable professor. "'I tell thee, my poor Giovanni, that Rappaccini has a scientific interest in thee. Thou hast fallen into fearful hands. And the Signora Beatrice, what part does she act in this mystery?' But Guisconti, finding Baglioni's pertinacity intolerable, here broke away, and was gone before the professor could again seize his arm. He looked after the young man intently and shook his head. "'This must not be.' said Baglioni to himself. The youth is the son of my old friend, and shall not come to any harm from which the arcana of medical science can preserve him. Besides, it is too insufferable an impertinence in Rappaccini thus to snatch the lad out of my own hands, as I may say, and make use of him for his infernal experiments. This daughter of his, it shall be looked to. Perchance, most learned Rappaccini, I may foil you where you little dream of it. Meanwhile, Giovanni had pursued a circuitous route, and at length found himself at the door of his lodgings. As he crossed the threshold, he was met by old Lisabetta, who smirked and smiled, and was evidently desirous to attract his attention, vainly, however, as the ebullition of his feelings had momentarily subsided into a cold and dull vacuity. He turned his eyes full upon the withered face that was puckering itself into a smile, but seemed to behold it not. The old dame, therefore, laid her grasp upon his cloak. "'Signor, signor!' whispered she, still with a smile over the whole breadth of her visage, so that it looked not unlike a grotesque carving in wood, darkened by centuries. "'Listen, signor! There's a private entrance into the garden.' "'What do you say?' exclaimed Giovanni, turning quickly about, as if an inanimate thing should start into feverish life. "'A private entrance into Dr. Rappaccini's garden?' "'Hush, hush, not so loud!' whispered Lisabetta, putting her hand over his mouth. "'Yes, into the worshipful doctor's garden, where you may see all his fine shrubbery. Many a young man in Padua would give gold to be admitted among those flowers.' Giovanni put a piece of gold into her hand. "'Show me the way,' said he. A surmise, probably excited by his conversation with Baglioni, crossed his mind, that this interposition of old Lisabetta might perchance be connected with the intrigue, whatever were its nature, in which the professor seemed to suppose that Dr. Rappaccini was involving him. But such a suspicion, though it disturbed Giovanni, was inadequate to restrain him. The instant that he was aware of the possibility of approaching Beatrice, it seemed an absolute necessity of his existence to do so. It mattered not whether she were angel or demon, he was irrevocably within her sphere, and must obey the law that whirled him onward, in ever-lessening circles, towards a result which he did not attempt to foreshadow, and yet, strange to say, there came across him a sudden doubt whether this intense interest on his part were not delusory, 
whether it were really of so deep and positive a nature as to justify him in now thrusting himself into an incalculable position, whether it were not merely the fantasy of a young man's brain, only slightly, or not at all, connected with his heart. He paused, hesitated, turned half about, but again went on. His withered guide led him along several obscure passages, and finally on did a door through which, as it was opened, there came the sight and sound of rustling leaves, with the broken sunshine glimmering among them. Giovanni stepped forth, and forcing himself through the entanglement of a shrub that wreathed its tendrils over the hidden entrance, stood beneath his own window in the open area of Dr. Rappaccini's garden. How often is it the case that, when impossibilities have come to pass, and dreams have condensed their misty substance into tangible realities, we find ourselves calm and even coldly self-possessed amid circumstances which it would have been a delirium of joy or agony to anticipate. Fate delights to thwart us thus. Passion will choose his own time to rush upon the scene, and lingers sluggishly behind when an appropriate adjustment of events would seem to summon his appearance. So was it now with Giovanni. Day after day his pulses had throbbed with feverish blood at the improbable idea of an interview with Beatrice, and of standing with her face to face in this very garden, basking in the oriental sunshine of her beauty and snatching from her full gaze the mystery which he deemed the riddle of his own existence. But now there was a singular and untimely equanimity within his breast. He threw a glance around the garden to discover if Beatrice or her father were present, and, perceiving that he was alone, began a critical observation of the plants. The aspect of one and all of them dissatisfied him. Their gorgeousness seemed fierce, passionate, and even unnatural. There was hardly an individual shrub which a wanderer, straying by himself through a forest, would not have been startled to find growing wild, as if an unearthly face had glared at him out of the thicket. Several also would have shocked a delicate instinct by an appearance of artificialness indicating that there had been such commixture, and as it were, adultery, of various vegetable species that the production was no longer of God's making, but the monstrous offspring of man's depraved fancy glowing with only an evil mockery of beauty. They were probably the result of experiment, which in one or two cases had succeeded in mingling plants individually lovely into a compound possessing the questionable and ominous character that distinguished the whole growth of the garden. In fine, Giovanni recognized but two or three plants in the collection, and those of a kind that he well knew to be poisonous. While busy with these contemplations, he heard the rustling of a silken garment, and turning, beheld Beatrice emerging from beneath the sculptured portal. Giovanni had not considered with himself what should be his deportment, whether he should apologize for his intrusion into the garden, or assume that he was there with the privity, at least, if not by the desire, of Dr. Rappaccini or his daughter. But Beatrice's manner placed him at his ease, though leaving him still in doubt by what agency he had gained admittance. She came lightly along the path and met him near the broken fountain. There was surprise in her face, but brightened by a simple and kind expression of pleasure. "'You are a connoisseur in flowers, signor,' said Beatrice, with a smile, alluding to the bouquet which he had flung her from the window. "'It is no marvel, therefore, if the sight of my father's rare collection has tempted you to take a nearer view. If he were here, he could tell you many strange and interesting facts as to the nature and habits of these shrubs for he has spent a lifetime in such studies, and this garden is his world. "'And yourself, lady,' observed Giovanni, "'if fame says true, you likewise are deeply skilled in the virtues indicated by these rich blossoms and these spicy perfumes. Would you deign to be my instructress? I should prove an after-scholar and have taught by Signor Rappaccini himself.' "'Are there such idle rumours?' asked Beatrice, with the music of a pleasant laugh. Do people say that I am skilled in my father's science of plants? What a jest is there! No, though I have grown up among these flowers, I know no more of them than their hues and perfume, and sometimes, methinks, I would fain rid myself of even that small knowledge. There are many flowers here, and those not the least brilliant, that shock and offend me when they meet my eye. But pray, signor, do not believe these stories about my science. Believe nothing of me save what you see with your own eyes. 
"'And must, I believe, all that I have seen with my own eyes?' asked Giovanni pointedly, while the recollection of former scenes made him shrink. "'No, signora, you demand too little of me. Bid me believe nothing save what comes from your own lips.' It would appear that Beatrice understood him. There came a deep flush to her cheek, but she looked full into Giovanni's eyes, and responded to his gaze of uneasy suspicion with a queen-like haughtiness. "'I do so bid you, signor,' she replied. "'Forget whatever you may have fancied in regard to me. If true to the outward senses, still it may be false in its essence, but the words of Beatrice Rappaccini's lips are true from the depths of the heart outward.' those you may believe a fervor glowed in her whole aspect and beamed upon giovanni's consciousness like the light of truth itself for while she spoke there was a fragrance in the atmosphere around her rich and delightful though evanescent yet which the young man from an indefinable reluctance scarcely dared to draw into his lungs it might be the odor of the flowers could it be beatrice's breath which thus embalmed her words with a strange richness as if by steeping them in her heart. A faintness passed like a shadow over Giovanni, and flitted away. He seemed to gaze through the beautiful girl's eyes into her transparent soul, and felt no more doubt or fear. The tinge of passion that had colored Beatrice's manner vanished. She became gay, and appeared to derive a pure delight from her communion with the youth, not unlike what the maiden of a lonely island might have felt conversing with a voyager from the civilized world. Evidently her experience of life had been confined within the limits of that garden. She talked now about matters as simple as the daylight or summer clouds, and now asked questions in reference to the city, or Giovanni's distant home, his friends, his mothers, and his sisters, questions indicating such seclusion and such lack of familiarity with modes and forms that Giovanni responded as if to an infant. Her spirit gushed out before him like a fresh rill that was just catching its first glimpse of the sunlight, and wondering at the reflections of earth and sky which were flung into its bosom. There came thoughts, too, from a deep source, and fantasies of a gem-like brilliancy, as if diamonds and rubies sparkled upward among the bubbles of the fountain. Ever and anon there gleamed across the young man's mind a sense of wonder that he should be walking side by side with the beam who had so wrought upon his imagination, whom he had idealized in such hues of terror, and whom he had positively witnessed such manifestations of dreadful attributes, that he should be conversing with Beatrice like a brother, and should find her so human and so maidenlike. But such reflections were only momentary. The effect of her character was too real not to make itself familiar at once. In this free intercourse they had strayed through the garden, and now, after many turns among its avenues, were come to the shattered fountain, beside which grew the magnificent shrub with its treasury of glowing blossoms. A fragrance was diffused from it which Giovanni recognized as identical with that which he had attributed to Beatrice's breath, but incomparably more powerful. As her eyes fell upon it, Giovanni beheld her press her hand to her bosom as if her heart were throbbing suddenly and painfully. For the first time in my life, murmured she, addressing the shrub. I had forgotten thee. I remember, signora, said Giovanni, that you once promised to reward me with one of these living gems for the bouquet which I had the happy boldness to fling to your feet. Permit me now to pluck it as a memorial of this interview. He made a step towards the shrub with extended hand, but Beatrice darted forward, uttering a shriek that went through his heart like a dagger. She caught his hand and drew it back with the whole force of her slender figure. Giovanni felt her touch thrilling through his fibres. "'Touch it not!' exclaimed she, in a voice of agony. "'Not for thy life! It is fatal!' Then, hiding her face, she fled from him and vanished beneath the sculptured portal. As Giovanni followed her with his eyes, he beheld the emaciated figure and pale intelligence of Dr. Rappaccini, who had been watching the scene, he knew not how long, within the shadow of the entrance." No sooner was Gusconti alone in his chamber than the image of Beatrice came back to his passionate musings, invested with all the witchery that had been gathering around it ever since his first glimpse of her, and now likewise imbued with the tender warmth of girlish womanhood. She was human, her nature was endowed with all gentle and feminine qualities. She was worthiest to be worshipped, 
she was capable, surely on her part, of the height and heroism of love. Those tokens which she had hitherto considered as proofs of a frightful peculiarity in her physical and moral system were now either forgotten, or, by the subtle sophistry of passion transmitted into a golden crown of enchantment, rendering Beatrice the more admirable by so much as she was the more unique. Whatever had looked ugly was now beautiful, or, if incapable of such a change, it stole away and hid itself among those shapeless half-ideas which throng the dim region beyond the daylight of our perfect consciousness. Thus did he spend the night, nor fell asleep until the dawn had begun to awake the slumbering flowers in Dr. Rappaccini's garden, whither Giovanni's dreams doubtless led him. Up rose the sun in his due season, and flinging his beams upon the young man's eyelids, awoke him to a sense of pain. When thoroughly aroused, he became sensible of a burning and tingling agony in his hand, in his right hand, the very hand which Beatrice had grasped in her own, when he was on the point of plucking one of the gem-like flowers. On the back of that hand there was now a purple print like that of four small fingers, and the likeness of a slender thumb upon his wrist. Oh, how stubbornly does love, or even that cunning semblance of love which flourishes in the imagination, but strikes no depth of root into the heart. How stubbornly does it hold its faith until the moment comes when it is doomed to vanish into thin mist. Giovanni wrapped a handkerchief about his hand, and wondered what evil thing had stung him, and soon forgot his pain in a reverie of Beatrice. After the first interview, a second was in the inevitable course of what we call fate, a third, a fourth, and a meeting with Beatrice in the garden was no longer an incident in Giovanni's daily life but the whole space in which he might be said to live, for the anticipation and memory of that ecstatic hour made up the remainder. Nor was it otherwise with the daughter of Rappaccini. She watched for the youth's appearance, and flew to his side with confidence as unreserved as if they had been playmates from early infancy, as if they were such playmates still. If, by any unwanted chance, he failed to come at the appointed moment, she stood beneath the window, and sent up the rich sweetness of her tones to float around him in his chamber and echo and reverberate throughout his heart. "'Giovanni! Giovanni! Why tarriest thou? Come down!' And down he hastened into that Eden of poisonous flowers. But, with all this intimate familiarity, there was still a reserve in Beatrice's demeanor, so rigidly and invariably sustained, that the idea of infringing it scarcely occurred to his imagination. By all appreciable signs, they loved. They had looked love with eyes that conveyed the holy secret from the depths of one soul into the depths of the other, as if it were too sacred to be whispered by the way. They had even spoken love in those gushes of passion when their spirits darted forth in articulated breath like tongues of long-hidden flame. And yet there had been no seal of lips no clasp of hands, nor any slightest caress such as love claims and hallows. He had never touched one of the gleaming ringlets of her hair, her garment, so marked was the physical barrier between them, had never been waved against him by a breeze. On the few occasions when Giovanni had seemed tempted to overstep the limit, Beatrice grew so sad, so stern, with all wore such a look of desolate separation, shuddering at itself, that not a spoken word was requisite to repel him. At such times he was startled at the horrible suspicions that rose, monster-like, out of the caverns of his heart, and stared him in the face. His love grew thin and faint as the morning mist, his doubts alone had substance. But, when Beatrice's face brightened again after the momentary shadow, she was transformed at once from the mysterious, questionable being whom he had watched with so much awe and horror. She was now the beautiful and unsophisticated girl whom he felt that his spirit knew with a certainty beyond all other knowledge. A considerable time had now passed since Giovanni's last meeting with Baglioni. One morning, however, he was disagreeably surprised by a visit from the professor, whom he had scarcely thought of for whole weeks, and would willingly have forgotten still longer. Given up as he had long been to a pervading excitement, he could tolerate no companions except upon condition of their perfect sympathy with his present state of feeling. Such sympathy was not to be expected from Professor Baglioni. The visitor chatted carelessly for a few moments about the gossip of the city and the university, and then took up another topic. 
i have been reading an old classic author lately said he and met with a story that strangely interested me possibly you may remember it it is of an indian prince who sent a beautiful woman as a present to alexander the great she was as lovely as the dawn and gorgeous as the sunset but what especially distinguished her was a certain rich perfume in her breath richer than a garden of persian roses alexander as was natural to a youthful conqueror fell in love at first sight with this magnificent stranger but a certain sage physician happening to be present discovered a terrible secret in regard to her and what was that asked giovanni turning his eyes downward to avoid those of the professor that this lovely woman continued baglioni with emphasis had been nourished with poisons from her birth upward until her whole nature was so imbued with them that she herself had become the deadliest poison in existence poison was her element of life with that rich perfume of her breath she blasted the very air her love would have been poison her embrace death is not this a marvellous tale a childish fable answered giovanni nervously starting from his chair i marvel how your worship finds time to read such nonsense among your graver studies by the by said the professor looking on easily about him what singular fragrance is this in your apartment is it the perfume of your gloves it is faint but delicious and yet after all by no means agreeable were i to breathe it long he thinks it would make me ill it is like the breath of a flower but i see no flowers in the chamber nor are there any replied giovanni who had turned pale as the professor spoke nor i think is there any fragrance except in your worship's imagination odors being a sort of element combined of the sensual and the spiritual are apt to deceive us in this manner the recollection of a perfume the bare idea of it may easily be mistaken for a present reality ay but my sober imagination does not often play such tricks said baglioni and were i to fancy any kind of odour it would be that of some vile apothecary drug wherewith my fingers are likely enough to be imbued our worshipful friend rappaccini as i have heard tinctures his medicaments with odours richer than those of araby doubtless likewise the fair and learned signora beatrice would minister to her patients with draughts as sweet as a maiden's breath but woe to him that sips them giovanni's face evinced many contending emotions the tone in which the professor alluded to the pure and lovely daughter of rappaccini was a torture to his soul and yet the intimation of a view of her character opposite to his own gave instantaneous distinctness to a thousand dim suspicions which now grinned at him like so many demons but he strove hard to quell them and to respond to baglioni with a true lover's perfect faith signor professor said he you were my father's friend perchance too it is your purpose to act a friendly part towards his son i would fain feel nothing towards you save respect and deference but i pray you to observe signor that there is one subject on which we must not speak you know not the signora beatrice you cannot therefore estimate the wrong the blasphemy i may even say that is offered to her character by a light or injurious word giovanni my poor giovanni answered the professor with a calm expression of pity i know this wretched girl far better than yourself you shall hear the truth in respect to the poisoner rappaccini and his poisonous daughter yes poisonous as she is beautiful listen for even should you do violence to my gray hairs it shall not silence me that old fable of the indian woman has become a truth by the deep and deadly science of rappaccini and in the person of the lovely beatrice giovanni groaned and hid his face her father continued baglioni was not restrained by natural affection from offering up his child in this horrible manner as the victim of his insane zeal for science for let us do him justice he is as true a man of science as ever distilled his own heart in an alembic what then will be your fate beyond a doubt you are selected as the material of some new experiment perhaps the result is to be death perhaps a fate more awful still rappaccini with what he calls the interest of science before his eyes will hesitate at nothing it is a dream muttered giovanni to himself surely it is a dream but resumed the professor be of good cheer son of my friend it is not too late for the rescue 
possibly we may even succeed in bringing back this miserable child within the limits of ordinary nature from which her father's madness has estranged her behold this little silver vase it was wrought by the hands of the renowned benvenuto cellini and is well worthy to be a love-gift to the fairest dame in italy but its contents are invaluable one little sip of this antidote would have rendered the most virulent poisons of the borgias innocuous doubt not that it will be as efficacious against those of rappuccini bestow the vase and the precious liquid within it on your beatrice and hopefully await the result baglioni laid a small exquisitely wrought silver vial on the table and withdrew leaving what he had said to produce its effect upon the young man's mind you will thwart rappuccini yet thought he chuckling to himself as he descended the stairs but let us confess the truth of him he is a wonderful man a wonderful man indeed a vile empiric however in his practice and therefore not to be tolerated by those who respect the good old rules of the medical profession throughout giovanni's whole acquaintance with beatrice he had occasionally as we have said been haunted by dark surmises as to her character yet so thoroughly had she made herself felt by him as a simple natural most affectionate and guileless creature that the image now held up by professor baglioni looked as strange and incredible as if it were not in accordance with his own original conception true there were ugly recollections connected with his first glimpses of the beautiful girl he could not quite forget the bouquet that withered in her grasp and the insect that perished amid the sunny air by no ostensible agency save the fragrance of her breath these incidents however dissolving in the pure light of her character had no longer the efficacy of facts but were acknowledged as mistaken fantasies by whatever testimony of the senses they might appear to be substantiated there is something truer and more real than what we can see with the eyes and touch with the finger on such better evidence had giovanni founded his confidence in beatrice though rather by the necessary force of her high attributes than by any deep and generous faith on his part but now his spirit was incapable of sustaining itself at the height to which the early enthusiasm of passion had exalted it he fell down grovelling among earthly doubts and defiled therewith the pure whiteness of beatrice's image not that he gave her up he did but distrust he resolved to institute some decisive test that should satisfy him once for all whether there were those dreadful peculiarities in her physical nature which could not be supposed to exist without some corresponding monstrosity of soul his eyes gazing down afar might have deceived him as to the lizard the insect and the flowers but if he could witness at the distance of a few paces the sudden blight of one fresh and healthful flower in beatrice's hand there would be room for no further question with this idea he hastened to the florist's and purchased a bouquet that was still gemmed with the morning dewdrops it was now the customary hour of his daily interview with beatrice before descending into the garden giovanni failed not to look at his figure in the mirror a vanity to be expected in a beautiful young man yet as displaying itself at that troubled and feverish moment the token of a certain shallowness of feeling and insincerity of character he did gaze however and said to himself that his features had never before possessed so rich a grace nor his eyes such vivacity nor his cheeks so warm a hue of superabundant life at least thought he her poison has not yet insinuated itself into my system i am no flower to perish in her grasp with that thought he turned his eyes on the bouquet which he had never once laid aside from his hand a thrill of indefinable horror shot through his frame on perceiving that those dewy flowers were already beginning to droop they wore the aspect of things that had been fresh and lovely yesterday giovanni grew white as marble and stood motionless before the mirror staring at his own reflection there as at the likeness of something frightful he remembered baglioni's remark about the fragrance that seemed to pervade the chamber it must have been the poison in his breath then he shuddered shuddered at himself recovering from his stupor he began to watch with curious eye a spider that was busily at work hanging its web from the antique cornice of the apartment crossing and recrossing the artful system of interwoven lines as vigorous and active a spider as ever dangled from an old ceiling giovanni bent towards the insect and emitted a deep long breath the spider suddenly ceased its toil 
the web vibrated with a tremor originating in the body of the small artisan again giovanni sent forth a breath deeper longer and imbued with a venomous feeling out of his heart he knew not whether he were wicked or only desperate the spider made a convulsive gripe with his limbs and hung dead across the window accursed accursed muttered giovanni addressing himself hast thou grown so poisonous that this deadly insect perishes by thy breath at that moment a rich sweet voice came floating up from the garden giovanni giovanni it is past the hour why tarriest thou come down yes muttered giovanni again she is the only being whom my breath may not slay would that it might he rushed down and in an instant was standing before the bright and loving eyes of beatrice a moment ago his wrath and despair had been so fierce that he could have desired nothing so much as to wither her by a glance but with her actual presence there came influences which had too real an existence to be at once shaken off recollections of the delicate and benign power of her feminine nature which had so often enveloped him in a religious calm recollections of many a holy and passionate outgush of her heart when the pure fountain had been unsealed from its depths and made visible in its transparency to his mental eye recollections which had giovanni known how to estimate them would have assured him that all this ugly mystery was but an earthly illusion and that whatever mist of evil might seem to have gathered over her the real beatrice was a heavenly angel incapable as he was of such high faith still her presence had not utterly lost its magic giovanni's rage was quelled into an aspect of sullen insensibility beatrice with a quick spiritual sense immediately felt that there was a gulf of blackness between them which neither he nor she could pass they walked on together sad and silent and came thus to the marble fountain and to its pool of water on the ground in the midst of which grew the shrub that bore gem-like blossoms giovanni was affrighted at the eager enjoyment the appetite as it were with which he found himself inhaling the fragrance of the flowers beatrice asked he abruptly whence came this shrub my father created it answered she with simplicity created it created it repeated giovanni what mean you beatrice he is a man fearfully acquainted with the secrets of nature replied beatrice and at the hour when i first drew breath this plant sprang from the soil the offspring of his science of his intellect while i was but his earthly child approach it not continued she observing with terror that giovanni was drawing near to the shrub it has qualities that you little dream of but i dearest giovanni i grew up and blossomed with the plant and was nourished with its breath it was my sister and i loved it with a human affection for alas hast thou not suspected it there was an awful doom here giovanni frowned so darkly upon her that beatrice paused and trembled but her faith in his tenderness reassured her and made her blush that she had doubted for an instant there was an awful doom she continued the effect of my father's fatal love of science which estranged me from all society of my kind until heaven sent thee dearest giovanni oh how lonely was thy poor beatrice was it a hard doom asked giovanni fixing his eyes upon her only of late have i known how hard it was answered she tenderly oh yes but my heart was torpid and therefore quiet giovanni's rage broke forth from his sullen gloom like a lightning flash out of a dark cloud accursed one cried he with venomous scorn and anger and finding thy solitude wearisome thou hast severed me likewise from all the warmth of life and enticed me into thy region of unspeakable horror giovanni exclaimed beatrice turning her large bright eyes upon his face the force of his words had not found its way into her mind she was merely thunderstruck yes poisonous thing repeated giovanni beside himself with passion thou hast done it thou hast blasted me thou hast filled my veins with poison thou hast made me as hateful as ugly as loathsome and deadly a creature as thyself a world's wonder of hideous monstrosity now if our breath be happily as fatal to ourselves as to all others let us join our lips in one kiss of unutterable hatred and so die what has befallen me murmured beatrice with a low moan out of her heart holy virgin pity me o poor heart-broken child thou 
dost thou pray cried giovanni still with the same fiendish scorn thy very prayers as they come from thy lips taint the atmosphere with death yes yes let us pray let us to church and dip our fingers in the holy water at the portal they that come after us will perish as by a pestilence let us sign crosses in the air it will be scattering curses abroad in the likeness of holy symbols giovanni said beatrice calmly for her grief was beyond passion why dost thou join thyself with me thus in those terrible words i it is true am the horrible thing thou namest me but thou what hast thou to do save with one other shudder at my hideous misery to go forth out of the garden and mingle with thy race and forget there ever crawled on earth such a monster as poor beatrice dost thou pretend ignorance asked giovanni scowling upon her behold this power have i gained from the pure daughter of rappaccini there was a swarm of summer insects flitting through the air in search of the food promised by the flower odors of the fatal garden they circled round giovanni's head and were evidently attracted towards him by the same influence which had drawn them for an instant within the sphere of several of the shrubs he sent forth a breath among them and smiled bitterly at beatrice as at least a score of the insects fell dead upon the ground i see it i see it shrieked beatrice it is my father's fatal science no no giovanni it was not i never never i dreamed only to love thee and be with thee a little time and so to let thee pass away leaving but thine image in mine heart for giovanni believe it though my body be nourished with poison my spirit is god's creature and craves love as its daily food but my father he has united us in this fearful sympathy he has spurned me tread upon me kill me oh what is death after such words as thine but it was not i not for a world of bliss would i have done it giovanni's passion had exhausted itself in its outburst from his lips there now came across him a sense mournful and not without tenderness of the intimate and peculiar relationship between beatrice and himself they stood as it were in an utter solitude which would be made none the less solitary by the densest throng of human life ought not then the desert of humanity around them to press this insulated pair closer together if they should be cruel to one another who was there to be kind to them besides thought giovanni might there not still be a hope of his returning within the limits of ordinary nature and leading beatrice the redeemed beatrice by the hand o oh, weak and selfish and unworthy spirit that could dream of an earthly union and earthly happiness as possible after such deep love had been so bitterly wronged as was beatrice's love by giovanni's blighting words no no there could be no such hope she must pass heavily with that broken heart across the borders of time she must bathe her hurts in some fount of paradise and forget her grief in the light of immortality and there be well but giovanni did not know it dear beatrice said he approaching her while she shrank away as always at his approach but now with a different impulse dearest beatrice our fate is not yet so desperate behold there is a medicine potent as a wise physician has assured me and almost divine in its efficiency it is composed of ingredients the most opposite to those by which thy awful father has brought this calamity upon thee and me it is distilled of blessed herbs shall we not quaff it together and thus be purified from evil give it me said beatrice extending her hand to receive the little silver vial which giovanni took from his bosom she added with a peculiar emphasis i will drink but do thou await the result she put baglioni's antidote to her lips and at the same moment the figure of rappaccini emerged from the portal and came slowly towards the marble fountain as he drew near the pale man of science seemed to gaze with a triumphant expression at the beautiful youth and maiden as might an artist who should spend his life in achieving a picture or a group of statuary and finally be satisfied with his success he paused his bent form grew erect with conscious power he spread out his hands over them in the attitude of a father imploring a blessing upon his children but those were the same hands that had thrown poison into the stream of their lives giovanni trembled beatrice shuddered nervously and pressed her hand upon her heart my daughter said rappaccini thou art no longer lonely in the world pluck one of those precious gems from thy sister shrub and bid thy bridegroom wear it in his bosom it will not harm him now 
my science and the sympathy between thee and him have so wrought within his system that he now stands apart from common men as thou dost daughter of my pride and triumph from ordinary women pass on then through the world most dear to one another and dreadful to all besides my father said beatrice feebly and still as she spoke she kept her hand upon her heart wherefore didst thou inflict this miserable doom upon thy child miserable exclaimed rappaccini what mean you foolish girl dost thou deem it misery to be endowed with marvellous gifts against which no power nor strength could avail an enemy misery to be able to quell the mightiest with a breath misery to be as terrible as thou art beautiful wouldst thou then have preferred the condition of a weak woman exposed to all evil and capable of none i would fain have been loved not feared murmured beatrice sinking down upon the ground but now it matters not i am going father where the evil which thou hast striven to mingle with my being will pass away dreamlike the fragrance of these poisonous flowers which will no longer taint my breath among the flowers of eden farewell giovanni thy words of hatred are like lead within my heart but they too will fall away as i ascend oh was there not from the first more poison in thy nature than in mine to beatrice so radically had her earthly part been wrought upon by rappaccini's skill as poison had been life so the powerful antidote was death and thus the poor victim of man's ingenuity and of thwarted nature and of the fatality that attends all such efforts of perverted wisdom perished there at the feet of her father and giovanni just at that moment professor pietro baglioni looked forth from the window and called loudly in a tone of triumph mixed with horror to the thunder-stricken man of science rappaccini rappaccini and is this the upshot of your experiment end of rappaccini's daughter by nathaniel hawthorne golden cup and the dish of silver by thomas hood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org everyone knows what a dog's life the miserable jews lead all over the world but especially among the turks who plunder them of their riches and slay them on the most frivolous pretences thus if they acquire any wealth they are obliged to hide it in holes and corners and to snatch their scanty enjoyments by stealth in recompense of the buffets and contumely of their turbaned oppressors in this manner lived yusuf a hebrew of great wealth and wisdom but outwardly a poor beggarly druggist inhabiting with his wife anna one of the meanest houses in constantinople the curse of his nation had often fallen bitterly upon his head his great skill in medicine procuring him some uncertain favour from the turks but on the failure of his remedies a tenfold proportion of ill usage and contempt in such cases a hundred blows on the soles of his feet were his common payment whereas on the happiest cures he was often dismissed with empty hands and some epithet of disgrace as he was sitting one day at his humble door thinking over these miseries a janissary came up to him and commanded yusuf to go with him to his aga or captain whose palace was close at hand yusuf's gold immediately weighed heavy as his heart as the cause of this summons however he rose obediently and followed the soldier to the aga who was sitting cross-legged on a handsome carpet with his long pipe in his mouth the jew casting himself on his knees with his face to the floor began like his brethren to plead poverty in excuse for the shabbiness of his appearance but the aga interrupting him proceeded to compliment him in a flattering strain on his reputation for wisdom which he said had made him desirous of his conversation he then ordered the banquet to be brought in whereupon the slaves put down before them some wine in a golden cup and some pork in a dish of silver 
both of which were forbidden things, and therefore made the Jew wonder very much at such an entertainment. The Aga then, pointing to the refreshments, addressed him as follows. Yusuf, they say you are a very wise and learned man, and have studied deeper than any one the mysteries of nature. I have sent for you, therefore, to resolve me on certain doubts concerning this flesh and this liquor before us. The pork being as abominable to your religion as the wine is unto ours. But I am especially curious to know the reasons why your prophet should have forbidden a meat, which, by report of the Christians, is both savoury and wholesome. Wherefore I will have you proceed first with that argument, and, in order that you may not discuss it negligently, I am resolved, in case you fail to justify the prohibition, that you shall empty the silver dish before you stir from the place. Nevertheless, to show you that I am equally candid, I promise, if you shall thereafter prove to me the unreasonableness of the injunction against wine, I will drink off this golden goblet as frankly before we part. The terrified Jew understood very readily the purpose of this trial. However, after a secret prayer to Moses, he began in the best way he could to plead against the abominable dish that was steaming under his nostrils. He failed, notwithstanding, to convince the sceptical Aga, who, therefore, commanded him to eat up the pork and then begin his discourse in favour of the wine. The sad Jew, at this order, endeavoured to move the obdurate Turk by his tears, but the Aga was resolute, and drawing his crooked scimitar, declared that if Yusuf did not instantly fall to, he would smite his head from his shoulders. It was time, at this threat, for Yusuf to commend his soul unto heaven, for in Turkey the Jews wear their heads very loosely. However, by dint of fresh tears and supplications, he obtained a respite of three days to consider if he could not bring forward any further arguments. As soon as the audience was over, Yusuf returned disconsolately to his house and informed his wife Anna of what had passed between him and the Aga. The poor woman foresaw clearly how the matter would end, for it was aimed only at the confiscation of their riches. She advised Yusuf, therefore, instead of racking his wits for fresh arguments, to carry a bag of gold to the Aga, who condescended to receive his reasons, and after another brief discourse, to grant him a respite of three days longer. In the same manner, Yusuf procured a further interval, but somewhat dearer so that in despair at losing his money at this rate, he returned for the fourth time to the palace. The Aga and Yusuf, being seated as before with the mess of pork and the wine between them, the Turk asked if he had brought any fresh arguments. The doctor replied, alas, he had already discussed the subject so often that his reasons were quite exhausted. Whereupon the flashing scimitar leaping quickly out of its scabbard, the trembling Hebrew plucked the loathsome dish towards him, and with many struggles began to eat. It cost him a thousand wry faces to swallow the first morsel, and from the laughter that came from behind a silken screen, they were observed by more mockers beside the Aga, who took such a cruel pleasure in the amusement of his women that Yusuf was compelled to proceed even to the licking of the dish. He was then suffered to depart, without wasting any logic upon the cup of wine, which after his loathsome meal he would have been quite happy to discuss. I guess not how the Jew consoled himself besides for his involuntary sin, but he bitterly cursed the cruel Aga and all his wives who could not amuse their indolent lives with their dancing girls and tale-tellers, but made merry at the expense of his soul. His wife joined heartily in his imprecations, and both putting ashes on their heads, they mourned and cursed together till the sun set. There came no janissary, however, on the morrow, as they expected, but on the eighth day Yusuf was summoned again to the Aga. The Jew at this message began to weep, 
making sure in his mind that a fresh dish of pork was prepared for him however he repaired obediently to the palace where he was told that the favorite lady of the harem was indisposed and the aga commanded him to prescribe for her now the turks are very jealous of their mistresses and disdain especially to expose them to the eyes of infidels of whom the jews are held the most vile wherefore when yusuf begged to see his patient she was allowed to be brought forth only in a long white veil that reached down to her feet the aga notwithstanding the folly of such a proceeding forbade her veil to be lifted neither would he permit the jew to converse with her but commanded him on pain of death to return home and prepare his medicines the wretched doctor groaning all the way went back to his house without wasting a thought on what drugs he should administer on so hopeless a case but considering instead the surgical practice of the aga which separated so many necks however he told his wife of the new jeopardy he was placed in for the moorish jezebel a curse take her said anna give her a dose of poison and let her perish before his eyes nay answered the jew that will be to pluck the sword down upon our own heads nevertheless i will cheat the infidel's concubine with some wine which is equally damnable to their souls and may god visit upon their conscience the misery they have enforced upon mine in this bitter mood going to a filthy hole in the floor he drew out a flask of shiraz and bestowing as many hebrew curses on the liquor as the mussulmans are wont to utter of blessings over their medicines he filled up some physic bottles and repaired with them to the palace and now let the generous virtues of good wine be duly lauded for the happy sequel the illness of the favorite being merely a languor and melancholy proceeding from the voluptuous indolence of her life the draughts of yusuf soon dissipated her chagrin in such a miraculous manner that she sang and danced more gaily than any of her slaves the aga therefore instead of beheading yusuf returned to him all the purses of gold he had taken to which the grateful lady besides added a valuable ruby and henceforward when she was ill would have none but the jewish physician thus yusuf saved both his head and his money and besides convinced the aga of the virtues of good wine so that the golden cup was finally emptied as well as the dish of silver end of the golden cup and the dish of silver by thomas hood read by Noel Badrian. Widow of Galicia by Thomas Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There lived in the province of Galicia a lady so perfectly beautiful that she was called by travellers and by all indeed who beheld her the flower of spain it too frequently happens that such handsome women are but as beautiful weeds useless or even noxious whereas with her excelling charms she possessed all those virtues which should properly inhabit in so lovely a person she had therefore many wooers but especially a certain old knight of castile bulky in person and with hideously coarse features who as he was exceedingly wealthy made the most tempting offers to induce her to become his mistress and failing in that object by reason of her strict virtue he proposed to espouse her but she despising him as a bad and brutal man which was his character let fall the blessing of her affection on a young gentleman of small estate but good reputation in the province and being speedily married they lived together for three years very happily notwithstanding this the abominable knight did not cease to persecute her till being rudely checked by her husband and threatened with his vengeance he desisted for a season 
it happened at the end of the third year of their marriage that her husband being unhappily murdered on his return from madrid whither he had been called by a lawsuit she was left without protection and from the failure of the cause much straitened besides in her means of living this time therefore the knight thought favourable to renew his importunities and neither respecting the sacredness of her grief nor her forlorn state he molested her so continually that if it had not been for the love of her fatherless child she would have been content to die for if the knight was odious before he was now thrice hateful from his undisguised brutality and above all execrable in her eyes from a suspicion that he had procured the assassination of her dear husband she was obliged however to confine this belief to her own bosom for her persecutor was rich and powerful and wanted not the means and scarcely the will to crush her many families had thus suffered by his malignity and therefore she only awaited the arrangement of certain private affairs to withdraw secretly with her scanty maintenance into some remote village there she hoped to be free from her inhuman suitor but she was delivered from this trouble in the meantime by his death yet in so terrible a manner as made it more grievous to her than his life had ever been it wanted at this event but a few days of the time when the lady proposed to remove to her country lodging taking with her a maid who was called maria for since the reduction of her fortune she had retained but this one servant now it happened that this woman going one day to her lady's closet which was in her bedchamber so soon as she had opened the door there tumbled forward the dead body of a man and the police being summoned by her shrieks they soon recognized the corpse to be that of the old castilian knight though the countenance was so blackened and disfigured as to seem scarcely human it was sufficiently evident that he had perished by poison whereupon the unhappy lady being interrogated was unable to give any account of the matter and in spite of her fair reputation and although she appealed to god in behalf of her innocence she was thrown into the common jail along with other reputed murderers the criminal addresses of the deceased knight being generally known many persons who believed in her guilt still pitied her and excused the cruelty of the deed on account of the persecution she had suffered from that wicked man but these were the most charitable of her judges the violent death of her husband which before had been only attributed to robbers was now assigned by scandalous persons to her own act and the whole province was shocked that a lady of her fair seeming and of such unblemished character should have brought so heavy a disgrace upon her sex and upon human nature at her trial therefore the court was crowded to excess and some few generous persons were not without a hope of her acquittal but the same facts as before being proved upon oath and the lady still producing no justification but only asserting her innocence there remained no reasonable cause for doubting of her guilt the public advocate then began to plead as his painful duty commanded him for her condemnation he urged the facts of her acquaintance and bad terms with the murdered knight and moreover certain expressions of hatred which she had been heard to utter against him the very scene and manner of his destruction he said spoke to her undoubted prejudice the first a private closet in her own bedchamber and the last by poison which was likely to be employed by a woman rather than any weapon of violence afterwards he interpreted to the same conclusion the abrupt flight of the waiting maid who like a guilty and fearful accomplice had disappeared whenever her mistress was arrested and finally he recalled the still mysterious fate of her late husband so that all who heard him began to bend their brows solemnly and some reproachfully on the unhappy object of his discourse still she upheld herself firmly and calmly only from time to time lifting her eyes towards heaven 
but when she heard the death of her dear husband touched upon and in a manner that laid his blood to her charge she stood forward and placing her right hand on the head of her son cried so witness god if ever i shed his father's blood so may this his dear child shed mine in vengeance then sinking down from exhaustion and the child weeping bitterly over her the beholders were again touched with compassion almost to the doubting of her guilt but the evidence being so strong against her she was immediately condemned by the court it was the custom in those days for a woman who had committed murder to be first strangled by the hangman and then burnt to ashes in the midst of the market-place but before this horrible sentence could be pronounced on the lady a fresh witness was moved by the grace of god to come forward in her behalf this was the waiting woman maria who hitherto had remained disguised in the body of the court but now being touched with remorse at her lady's unmerited distresses she stood up on one of the benches and called out earnestly to be allowed to make her confession she then related that she herself had been prevailed upon by several great sums of money and still more by the artful and seducing promises of the dead knight to secrete him in a closet in her lady's chamber but that of the cause of his death she knew nothing except that upon a shelf she had placed some sweet cakes mixed with arsenic to poison the rats and that the knight being rather gluttonous might have eaten of them in the dark and so died at this probable explanation the people all shouted one shout and the lady's innocence being acknowledged the sentence was ordered to be reversed but she reviving a little at the noise and being told of this providence only clasped her hands and then in a few words commending her son to the guardianship of good men and saying that she could never survive the shame of her unworthy reproach she ended with a deep sigh and expired upon the spot end of the widow of galicia by thomas hood read by noel badrian message by ambrose Bierce. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a wireless message in the summer of 1896 mr william holt a wealthy manufacturer of chicago was living temporarily in a little town of central new york the name of which the writer's memory has not retained. Mr. Holt had had trouble with his wife, from whom he had parted a year before. Whether the trouble was anything more serious than an incompatibility of temper, he is probably the only living person that knows. He is not addicted to the vice of confidences. Yet he has related the incident herein set down to at least one person without exacting a pledge of secrecy. He is now living in Europe. One evening he had left the house of a brother whom he was visiting for a stroll in the country. It may be assumed, whatever the value of the assumption in connection with what is said to have occurred, that his mind was occupied with reflections on his domestic infelicities and the distressing changes that they had wrought in his life. Whatever may have been his thoughts, they so possessed him that he observed neither the lapse of time nor whither his feet were carrying him. He knew only that he passed far beyond the town limits, and was traversing a lonely region by a road that bore no resemblance to the one by which he had left the village. In brief, he was lost. Realizing his mischance, he smiled. Central New York is not a region of perils nor does one long remain lost in it. He turned about and went back the way he had come. Before he had gone far, he observed that the landscape was growing more distinct, was brightening. Everything was suffused with a soft red glow in which he saw his shadow projected in the road before him. The moon is rising, he said to himself. Then he remembered that it was about the time of the new moon, and if that tricksy orb was in one of its stages of visibility. It had set long before. 
He stopped and faced about, seeking the source of the rapidly broadening light. As he did so, his shadow turned and lay along the road in front of him, as before. The light still came from behind him. That was surprising. He could not understand. Again he turned, and again facing successively to every point of the horizon. Always the shadow was before. Always the light behind. A still and awful red. Holt was astonished. Dumbfounded is the word that he used in telling it, yet seems to have retained a certain intelligent curiosity. To test the intensity of the light whose nature and cause he could not determine, he took out his watch to see if he could make out the figures on the dial. They were plainly visible, and the hands indicated the hour of eleven o'clock and twenty-five minutes. At that moment, the mysterious illumination suddenly flared to an intense and almost blinding splendour, flushing the entire sky, extinguishing the stars, and throwing the monstrous shadow of himself athwart the landscape. In that unearthly illumination, he saw near him, but apparently in the air at a considerable elevation, the figure of his wife, clad in her night clothing, and holding to her breast the figure of his child. Her eyes were fixed upon his, with an expression which he afterward professed himself unable to name or describe. Further than that, it was not of this life. The flare was momentary, followed by black darkness, in which, however, the apparition still showed white and motionless. Then, by insensible degrees, it faded and vanished, like a bright image on the retina after the closing of the eyes. A peculiarity of the apparition, hardly noted at the time, but afterward recalled, was that it showed only the upper half of the woman's figure. Nothing was seen below the waist. The sudden darkness was comparative, not absolute, for gradually all objects of his environment became again visible. In the dawn of the morning, Holt found himself entering the village at a point opposite to that at which he had left it. He soon arrived at the house of his brother, who hardly knew him. He was wild-eyed, haggard, and grey as a rat. Almost incoherently, he related his night's experience. "'Go to bed, my poor fellow,' said his brother, "'and wait. We shall hear more of this.' An hour later came the predestined telegram. Holt's dwelling in one of the suburbs of Chicago had been destroyed by fire. Her escape cut off by the flames, his wife had appeared at an upper window, her child in her arms. There she had stood, motionless, apparently dazed. Just as the fireman had arrived with a ladder, the floor had given way, and she was seen no more. The moment of this culminating horror was eleven o'clock and twenty-five minutes, standard time. End of A Wireless Message by Ambrose Bierce Read by Lynn Thompson Hydrophobic Skunk by Irvin S. Cobb This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hydrophobic Skunk The Hydrophobic Skunk resides in the extreme bottom of the Grand Canyon, and, next to a Southern Republican who never asked for a federal office, is the rarest of living creatures. He is so rare that nobody ever saw him, that is, nobody except a native. I met plenty of tourists who had seen people who had seen him, but never a tourist who had seen him with his own eyes. In addition to being rare, he is highly gifted. I think almost anybody would agree with me that the common, ordinary skunk has been the most richly dowered by nature. To adorn a skunk with any extra qualifications seems as great a waste of the raw material as painting the lily or gilding refined gold. He is already amply equipped for outdoor pursuits. Nobody intentionally shoves him around. Everybody gives him as much room as he seems to need. He commands respect, nay, more than that, respect and veneration, wherever he goes. J. 
joy riders never run him down and foot passengers avoid crowding him into a corner you would think nature had done amply well by the skunk but no the hydrophobic skunk comes along and upsets all these calculations besides carrying the travelling credentials of an ordinary skunk he is rabid in the most rabidissimus form he is not mad just part of the time like one's relatives by marriage and not mad most of the time like an old-fashioned railroad ticket agent but mad all the time incurably enthusiastically and unanimously mad he is mad and he is glad of it we made the acquaintance of the hydrophobic skunk when we rode down hermit trail the casual visitor to the grand canyon first of all takes the rim drive then he essays bright angel trail which is sufficiently scary for his purposes until he gets used to it and after that he grows more adventurous and tackles hermit trail which is a marvel of corkscrew convolutions gimleting its way down this red abdominal wound of a canyon to the very gizzard of the world here johnny our guide felt moved to speech and we hearkened to his words and hungered for more for Johnny knows the ranges of the Northwest as a city dweller knows his own little side street. In the fall of the year, Johnny comes down to the canyon and serves as a guide a while, and then, when he gets so he just can't stand associating with tourists any longer, he packs his war bags and journeys back to the northern range and enjoys the company of cows a spell. Cows are not exactly exciting, but they don't ask full questions. A highly competent young person is Johnny. And a cow puncher of parts most of the canyon guides are cow punchers accomplished ones too and of high standing in the profession with a touch of reverence johnny pointed out to us sam scovel the greatest bronco buster of his time now engaged in piloting tourists can he ride echoed johnny in answer to our question scovel could ride an earthquake if she stood still long enough for him to mount he rode steamboat, not young steamboat, but old steamboat. He rode rocking chair, and he's the only man that ever did that and was not called on in a couple of days to attend his own funeral. We went on and on at a lazy mule trot, hearing the unwritten annals of the range from one who had seen them enacted at first hand. Pretty soon we passed a herd of burrows with mealy, dusty noses and spotty hides, feeding on prickly pears with rock lichens, and just before sunset we slid down the last declivity out upon the plateau and came to a camp as was a camp this was roughing it deluxe with the most deluxey vengeance here were three tents or rather three canvas houses with wooden half walls and they were spick and span inside and out and had glass windows in them and doors and matched wooden floors the mess tent was provided with a table and a clean cloth to go over it and there were china dishes and china cups and shiny knives forks and spoons bill was in charge of the camp a dark rangy good-looking leading man of a cowboy wearing his blue shirt and his red neckerchief with an air that johnny certainly could cook served on china dishes upon a cloth covered table we had mounds of fried steaks and shoals of fried bacon and a bushel more or less of shepherd potatoes and green peas and sliced peaches out of cans and sourdough biscuits as light as kisses and much more filling and fresh butter and fresh milk and coffee as black as your hat and strong as sin how easy it is for civilized man to become primitive and comfortable in his way of eating especially if he has just ridden ten miles on a buckboard and nine more on a mule and is away down at the bottom of the grand canyon and there is nobody to look on disapprovingly when he takes a bite that would be a credit to a steam shovel despite all reports to the contrary i wish to state that it is no trouble at all to eat green peas off a knife blade you merely mix them in with potatoes for a cement and fried steak take it from an old steak eater tastes best when eaten with those tools of nature's own providing both hands and your teeth an hour passed busy yet pleasant and we were both gorged to the girls and had reared back with our cigars lit to enjoy a third jorum of black coffee apiece when johnny speaking in an off-hand way to bill who was still hiding away biscuits inside of himself like a parlor prestigitator said 
seen any of those old hydrophobies the last day or two not so many said bill casually there was a couple out last night pirating around in the moonlight i reckon though there'll be quite a flock of em out tonight a new moon always seems to fetch em up from the river both of us quit blowing on our coffee and we put the cups down i think i was the one who spoke i beg your pardon i asked but what did you say would be out tonight we were just speaking to one another about those hydrophoby skunks said bill apologetically this here canyon is where they mostly hang out and frolic round i laid down my cigar too i admit i was interested oh i said softly like that is it do they yes said johnny i reckon there's liable to be one come shoving his old nose into that door any minute or probably two they mostly travel in pairs sets as you might say you'd know one the minute you saw him though said bill they're smaller than a regular skunk and spotted where the other kind of is striped and they got little red eyes you won't have no trouble at all recognizing one it was at this juncture that we both got up and moved back by the stove it was warmer there and the chill of evening seemed to be settling down noticeably funny thing about hydrophoby skunks went on johnny after a moment of pensive thought mad you know what makes them mad the two of us asked the question together born that way explained bill mad from the start and won't never do nothing to get shut of it ahem they never attack humans i suppose don't they said johnny as if surprised at such ignorance why humans is their favorite pastime humans is just pie to a hydrophoby skunk it ain't really fun to be bit by a hydrophoby skunk neither he raised his coffee cup to his lips and imbibed deeply which you certainly said something then johnny stated bill you see he went on turning to us they aim to catch you asleep and they creep up right soft and take hold of you take hold of a year usually and clamp their teeth and just hang on for further orders some says they hang on till it thunders same as snapping turtles but that's the lie i judge because there's weeks on a stretch down here when it don't thunder all the cases i ever heard of they let go at sun-up it is right painful at the time said johnny taking up the thread of the narrative and then in nine days you go mad yourself remember that fellow the hydrophoby skunk bit down here by the rapids bill let's see now what was that hombre's name williams supplied bill heck williams i saw him at flagstaff when they took him there to the hospital that guy certainly did carry on regardless first he went mad and his eyes turned red and he got so he didn't have no real use for water well then prospectors don't never care much about water anyway and then he got to snapping and biting and foaming so they had to strap him down to his bed he got loose though broke loose i suppose i said no he bit loose said bill with the air of one who would not deceive you even in a matter of small details do you mean to say he bit those leather straps in two no sir he couldn't reach them explained bill so he bit the bed in two not in one bite of course he went on it took him several i saw him after he was laid out he really wasn't no credit to himself as a corpse I'm not sure but I think my companion and I were holding hands by now outside we could hear that little lost echo laughing to itself it was no time to be laughing either under certain circumstances I don't know of a lonelier place anywhere on earth than that Grand Canyon presently my friend spoke and it seemed to me his voice was a mite husky well he had a bad cold you said they mostly attack persons who are sleeping out didn't you that's right too said johnny and bill nodded in affirmation then of course since we sleep indoors everything will be all right i put in well yes and no answered johnny in the early part of the evening a hydrophoby is liable to do a lot of prowling round outdoors but toward morning they like to get into camps they dig under the side walls or come up through the floor and they seem to prefer to get in bed with you they're cold-blooded i reckon same as rattlesnakes cool nights always do drive them in seems like it's going to be a sort of coolish night tonight said bill casually it certainly was i don't remember chillier night in years my teeth were chattering a little from cold 
before we turned in i retired with all my clothes on including my boots and leggings and i wished i had brought along my earmuffs i also buttoned my watch into my left-hand shirt pocket the idea being if for any reason i should conclude to move during the night i would be fully equipped for travelling the door would not stay closely shut the door jamb had sagged a little and the wind kept blowing the door ajar but after a while we dozed off it was one twenty seven a m when i woke with a violent start i know this was the exact time because that was when my watch stopped i peered about me in the darkness the door was wide open i could tell that down on the floor there was a dragging scuffling sound and from almost beneath me a pair of small red eyes peered up phosphorescently he's here i said to my companion as i emerged from my blankets and he waking instantly seemed instinctively to know whom i meant i used to wonder at the ease with which a cockroach can climb a perfectly smooth wall and run across the ceiling i know now that to do this is the easiest thing in the world if you have the proper incentive behind you i had gone up one wall of the tent and crossed over and was in the act of coming down the other side when bill burst in his eyes blurred with sleep a lighted lamp in one hand and a gun in the other i never was so disappointed in my life because it wasn't a hydrophobic skunk at all it was a pack rat sometimes called a trade rat paying us a visit the pack or trade rat is also a denizen of the grand canyon he is about four times as big as an ordinary rat and has an appetite to correspond he sometimes invades your camp and makes free with your things but he never steals anything outright he merely trades with you hence his name he totes off a side of meat or a bushel of meal and brings a cactus stalk in or he will confiscate your saddlebag and leave you in exchange a nice dry chip he is honest but from what i can gather he never gets badly stuck on a deal next morning at breakfast johnny and bill were doing a lot of laughing between them over something or other end of the hydrophobic skunk by irvin s cobb read by lynn thompson by stuart edward white this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson the old virginia by stuart edward white the ring around the sun had thickened all day long and the turquoise blue of the arizona sky had filmed storms in the dry countries are infrequent but heavy and this surely meant storm we had ridden since sun-up over broad mesas down and out of deep canyons along the base of the mountains in the wildest parts of the territory the cattle were winding leisurely toward the high country the jack-rabbits had disappeared the quail lacked we did not see a single antelope in the open it's a case of hold-up the cattleman ventured his opinion i have a ranch over in the double r charlie and windy bill hold it down we'll tackle it what do you think the four cowboys agreed we dropped into a low broad watercourse ascended its bed to big cottonwoods and flowing water followed it into box canyons between rim rock carved fantastically and painted like a moorish facade until at last in a widening below a rounded hill we came upon an adobe house a fruit tree and a round corral this was the double r charlie and windy bill welcomed us with soda biscuits we turned our horses out spread our beds on the floor filled our pipes and squatted on our heels various dogs of various breeds investigated us it was very pleasant and we did not mind the ring around the sun somebody else is coming announced the cattleman finally uncle jim said charlie after a glance a hawk-faced old man with a long white beard and long white hair rode out from the cottonwoods he had on a battered broad hat abnormally high of crown carried across his saddle a heavy eight square rifle and was followed by a half dozen lolloping hounds the largest and fiercest of the latter catching sight of our group 
launched himself with lightning rapidity at the biggest of the ranch dogs promptly nailed that canine by the back of the neck shook him violently a score of times flung him aside and pounced on the next during the ensuing few moments that hound was the busiest thing in the west he satisfactorily whipped four dogs pursued two cats up a tree upset the dutch oven and the rest of the soda biscuits stampeded the horses and raised a cloud of dust adequate to represent the smoke of battle we others were too paralyzed to move uncle jim sat placidly on his white horse his thin knees bent over the oxbow stirrups smoking in ten seconds the trouble was over principally because there was no more trouble to make the hound returned leisurely licking from his chops the hair of his victims uncle jim shook his head trailer he said sadly is a little severe we agreed heartily and turned in to welcome uncle jim with a fresh batch of soda biscuits the old man was one of the typical long hairs he had come from the galliuro mountains in 69 and since 69 he had remained in the galliuro mountains spite of man or the devil at present he possessed some hundreds of cattle which he was reputed to water in a dry season from an ordinary dishpan. In times past, he had prospected. That evening, the severe trailer having dropped to slumber, he held forth on big game hunting and dogs, quartz claims and Apaches. Did you ever have any close calls? I asked. He ruminated a few moments, refilled his pipe with some awful tobacco, and told the following experience. In the time of Geronimo, I was living just about where I do now, and that was just about in line with the raiding. You see, Geronimo and Jew and Old Loco used to pile out of the reservation at Camp Apache, raid south to the line, slip over into Mexico when the soldiers got too promiscuous, and raid there until they got ready to come back. Then there was always a big medicine talk. Says Geronimo, I am tired of the warpath. I will come back from Mexico with all my warriors, if you will escort me with soldiers and protect my people. All right, said the general, being only too glad to get him back at all. So then, in ten minutes, there wouldn't be a buck in camp. But next morning they shows up again, each with about fifty head of hosses. Where'd you get those hosses? asked the general, suspicious. Had em pastured in the hills, answered Geronimo. I can't take all those hosses with me. I believe they're stolen, said the general. My people cannot go without their hosses, says Geronimo. So across the line they goes, and back to the reservation. In about a week, there's fifty-two frantic greasers wanting to know where's their hosses. The army is nothing but an importer of stolen stock, and knows it, and can't help it. Well, as I says, I'm between Camp Apache and the mexican line so that every raiding party goes right on past me the point is that i'm a thousand feet or so above the valley and the renegades is in such a hurry about that time that they never stop to climb up and collect me often i've watched them trailing down the valley in a cloud of dust then in a day or two a squad of soldiers would come up and camp at my spring for a while they used to send soldiers to guard every water hole in the country so the renegades couldn't get water after a while, from not being bothered none, I got to thinking I wasn't worth while to them. Me and Johnny Hooper were pecking away at the old Virginia mine then. We got down about sixty feet, all timbered, and was thinking of cross-cutting. One day Johnny went to town, and that same day I got in a hurry and left my gun at camp. I worked all the morning down at the bottom of the shaft, and when I see by the sun it was getting along towards noon, I put in three good shots, tamped them down, lit the fuses, and started to climb out. It ain't no ways pleasant to light a fuse in a shaft and then have to climb about a fifty-foot ladder with it burning behind you. I never did get used to it. You keep thinking, now suppose there's a flaw in that fuse or something, and she goes off in six seconds instead of two minutes. Where'll you be then? It would give you a good boost towards your home on high anyway. So I climbed fast, and stuck my head out the top without looking, and then I froze solid enough. There, about fifty feet away, climbing up the hill on mighty tired hosses, was a dozen of the ugliest Chiricahuas you ever don't want to meet, and in addition a Mexican renegade named Maria, who was worse than any of them. 
I see at once their hosses was tired out, and they had a notion of camping at my waterhole, not knowing nothing about the old Virginia mine. For two bits I'd have let go all halts and dropped backwards, trusting to my thick head for easy lighting. Then I heard a little fizz and sputter from below. At that my hair riz right up so I could feel the breeze below under my hat. For about six seconds I stood there, like an imbecile, grinning amiably. Then one of the cheery cowers made a sort of grunt, and I said that they'd seen the original exhibit your Uncle Jim was making of himself. Then that fuse gave another sputter, and one of the Apaches said, Unda! That means white man. It was harder to turn my head than if I'd had a stiff neck, but I managed to do it, and I see that my oar dump wasn't more than ten foot away. I mighty near overjumped it, and the next I knew I was on one side of it and those Apaches on the other. Probably I flew, leastways I don't seem to remember jumping. That didn't seem to do me much good. The renegades were grinning and laughing to think how easy a thing they had, and I couldn't rightly think up any arguments against the notion, at least from their standpoint. They were chattering away to each other in Mexican for the benefit of Maria, or they had me all distributed down to my suspender buttons, and me squatting behind that ore dump about as formidable as a brush rabbit. Then, all at once, one of my shots went off down in the shaft. Boom, says she, plenty big and a slather of rocks and stones came out of the mouth and began to dump down promiscuous on the scenery. I got one little one in the shoulder blade and found time to wish my ore dump had a roof. And those renegades caught it square in the thick of trouble. One got knocked out entirely for a minute by a nice piece of country rock in the head. Otra vez, yells I, which means again. Boom, goes the old Virginia, prompt as an answer. I put in my time dodging, but when I gets a chance to look, the Apaches has all got to cover and is looking scared. Otra vez, yells I again. Boom, says the old Virginia. This was the biggest shot of the lot, and she surely cut loose. I ought to have been halfway up the hill watching things from a safe distance, but I wasn't. Lucky for me, the shaft was a little on the drift, so she didn't quite shoot my way. But she distributed about a ton over those renegades. They sort of half got to their feet uncertain. Otra vez, yells I once more, as bold as if I could keep her shooting all day. It was just a cold, raw blazer, and if I didn't go through, I could see me as an Apache parlor ornament. But it did. Those Chiricahuas gave one yell and skipped, and it was surely a funny sight, after they got aboard their war ponies, to see them trying to dig out on horses too tired to trot. I didn't stop to get all the laughs, though. In fact, I give one jump off that ledge, and I lit a running. A quarter hoss couldn't have beat me to that shack. There I grabbed my good old gun and meat in the pot, and made a climb for the tall country. Uncle Jim stopped with an air of finality and began lazily to refill his pipe. From the open mud fireplace he picked a coal. Outside the rain, faithful to the prophecy of the wide-ringed sun, beat fitfully against the roof that was the closest call i ever had he said at last end of the old virginia by stuart edward white recording by lynn thompson the million dollar freight train by frank h spearman this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was the second month of the strike, and not a pound of freight had been moved. Things did look smoky on the West End. The general superintendent happened to be with us when the news came. You can't handle it, boys, said he nervously. What you better do is turn it over to the Columbian Pacific. Our contracting freight agent on the coast at that time was a fellow so erratic that he was nicknamed Crazy Horse. Right in the midst of the strike, Crazy Horse wired that he had secured a big silk shipment for New York. We were paralyzed. We had no engineers, no firemen, and no motive power to speak of. The strikers were pounding our men. 
wrecking our trains, and giving us the worst of it generally, that is, when we couldn't give it to them. Why the fellow displayed his activity at that particular juncture still remains a mystery. Perhaps he had a grudge against the road. If so, he took an artful revenge. Everybody on the system with ordinary railroad sense knew that our struggle was to keep clear of the freight business until we got rid of our strike. Anything valuable or perishable was especially unwelcome. But the stuff was docked and loaded and consigned in our care before we knew it. After that, a refusal to carry it would be like hoisting the white flag, and that is something which never yet flew over the West End. Turn it over to the Columbian, said the general superintendent, but the general superintendent was not looked up to on our division. He hadn't enough sand. Our head was a fighter, and he gave tone to every man under him. No, he thundered, bringing down his fist. Not in a thousand years. We'll move it ourselves. Wire Montgomery, the general manager, that we will take care of it and wire him to fire Crazy Horse and to do it right off. And before the silk was turned over to us, Crazy Horse was looking for another job. It is the only case on record where a freight hustler was discharged for getting business. There were 12 carloads. It was insured for $85,000 a car. You can figure how far the title is wrong, but you can never estimate the worry the stuff gave us. It looked as big as $12 million worth. In fact, one scrub car link with the glory of the West End at heart had a fight over the amount with a skeptical hostler. He maintained that the actual money value was a hundred and twenty millions, but I give you the figures just as they went over the wire, and they are right. What bothered us most was that the strikers had the tip almost as soon as we had it. Having friends on every road in the country, they knew as much about our business as we ourselves. The minute it was announced that we should move the silk, they were after us. It was a defiance, a last one. If we could move freight, for we were already moving passengers after a fashion, the strike might be well accounted beaten. Stewart, the leader of the local contingent, together with his followers, got after me at once. You don't show much sense, Reed, said he. You fellows here are breaking your necks to get things moving, and when this strike is over, if our boys ask for your discharge, they'll get it. This road can't run without our engineers. We're going to beat you. If you dare try to move this silk, we'll have your scalp when it's over. You'll never get your silk to Zanesville. I'll promise you that. And if you ditch it and make a million dollar loss, you'll get let out anyway, my buck. I'm here to obey orders, Stuart, said I. What was the use of more? I felt uncomfortable, but we had determined to move the silk. There was no more to be said. When I went over to the roundhouse and told neighbor the decision, he said never a word, but he looked a great deal. Neighbor's task was to supply the motive power. All that we had, uncrippled, was in the passenger service, because passengers should be taken care of first of all. In order to win a strike, you must have public opinion on your side. Nevertheless, neighbor, said I, after we had talked a while, we must move the silk also. Neighbor studied. Then he roared at his foreman. Send Bartholomew Mullen here. He spoke with a decision that made me think the business was done. I had never happened, it is true, to hear of Bartholomew Mullen in the Department of Motive Power, but the impression the name gave me was of a monstrous fellow, big as neighbor, or old man Sankey, or Dad Hamilton. I'll put Bartholomew ahead of it, said neighbor tightly. I saw a boy walk into the office. Mr. Garden said you wanted to see me, sir, said he, addressing the master mechanic. I do, Bartholomew, responded neighbor. The figure in my mind's eye shrunk in a twinkling. Then it occurred to me that it must be this boy's father who was wanted. You have been begging for a chance to take out an engine, Bartholomew, began neighbor coldly and I knew it was on. Yes, sir. You want to get killed, Bartholomew. Bartholomew smiled as if the idea was not altogether displeasing. How would you like to go pilot tomorrow for McCurdy? You to take the 44 and run as first 78. McCurdy will run as second 78. I know I could run an engine all right, ventured Bartholomew, 
as if neighbor were the only one taking the chances in giving him an engine. I know the track from here to Zanesville. I helped McNeff fire one week. Then go home and go to bed, and be over here at six o'clock tomorrow morning, and sleep sound, for it may be your last chance. It was plain that the master mechanic hated to do it. It was simply sheer necessity. He's a wiper, mused neighbor, as Bartholomew walked springily away. I took him in here sweeping two years ago. He ought to be firing now, but the union held him back. That's why he don't like them. He knows more about an engine now than half the lodge. They'd better have let him in, said the master mechanic grimly. He may be the means of breaking their backs yet. If I give him an engine and he runs it, I'll never take him off, union or no union, strike or no strike. How old is that boy, I asked. Eighteen, and never a kith or a kin that I know of. Bartholomew Mullen, mused neighbor, as the slight figure moved across the flat. Big name, small boy. Well, Bartholomew, you know something more about tomorrow night about running an engine, or a whole lot less. That's as it happens. If he gets killed, it's your fault, Reed. He meant that I was calling on him for men when he couldn't supply them. I heard once, he went on, about a fellow named Bartholomew being mixed up in a massacre. But I take it he must have been an older man than our Bartholomew, nor his other name wasn't Mullen, neither. I disremember just what it was, but it wasn't Mullen. Well, don't say I want to get the boy killed, neighbor, I protested. I've got plenty to answer for. I'm here to run trains. When there are any to run, that's murder enough for me. You needn't send Bartholomew out on my account. Give him a slow schedule, and I'll give him orders to jump early. That's all we can do. If the strikers don't ditch him, he'll get through somehow. It stuck in my crop, the idea of putting that boy on a pilot engine to take all the dangers ahead of that particular train. But I had a good deal else to think of besides. From the minute the silk got into the McLeod yards, we posted double guards around. About twelve o'clock that night, we held a council of war, which ended in our running the train into the out freight house. The result was that by morning we had a new train made up. It consisted of fourteen refrigerator cars loaded with oranges, which had come in mysteriously the night before. It was announced that the silk would be held for the present and the oranges rushed through at once. Bright and early, the refrigerator train was run down to the ice houses, and twenty men were put to work icing the oranges. At seven o'clock, McCurdy pulled in the local passenger with engine 105. Our plan was to cancel the load and run him right out with the oranges. When he got in, he reported that the 105 had sprung a tire. This threw us out entirely. There was a hurried conference in the roundhouse. What can you do? asked the superintendent in desperation. There's only one thing I can do. Put Bartholomew Mullen on it with the 44 and put McCurdy to bed for the number two tonight, responded neighbor. I looked into the locomotive stalls. The first, the only man in sight, was Bartholomew Mullen. He was very busy polishing the 44. He had good steam on her, and the old tub was wheezing away as if she had the asthma. The 44 was old. She was homely. She was rickety. But Bartholomew Mullen wiped her battered nose as deferentially as if she had been a spick span, spider driver, tail truck mail racer. She wasn't much, the 44. But in those days, Bartholomew wasn't much, and the 44 was Bartholomew's. How was she steaming, Bartholomew? I sang out. He was right in the middle of her. Looking up, he fingered his waist modestly and blushed through a dab of crude petroleum over his eye. Hundred and thirty pounds, sir. She's a terrible free steamer. The old 44. I'm all ready to run her out. Who's marked up to fire for you, Bartholomew? Bartholomew Mullen looked at me fraternally. Neighbor couldn't give me anybody but a wiper, sir, said Bartholomew in a sort of a wouldn't that kill you tone. The unconscious arrogance of the boy quite knocked me. So soon had honors changed his point of view. Last night a despised wiper, at daybreak an engineer, and his nose in the air at the idea of taking on a wiper for firemen, and all so innocent. Would you object, Bartholomew, I suggested gently, to a train master for firemen? I don't think so, sir. 
Thank you, because I am going down to Zanesville this morning myself, and I thought I'd ride with you. Is that all right? Oh, yes, sir, if neighbor doesn't care. I smiled. He didn't know whom neighbor took orders from, but he thought, evidently, not from me. Then run her down to the oranges, Bartholomew, and couple on, and we'll order ourselves out, see? The 44 looked like a baby carriage when we got her in front of the refrigerators. However, after the necessary preliminaries, we gave a very sporty toot and pulled out. In a few minutes, we were sailing down the valley. For fifty miles we bobbed along with our cargo of iced silk as easy as old shoes, for I need hardly explain that we had packed the silk into the refrigerators to confuse the strikers. The great risk was that they would try to ditch us. I was watching the track as a mouse would a cat, looking every minute for trouble. We cleared the gumbo cut west of the beaver at a pretty good clip in order to make the grade on the other side. The bridge there is hidden in summer by a grove of hackberries. I had just pulled open to cool her a bit when I noticed how high the backwater was on each side of the track. Suddenly, I felt the fill going soft under the drivers, felt the 44 wobble and slew. Bartholomew shut off hard and threw the air as I sprang to the window. The peaceful little creek ahead looked as angry as the plat in April water, and the bottoms were a lake. Somewhere up the valley there had been a cloudburst, for overhead the sun was bright. The beaver was roaring over its banks, and the bridge was out. Bartholomew screamed for brakes. It looked as if we were against it and hard. A soft track to stop on, a torrent of stormwater ahead, and ten hundred thousand dollars worth of silk behind, not to mention equipment. I yelled at Bartholomew and motioned for him to jump. My conscience is clear on that point. The 44 was stumbling along, trying like a drunken man to hang on to the rotten track. Bartholomew, I yelled, but he was head out and looking back at his train while he jerked frantically at the air lever. I understood. The air wouldn't work. It never will on those old tubs when you need it. The sweat pushed out on me. I was thinking how much the silk would bring us after the bath in the beaver. Bartholomew stuck to his lovers like a man in a signal tower, but every second brought us closer to open water. Watching him intent only on saving his first train, heedless of life, I was actually ashamed to jump. While I hesitated, he somehow got the brakes to set. The old 44 bucked like a bronco. It wasn't too soon. She checked her train nobly at the last, but I saw nothing could keep her from the drink. I gave Bartholomew a terrific slap, and again I yelled. Then, turning to the gangway, I dropped into the soft mud on my side. The 44 hung low, and it was easy lighting. Bartholomew sprang from his seat a second later, but his blouse caught in the teeth of the quadrant. He stooped quick as thought and peeled the thing over his head. Then he was caught fast by the wristbands, and the ponies of the 44 tipped over the broken abutment. Pull as he would, he couldn't get free. The pilot dipped into the torrent slowly, but losing her balance, the 44 kicked her heels into the air like lightning and shot with a frightened wheeze plump into the creek, dragging her engineer with her. The head car stopped on the brink. Running across the track, I looked for Bartholomew. He wasn't there. I knew he must have gone down with his engine. Throwing off my gloves, I dived just as I stood close to the tender, which hung half submerged. I am a good bit of a fish underwater, but no self-respecting fish would be caught in that yellow mud. I realized, too, the instant I struck the water, that I should have dived on the upstream side. The current took me away whirling. When I came up for air, I was fifty feet below the pier. I scrambled out, feeling it was all up with Bartholomew. But to my amazement, as I shook my eyes open, the train crew were running forward, and there stood Bartholomew on the track above me, looking at the refrigerator. When I got to him, he explained how he was dragged under and had to tear the sleeve out of his blouse under water to get free. The surprise is how little fuss men make about such things when they are busy. It took only five minutes for the conductor to hunt up a coil of wire and a sounder for me, and by the time he got forward with it, Bartholomew was halfway up a telephone pole to help me cut into a live wire. Fast as I could, I rigged a pony and began calling the McLeod dispatcher. 
it was rocky sending, but after no end of pounding, I got him and gave orders for the wrecking gang and for one more of neighbor's rapidly decreasing supply of locomotives. Bartholomew, sitting on a strip of fence which still rose above the water, looked forlorn. To lose in the beaver the first engine he had ever handled was tough, and he was evidently speculating on his chances of ever getting another. If there weren't tears in his eyes, there was storm water, certainly. But after the relief engine had pulled what was left of us back six miles to his siding, I made it my first business to explain to neighbor, who was nearly beside himself, that Bartholomew not only was not at fault, but that by his nerve he had actually saved the train. I'll tell you, neighbor, I suggested, when we got straightened around. Give us the 109 to go ahead as pilot and run her around the river division with Foley and the 216. What'll you do with the number six, growled neighbor? Six was the local passenger west. A nullet west of McLeod, said I instantly. We've got this silk on our hands now, and I'd move it if it tied up every passenger train on the division. If we can get the stuff through, it will practically beat the strike. If we fail, it will beat the company. By the time we had backed to Newhall Junction, neighbor had made up his mind my way. Mullen and I climbed into the 109 and Foley with the 216 and none too good a grace coupled onto the silk and flying red signals, we started again for Zanesville over the river division. Foley was always full of mischief. He had a better engine than ours and he took great satisfaction the rest of the afternoon in crowding us. Every mile of the way he was on our heels. I was throwing the coal and have reason to remember. It was after dark when we reached the Beverly Hill, and we took it at a lively pace. The strikers were not on our minds then. It was Foley who bothered. When the long parallel steel lines of the upper yard spread before us, flashing under the arc lights, we were way above yard speed. Running a locomotive into one of those big yards is like shooting a rapid in a canoe. There is a bewildering maze of tracks, lighted by red and green lamps, which must be watched the closest to keep out of trouble. The hazards are multiplied the minute you pass the throat, and a yard wreck is a dreadful tangle. It makes everybody from roadmaster to flagman furious, and not even Bartholomew wanted to face an inquiry on a yard wreck. On the other hand, he couldn't afford to be caught by Foley, who was chasing him out of pure caprice. I saw the boy holding the throttle at a half and fingering the air anxiously as we jumped over the frogs, but the roughest riding on track so far beats the ties as a cushion that when the 109 suddenly struck her paws through an open switch, we bounced against the roof of the cab like footballs. I grabbed a brace with one hand and with the other reached instinctively across to Bartholomew's side to seize the throttle. But as I tried to shut him off, he jerked it wide open in spite of me and turned with lightning in his eye. No, he cried, and his voice rang hard. The 109 took the tremendous shove at her back and leaped like a frightened horse. Away we went across the yard, through the cinders, and over the ties. My teeth have never been the same since. I don't belong on an engine anyway, and since then I have kept off. At the moment, I was convinced that the strain had been too much, that Bartholomew was stark crazy. He sat clinging like a lobster to his levers and bouncing clear to the roof. But his strategy was dawning on me. In fact, he was pounding it into me. Even the shock and scare of leaving the track and tearing up the yard had not driven for Bartholomew's noodle the most important feature of our situation, which was, above everything, to keep out of the way of the silk train. I felt every moment more mortified at my attempt to shut him off. I had done the trick of the woman who grabs the reins. It was even better to tear up the yard than to stop for Foley to smash into and scatter the silk over the cold chutes. Bartholomew's decision was one of the traits which make the runner instant perception coupled to instant resolve. The ordinary dub thinks what he should have done to avoid disaster after it is all over. Bartholomew thought before. On we bumped across frogs, through switches, over splits, and into target rods when, and this is the miracle of it all, the 109 got her forefeet on a split switch, made a contact, and after a slew or two, like a bogged horse, she swung up sweet on the rails again, tender and all. Bartholomew shut off with an undercut that brought us up stuttering, 
and nailed her feet with the air right where she stood. We had left the track and plowed a hundred feet across the yards and jumped onto another track. It is the only time I ever heard of its happening anywhere, but I was on the engine with Bartholomew Mullen when it was done. Foley choked his train the instant he saw our hind lights bobbing. We climbed down and ran back. He had stopped just where we should have stood if I had shut off. Bartholomew ran to the switch to examine it. The contact light, green, still burned like a false beacon, and lucky it did, for it showed that the switch had been tampered with and exonerated Bartholomew Mullen completely. The attempt of the strikers to spill the silk in the yards had only made the reputation of a new engineer. Thirty minutes later, the million-dollar train was turned over to the east end to wrestle with, and we breathed, all of us, a good bit easier. Bartholomew Mullen, now a passenger runner who ranks with Kennedy and Jack Moore and Foley and George Sinclair himself, got a personal letter from the general manager complimenting him on his pretty wit, and he was good enough to say nothing whatever about mine. We registered that night and went to supper together, Foley, Jackson, Bartholomew, and I. After we dropped into the dispatcher's office, something was coming from a cloud, but the operator, to save his life, couldn't catch it. I listened a minute. It was Neighbor. Now, Neighbor isn't great on dispatching trains. He can make himself understood over the poles, but his sending is like a boy sawing wood, sort of uneven. However, though I am not much on running yards, I claim to be able to take the wildest ball that ever was thrown along the wire, and the chair was tendered me at once to catch Neighbor's extraordinary passes at the McLeod Key. They came something like this. To OPR, tell massacre. That was the word that stuck them all, and I could perceive that Neighbor was talking emphatically. He had apparently forgotten Bartholomew's last name and was trying to connect with the one that he had disremembered the night before. Tell massacre, repeated Neighbor, that he is all right. Tell him I give him double mileage for today all the way through, and tomorrow he gets the 109 to keep. Neighbor. End of The Million Dollar Freight Train by Frank H. Spearman